limited. The time is 9.30 a.m. Il est 9h30. Alors, bonjour à toutes. So, hello, everyone. So, today marks the opening of the second set of public hearings of the public inquiry into foreign interference in federal electoral processes and democratic institutions. I would like first to mention that these hearings are being held on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. My name is Marie-Josée Hogg. Some of you already know me, and I have been appointed commissioner to preside over the commission's work and bring it to a successful conclusion, supported naturally, assisted by a group of competent and seasoned professionals. The commission council team is led by Mrs. Shantona Chaudhry, who many of you have already met. Wherever you are, I welcome you and thank you for your interest in the Commission's work. It speaks to the importance you ascribe to our democracy and our values. After holding preliminary public hearings earlier this year on issues arising from our duty to maximize the degree of public transparency while protecting the confidentiality of national security information, the Commission now begins its public hearings on matters that are at the core of its mandate. First, we will examine and assess the foreign interference that may have occurred during the 2019 and 2021 general elections, and if so, the impact this interference may have had on their integrity. This aspect of our work is crucial for better understanding the threats our democratic processes may have been faced which will be particularly useful when it comes time to make recommendations to reinforce the safeguarding of these same democratic processes. Next, we will review and assess, where applicable, how the information about this foreign interference flowed within the federal government during these uh, electoral periods and in the weeks that followed, as well as what measures were taken in response to that information. This is also a crucial component of our work, as it is not enough to identify threats, we must also respond to them effectively. The findings we will make from these hearings will also be very useful when, in a later phase, the Commission will analyze foreign interference in electoral processes and democratic institutions more broadly, as well as the capacity of the government apparatus to detect and counter it. I am counting on all Council to respect the framework that the Commission has put in place and not to get into what will be the subject of the second part of this work. During the preliminary hearings, we had the opportunity to discuss at length the challenges uh, to uh, reconciling the principles of openness and transparency that characterize a Commission of Inquiry with the need to protect Canada's national security interest. I think it is appropriate to highlight some of the findings reached through this exercise. I am well aware that some people will feel that too much information is being kept secret, while others may feel that too much information is being disclosed. I would ask the public to remember that although it may be difficult, if not impossible, to strike the perfect balance. The Commission is constantly striving to maximize the transparency of its work. On the one hand, 
no one can reasonably challenge the fact that the public and journalists who work to inform the public have a vested interest in knowing whether Canadian, Canada's democratic process have been targeted by foreign actors and whether their actions had an impact on election integrity. The process adopted by this inquiry must therefore be as transparent as possible and lead to a report that can be reviewed, understood, and weighed by the public. Many have stressed this point, and I share this view. On the other hand, it is clear that both the, gov the government and the public clearly have a compelling interest in preserving and protecting the confidentiality of information, the disclosure of which could damage our national interest. And that a public inquiry that will reveal highly sensitive information could, depending on the circumstances, do more harm than good. Some witnesses have explained why. The lesson here is that if openness and transparency are virtues, so is secrecy in certain circumstances. Let me explain. When secrecy shields information held by the government, people often view it with some suspicion. Yet, it is undeniable that there is a strong public interest in maintaining at least some forms of government secrecy. The preliminary hearings have shown, amongst other things, that withholding certain types of information may be essential for Canada to conduct activities vital to its national security and to respect its international commitments. The preliminary hearings have also revealed that this is particularly true in the area of foreign interference, since sophisticated foreign state actors may be engaged in collecting information about Canada and Canadian citizens. We must be aware that any information disclosed publicly in the course of this investigation will become known not only to Canadians, but also to states and organizations having interests adverse to Canada's interests. This is a reality that the Commission must take into, into account. In this context, information that could reveal the sources of intelligence, methods of collection, or the targets of investigations is particularly sensitive. The disclosure of such information to hostile actors could cause serious harm both to Canadian citizens and to Canada as a whole. It could degrade our ability to detect and respond to foreign interference. This is not to say that all national security information is inherently secret or should be kept from the public. Far from it. On the contrary, informing and educating the public is of the utmost importance, as it will enable them to recognize and better deal with attempts at foreign interference. This increases resilience, which in turn reduces the impacts of foreign interference. However, those who testified at the preliminary hearings, as well as the participants who made submissions following them, generally agree that at least some information related to national security must be kept secret. And this includes some information relevant to the Commission's mandate. I am certainly not the first commissioner to have to consider national security interests in the course of a public inquiry. But there are few, if any, examples of an inquiry whose mandate is as closely tied to state secrets as this one. 
Some witness evidence has also helped us understand that there may be other reasons that justify secrecy, which must be weighed against the public interest in transparency. The first reason stems from concerns expressed by members of certain diasporas communities and by others who may be the targets of foreign interference activities. People who are subject to transnational repression by foreign regimes may have very real fears in speaking publicly about their experiences. And as a result, the Commission will likely have to offer some witnesses protections that are at odds with fully open proceedings. The second reason is the need to protect ongoing criminal investigations or proceedings or any other investigation. I am not referring to the present inquiry, but to other potentially open investigation. Here again, the necessity of allowing the investigation to conclude may justify keeping some information confidential. The Commission's terms of reference expressly require it to carry out its duties in such a way as not to jeopardize any ongoing criminal investigation or proceedings or any other proceeding. Thus, throughout these hearings, I will take all these interests into account and endeavor to balance them fairly and effectively. I want to emphasize that up to now, confidentiality related to national security issues has in no way endured my ability to search for the truth. The Commission has had access to a large number of classified documents in their entirety, meaning without the redaction needed to protect national security. In fact, confidentiality imperatives have so far not prevented us from doing the work we have been tasked to do. But they do pose real difficulties as I endeavor to keep the process transparent and open. The Commission must walk a very fine line in its work. As such, the present public hearings follow other hearings that had to be held recently in camera. Essentially, the Attorney General of Canada requested that certain evidence be received in the absence of the participants and the public, since, in his view, it contained information that will be detrimental to national security if disclosed. After hearing in camera the submissions from counsel for the Attorney General, I concluded that I should allow the request and agreed to receive the evidence via in-camera hearings. I issued a ruling to this effect, which can be read on the Commission's website, where it is published in full. The Commission recently held six days of in-camera hearings, where evidence was led. As part of our ongoing commitment to transparency, the Commission is preparing summaries of these hearings held in camera, which will be produced in the course of the present public hearings. In addition, when I felt that some of the information provided during these in-camera hearings could be made public without unduly jeopardized national security, and that this information will be useful for the public to understand what happened during the last two elections, I asked Commission Council to ensure that this information is reintroduced in evidence at these public hearings. The Commission has made, is making, and will continue to make every effort to ensure that the public has access to as much information as possible. In this context, and with these imperatives in mind, the Commission has opted for flexible rules of evidence and procedure that I hope will enable it to achieve some of its objectives, the search for the truth, 
hearing different and sometimes divergent points of view, adequately informing the public, protecting national security and the personal safety of vulnerable persons. As such, over the next few days, you will see that evidence will not always be led according to the rules that generally apply in a court of law. In my view, the usual rules, though essential in other forums, would be too rigid in the context of this commission. Certain, certain hostile actors are likely to take an interest in some of those who will testify requiring protective measures to be put in place and many of the documents to be examined are classified documents preventing full disclosure and compelling us to be cre creative in disclosing as much of their content as possible the parties via their council have already been informed of the applicable rules of evidence and mrs shordury will outline them in a few minutes i would like to underline that some witnesses working in the intelligence services will not be identified. Given some safety concerns, it is unusual for these employees who are unknown to the public to testify publicly. Commission counsel have asked them to do so, but to avoid any risk to their security, I have allowed their identity to be protected. They have agreed in that context. That said, those who hold the highest positions within the intelligence agencies will testify and will be identified. As I have already mentioned on a number of occasions, the Commission must complete its work within a tight uh, time frame, to say the least. As a result, the time allotted to the parties to cross-examine witnesses is necessarily limited. In the interest of fairness and equity, the Commission has opted for a one-to-one -one rule, meaning that the parties and interveners to whom I have granted the right to cross-examination will collectively have the same amount of time to cross-examine a witness as the Commission Council have had to examine that same witness. The Commission will use its good judgment to determine how this cross-examination time will be shared by all the parties. However, I invite the parties and interveners concerned to work together to identify which of them have the greatest interest in cross-examining a given witness and allow them to agree on a different division of labor. The aim in doing so, it is just a suggestion, but the aim is to avoid a multitude of short, superficial cross-examinations, favoring instead a small number of more effective and useful ones, even if they are longer. Of course, only the Council for the participants can ensure that this objective is achieved. In working with Commission's Council to prepare for these hearings, I have realized that the Commission must be able to count on the cooperation of all participants to ensure transparency and maximize the information provided to the public. I therefore appeal to your creativity and your flexibility to help us juggle all the interests at stake. Well, it will ultimately be up to me to determine whether our procedures strike the necessary balance between the strong public interest in openness and transparency and the need to protect national security and the personal safety of certain persons. I'm, I am counting on all of you to assist me in achieving this balance. I now turn to what's on the menu for the next coming days. Today, after short presentations by Commission Council, we will be hearing the perspectives of representatives from various diaspora communities who will provide insights essential to our work. In a panel discussion, they will give us a better understanding of certain sociopolitical issues and the way in which foreign interference manifests itself 
towards some of their members. In particular, they will share their experiences and what the consequences have been. We will then hear from some 40 witnesses, including representatives of intelligence agencies, current and former elected officials, political parties' representatives, Election Canada, the Office of the Commissioner of Canada Elections, senior public servants, cabinet ministers, and from the prime ministers. These witnesses will first be questioned by Commission Council. Then they will be cross-examined by all or some of the participants' council based on the agreed allocation of time. Council representing a witness will also have the opportunity to examine this witness, and Commission Council will have the right to re-examine if they see fit. Following these hearings, participants will be invited to make submission. The time allotted for this will be short, which is inevitable given the tight deadlines imposed on the Commission, but it will nevertheless allow everyone to share their point of view. I would like to thank the participants and their councils who, dealing with strict time constraints, stemming from these same tight deadlines, have rolled up their sleeves and so far, so far have shown remarkable availability. These are demanding conditions for all concerned, but they are justified by the importance of the subject matter and the need to draw valuable conclusions and make recommendations as quickly as possible. Everyone here has shown a great willingness to cooperate and to help rather than hinder the Commission. This professionalism is a credit to you, Council, and I thank you. I now give the floor to Lead Council, Sir Chaudhry. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. My name is Shantona Chaudhry, and I am Lead Counsel to the Foreign Interference Commission. Bonjour à vous tous. Je m'appelle Shantona Chaudhry, et je suis procureur en chef de la Commission sur la gérante étrangère. I'm going to take the next few minutes to outline what you can expect to see over the next weeks as these hearings unfold. Let me begin by addressing the scope of the hearings. As the Commissioner explained, uh, these hearings and the Commissioner's first report are about clauses A1A and A1B of the Commission's terms of reference. That is to say, allegations of foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 general elections and their impact, as well as information flow to senior decision makers and actions taken in response in the periods leading up to the elections and the periods immediately following the elections. Thus, the evidence that will be adduced in the coming weeks will pertain specifically to these matters, and the examinations of witnesses will likewise focus specifically on them. Issues and evidence that don't fall squarely within the parameters of the 2019 and 2021 general elections will be left to stage two of the Commission's investigation. As a reminder, stage two, which corresponds to clause A1C of the Commission's terms of reference, asks the Commission to examine more broadly Canada's ability to detect, deter, and counter foreign interference. So what happens over the next few weeks should really be seen as a step in the Commission's ongoing investigation and work. I'm now going to give you a quick uh, survey of the uh, proceedings over the next two weeks. Today, we will begin with three presentations by Council for the Commission, which are aimed at giving you some context and help participants and the public understand the nature of the evidence that will be adduced during the hearings. The first presentation will 
uh, first uh, give us a number of key definitions uh, concerning the terms of uh, the Commission. For example, what are the various definitions of foreign interference? What uh, does the expression uh, democratic institution entail, and as well as uh, democratic process? The second presentation will give you an overview of uh, the Canadian electoral system so that the public and participants can be familiarized with some of the concepts that we will be discussing during the audience, the hearings. The third presentation will describe the entities of the federal government that are involved in issues of foreign interference. It will give us an overview of the structure of Canada, uh, the, uh, the national security and intelligence community, and also the electoral system of Canada, as well as other concepts that will be dealt with in depth as evidence is adduced. This afternoon, as indicated to the Commissioner, we will be hearing a panel of representatives from uh, a number of uh, community and uh, diaspora groups and communities. And they will be giving us their experience in with uh, foreign interference and the challenges that they've had to deal with. There are two things that we have to remember about this panel. First of all, it will be a discussion moderated by counsel for the Commission and not an interrogation. The panelists will be sharing information to help us put into context the work of the Commission. They will not be called upon to testify on any specific facts. As well, although the parties, the lawyers for the parties, uh, can suggest questions for the members of the panel, there will be no cross-examination. Secondly, the discussion with the panel will deal with the experience of uh, the diaspora communities in general and not specific uh, ele federal election issues uh, from the 2019 and 2021 elections. So it will be the only part of uh, the hearings that will not be specifically linked to divisions A and B of the terms. As the Commissioner mentioned, this will give us more context and an overview so that we can help it that will be helpful for the Commission in its work. So testimonies will begin tomorrow with the first panel of witnesses from Elections Canada, followed by a second panel of uh, witnesses from the Office of the Commissioner of Elections Canada. The hearing will then resume after the long weekend next Tuesday, when we will hear from a panel of political party representatives who were security cleared to receive briefings from intelligence agencies in the 2019 or 2021 elections, as well as individual witnesses. Next Wednesday, we will hear from current and former members of Parliament. The last five days of the hearing will then consist of calling a number, and when I say a number, I mean a large number, of witnesses from the federal government, including current and former deputy ministers and other senior public officials from the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, CSIS, the Communication Security Establishment, CSC, the RCMP, Global Affairs Canada, GAC, Public Safety Canada, and the Privy Council Office. Notably, the Commission will be calling as a panel the Critical Election Incident Public Protocol Panel, commonly known as the Panel of Five, for both the 2019 and the 2021 elections, as well as key members of the Security and Intelligence Threats to Elections Task Force, commonly known as the Site Task Force, for each of those elections. The Commission will also call a number of Cabinet Ministers, representatives from the Prime Minister's Office, and the Prime Minister. As you can imagine, this will make for five very busy hearing days, but with the co cooperation of the parties and their council, we will manage. Let me now take a moment to explain some of the particularities of how the Commission will be addressing the issue of national security confidentiality within the context of these hearings. Those of you who, who participated in or watched the Commission's preliminary national security hearings in late January or early February will recall that most of the information that has been produced to the Commission by the Government of Canada is highly classified. And as the Commissioner explained, the Commission is required by virtue of its terms of reference and the law to prevent the disclosure of information that would be potentially injurious to national security in the course of its proceedings. The Commission has therefore developed a protocol that will apply when a question posed to a witness 
would elicit information protected by national security confidentiality. This has been shared with counsel for the participants, and I will share it with you now and hope that you will forgive me the foray into legalese. When a witness is asked a question and the witness or their counsel object or advise that the question cannot be answered in the public hearing for reasons of national security confidentiality, one, the witness or their counsel will make a statement to the effect that the question can't be answered on the public record for reasons of national security confidentiality. No precise form of words will be required as long as the position is made clear. Two, when such a statement is made, it will be deemed to be a, a statement that the answer to the question would disclose information that could be injurious to the critical interests of Canada or its allies, national defense or national security and B, an objection to the question on those grounds. Three, subject only to ensuring that the question is clearly recorded, counsel who asked the question shall then move on to their next question. Four, after the examinations of the witnesses have been completed, the commissioner will review the matter to determine whether further investigation is necessary and appropriate in order to obtain information that would be responsive to the question or questions that were objected to. Five, if further request investigation is conducted and further information is obtained by the commission, it will be summarized or otherwise disclosed to the maximum extent possible without injury to the interests identified in the commission's terms of reference. This protocol will allow the, the hearings to proceed smoothly despite the challenges uh, that arise given the nature of the information at issue. So with that out of the way, we can now move on to the more substantive and probably more interesting parts of the hearing, starting with the introductory presentations. Thank you. Merci, Mme Chaudhry. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chaudhry. Good morning, uh, Madam Commissioner. Good morning, participants, member of the public. My name is Jean-Philippe Mackay. I'm a uh, counsel for the Commission, and today I'm uh, in, the in the company of uh, Siobhan Morris, uh, who is going to share the podium for part of the presentation on uh, the first summary report uh, uh, entitled uh, Definition of Key Terms in the Commission's Terms of Reference. So before we begin the presentation, per se, yes, so the pointer is working, that's good. So uh, first of all, I'm going to be presenting you an overview report. So what does that mean? It's, uh, it is going to, to give you some context uh, for the hearings. As uh, the Commissioner and uh, uh, Council Chaudhry men mentioned, uh, we're dealing with tight deadlines. And in this context, uh, uh, the Commission will use uh, certain tools that will allow it to manage a vast quantity of information without having to call witnesses to introduce each uh, piece of evidence or information. In the past, uh, inquiry commissions like this one uh, have developed a tool which is called the overview report to uh, bring forward vast quantities of information necessary for its uh, examination without having to call witnesses for that purpose. The objective of this uh, information is to present information in a uh, summarized form with references to the original documents. So in the summary report that I'll be presenting today that is available on the website of uh, the Commission, there are a series of notes that explain the sources that were used by uh, counsel uh, for the Commission. The same process was applied uh, for the summary report that will be presented by my colleagues uh, further, on, further on. So, we, and the whole purpose of this exercise, of course, is to shorten the proceedings, or at least. So for those of you who want to refer to the rules, uh, the rules of practice are procedures, uh, rules of 42 to 44 of the Commission that explain the process uh, by under which uh, these, uh, the overview report is produced. So this is the process that we followed in this case, and the lawyers counsel for the Commission produce uh, the reports, uh, and the reports were shared with parties uh, to obtain comments. Uh, 
some of the parties uh, did share with the Commission some of their comments. These comments are precious, um, and they're not necessarily integrated into the reports themselves, but they do allow counsel for the Commission to uh, prepare and produce a report uh, that is of higher quality. So, once uh, the reports are finalized and parties have submitted their observations, we then produce, uh, the we publish the report as we've done today, and participants and the commissioner can then rely on uh, these, uh, the content of these reports in the process of the hearing. Of course, uh, these reports are not necessarily exhaustive, and it is possible for parties, uh, as for the Council uh, for the Commission, uh, to complete the reports by bringing forth uh, further information during the process of the hearings. So the Commissioner is not bound. Uh, it, the the uh, report was produced by Council for the Commission, and so the Commissioner is uh, not held to limit herself to these reports. She is free uh, to uh, choose the elements on which uh, she is going to rely uh, to come to uh, any examination or conclusion. And uh, parties may disagree with some of the aspects of the summary report, and uh, they are free to complete the information or correct it as they feel necessary during the course of the hearing. So, uh, before I uh, give it over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Morris, uh, the presentation today is going to deal with the uh, definition of key terms and the terms of reference. These are not exhaustive or comprehensive definitions. The intention is to explore certain concepts that are fundamental to the terms of reference of the Commission to uh, allow us to better understand the nature of the evidence and the information that will be submitted over the next few weeks. Uh, this. Uh, uh, evidence uh, will be made public uh, and will deal with foreign appearance uh, and also the democratic institutions and processes and so is of public interest. The mandate, the terms of reference of the Commission, uh, uh, I've taken two, there are two extracts uh, or excerpts of the terms of reference. Uh, reference. And as we can see, it's not necessarily limited to divisions A and B, which bring us together today. When we look at the whole of the terms of reference, uh, we see a mention to uh, foreign interference and democratic institutions in the terms of reference themselves. And I'm now going to invite uh, Ms. Morris to take the podium to continue the presentation, and I will resume afterwards. Bonjour, Madame la Commissaire. Bonjour, tout le monde. Comme mon collègue vous l'a indiqué, je m'appelle Siobhan Morris et je suis avocate pour la Commission. Aujourd'hui, donc, je vais réviser avec vous les divisions d'ingérence étrangère que nous trouvons dans la loi sur le SCRS. Alors, ces définitions viennent de divers ministères et institutions tels que Sécurité publique Canada ou la l'établissement sur la sécurité des télécommunications. Cette définition vient aussi du monde universitaire, la loi canadienne, les comités parlementaires et d'autres sources. Je vais commencer par voir les définitions qui viennent du gouvernement fédéral dans la première partie de son rapport et ensuite je vais passer aux définitions. From international sources, before inviting my colleague to present on the definitions of democratic processes and democratic institutions. At the outset, it's worth noting that the primary elements of foreign interference tend to be consistent across definitions coming from the federal government. These elements are drawn from Section 2 of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act, which defines threats to the security of Canada as including foreign-influenced activities that are within or relating to Canada, that are detrimental to the interests of Canada, and that are clandestine or deceptive or involve a threat to any person. These elements assist in distinguishing foreign interference from other legitimate foreign influence, such as normal diplomatic conduct between countries. And we can see these elements reflected in the text of Section 2 of the Act here. 
This is the definition that CSIS uses in the ordinary course of its activities. Now, the CSIS Act does not directly define foreign interference. However, public reports from CSIS explain that the term foreign influenced activities encompasses activities that can be viewed as foreign interference. According to these reports, foreign interference involves foreign states or persons or entities acting on their behalf, attempting to covertly influence decisions, events, or outcomes in Canada to better suit their strategic interests. In many cases, clandestine influence operations are meant to deceptively influence Government of Canada decisions or policies, officials, or democratic processes in support of foreign political agendas. It should be noted that the CSIS Act distinguishes foreign influenced activities from espionage, which is defined separately in the same section. The Communications Security Establishment, which you have heard is Canada's national cryptologic agency, defines foreign interference in a similar way to Section 2 of the CSIS Act, but specifies the activity is directed against a democratic process and is used to advance strategic objectives. This definition is specific to CSE's focus on cyber threats to Canada's democracy. Other federal institutions may use a similar definition, but apply it differently depending on the context. The National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians is a body composed of members from the House of Commons and Senate, which reviews the activities of the Government of Canada's National Security and Intelligence Agencies. The committee's definition of foreign interference is foreign state action meeting the same three requirements of foreign influenced activities set out in the CSIS Act. According to the committee, foreign interference activities can include using clandestine or deceptive methods to influence or manipulate Canadian immigrant communities, government officials, and political parties, among other entities. The independent special rapporteur on foreign interference also defines foreign, inter foreign interference with reference to those three elements set out in Section 2 of the CSIS Act, but specifies that foreign interference involves state or state proxy action. And for its part, Public Safety Canada defines foreign interference as covert, deceptive, and sometimes threatening means by foreign states to advance their own strategic objectives to the detriment of Canada's national interests. Once again, we see elements of both the CSE and CSIS definitions here. Under this definition, examples of foreign interference include threats, harassment, or intimidation by foreign states or those acting on their behalf against anyone in Canada, Canadian communities, or their loved ones abroad. It may also include attempting to interfere in Canadian, in Canadian democratic institutions and processes such as elections. It may include stealing Canadian intellectual property, know-how, or imposing market conditions to gain an economic advantage over Canada, or targeting officials at all levels of government to influence public policy and decision-making in a way that is clandestine, deceptive, or threatening. On to some elections-related bodies. The Security and Intelligence Threats to Election Task Force, also known as SITE, is an information-sharing body designed to help safeguard Canadian elections from foreign interference. The SITE definition of foreign interference also involves the three elements from the CSIS Act definition of foreign-influenced activities, but specifies that in the context of Canadian electoral processes, the objective of such interference is to affect electoral outcomes or to undermine public confidence in Canadian democratic institutions. Related to site, the Critical Elections Incident Public Protocol is a mechanism for communicating with Canadians during federal elections in the event of a critical election incident. A 2021 review of the protocol notes that interference is not defined in the protocol, but is generally understood to mean involving oneself in a situation where one's involvement is not wanted or helpful. For the protocol, foreign interference includes activities aimed at affecting the electoral process, shaping narratives around strategic interests, 
reducing public trust in democratic processes, decreasing social cohesion, weakening confidence in leaders, lowering trust in the media, and dividing international alliances. Canada is also a part of the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism, which is a coordination initiative among G7 countries to identify and respond to foreign threats to democracy. The G7 RRM defines foreign interference as the attempt to covertly influence, intimidate, manipulate, interfere, corrupt or discredit individuals, organizations and governments to further the views of a foreign country. In 2021, to capture constantly evolving activities in the information environment by state actors and their proxies, the G7 RRM focused on foreign information manipulation and interference, termed FEMI. This term describes patterns of behavior that negatively impact or have the potential to negatively impact values, procedures, and political processes. It includes all tactics used to manipulate information and encompasses activities conducted in an intentional and coordinated manner by a range of actors from state to non-state, including proxies. Foreign interference and certain types of foreign influence also feature in Canadian legislation. The overview report describes two pieces of legislation touching on these concepts, the Canada Elections Act and the Security of Information Act. The Canada Elections Act does not explicitly define foreign interference, but it sets out various prohibitions aimed at preventing foreign persons from interfering or influencing Canadian electoral processes by funding parties, candidates, electoral district associations, or leadership and nomination contestants, from using a broadcasting station outside of Canada to try and influence the electoral process, from incurring expenses to promote or oppose a candidate, a registered party, or a leader of a registered party, and committing an offence under Canadian law to influence the choice of an elector in a federal election. Meanwhile, subsection 20 sub 1 of the Security of Information Act makes foreign influence threats or violence an offence. The offence is limited to circumstances where someone uses threats or violence to cause a person to commit an act that is meant to increase the capacity of a foreign entity to harm Canadian interests or where the act is reasonably likely to harm Canadian interests. It is worth noting that this definition does not encompass non-violent foreign interference, including interference with democratic processes. Finally, the overview report collects a number of definitions set out by other countries and by the European Union. For example, Australia has enacted laws that criminalize foreign interference and define it as an activity by or on behalf of a foreign power, which is coercive, corrupting, deceptive, or clandestine, and contrary to Australia's sovereignty, values, and national interests. It involves a foreign power trying to secretly and improperly interfere in Australian society to advance their strategic, political, military, social, or economic goals at Australia's expense. The Australian definition predominantly targets interference in the pol political or government sphere, or interference prejudicial to national security, rather than interference with market processes or with individuals. The United States Department of Homeland Security defines foreign interference as malign actions taken by foreign governments or actors designed to sow discord, manipulate public discourse, discredit the electoral system, bias the development of policy, or disrupt markets for the purpose of undermining the interests of the United States and its allies. The Federal Bureau of Investigation similarly describes foreign influence operations as covert actions by foreign governments to spread disinformation, sow discord, and ultimately undermine confidence in our democratic institutions and values. For the European Union, a staff working document has defined foreign interference as acts carried out by or on behalf of a foreign state level actor, which are coercive, covert, 
deceptive or corrupting and contrary to the sovereignty, values and interests of the European Union. At this stage, I would like to invite my colleague to speak on the definitions of democratic institutions and democratic processes set out in the report. Thank you. Bonjour à nouveau. Hello again. My task is made easier by the fact that the words democratic institutions and democratic processes can be interchangeable and cover the same reality. And of course, when we look at the terms of the mandate of the Commission, we can see that electoral processes that are mentioned, uh, as we will see, they are assimilated to democratic institutions and democratic processes. So, of course, and that is the starting point of this part of the presentation, Parliament and the executive branch constitute, of course, a democratic processes, a democratic institution, and the same can be said for the electoral process. Of course, the Commission is interested in the point of view of the intelligence community on foreign interference, but also the way that these agencies perceive and describe these processes. So in the public reports of CSIS that are published yearly, the service affirms that the electoral process, uh, whether it's out of the election period or during, constitutes an, uh, an institution and a democratic process. From CSIS's point of view, the electoral process comprises the following components, so elections at all three levels of government, the politicians and the political parties, as well as the media. When it comes to the Center for Security, the CSC in its first report on cyber threats in 2017 that they refer to focuses on three aspects of the democratic process. So elections, political parties and politicians, and the media. And media have to be heard in the broad sense of the word. So it's a notion that comprises conventional media as well as social media. More recently, in 2019, the CSC modified the last part to speak of voters instead, to focus more on the target of the foreign interference rather than the means used for the communication of some intelligence that can be associated uh, to some form of foreign interference. And so what the CSC indicates in the 2019 report is that voters interact with political parties, candidates, and between themselves through social media and traditional media, hence this change. The CSC adds that the threats on elections are about preventing the voters to vote, uh, changing the results, stealing databases of voters, and manipulates so social media and traditional media to change the political discourse and affect credibility and trust. So those are potential means described by the CSC. On this question of the persons or entities that could be targeted by foreign interference. The summary report at paragraph 48 discusses the points of view, and here I only have the acronym in English, the NSICOP, the Parliamentary Committee on National Security and Intelligence. It's hard enough to master the acronyms in one language, try and know them in two languages. That's a very difficult task. But having said this, the committee explains that foreign interference is targeting elected representatives, civil servants, and the staff at every level of government, including indigenous governments that are included in this description. So under this angle, the legislative power is included in democratic institutions. 
So now, once again, we can see a series of acronyms for the World Talk of Sight to talk about this working group on the threat to security and intelligence around elections and uh, about public protocol. So according to this working group, the SITE working group, the electoral process in Canada is a democratic institution and the examinations done of the exercises for protocol in 2019 and 2021 explain that the electoral process in Canada is a democratic institution. So as I was saying, those are notions that are interchangeable and describe the same reality. The interesting aspect here is the electoral ecosystem, that the electoral process is described as an ecosystem in which a whole of components interact between themselves. And in this ecosystem, you can find the voters, political parties, academia and civil society, social media platforms, media, Elections Canada and the Commissioner of Canada Elections and uh, security and intelligence agencies. When it comes to a special rapporteur on foreign interference, in the report that was produced in 2023, the special rapporteur underlines that the elections per se and political parties are electoral uh, are democratic processes. They add that democratic institutions include some government uh, institutions, uh, legislative assemblies, uh, or, or organizations such as Elections Canada and the Commissioner to Federal Elections. And lastly, the Permanent Committee for Access to Information and Privacy Commissioner and Ethics, the ETI, includes uh, government policies and programs in democratic institutions. And to conclude, a note about what comes from the Privy Council Office, uh, Democratic Institutions Bureau. The democratic institutions include the electoral process, the formation of government, the separation of powers, the House of Commons, the Senate, and the Governor General. So this concludes the first presentation about the summary report, and I will now invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Shepard, to Merci take Mr. over. Merci, Thank Morris. you, Mr. McKay, Mrs. Morris. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. The next presentation from Commission Council is an overview of Canada's electoral process. For the benefit of the parties and participants, there is no overview report associated with this presentation. So this does not in and of itself form evidence before the Commission. Rather, the purpose of this presentation is to ensure that participants and perhaps more importantly, members of the public are able to engage with the work of the Commission with a common baseline understanding of the democratic process. I will be splitting my time today with my colleague, Mr. Mohamed Hossen, and we will be discussing issues such as why it is that we hold elections in a democracy and the nature of free and fair elections, how Canada's electoral map is established the rules respecting when elections are held, the role of different participants in the electoral process, how candidates are chosen, the electoral period itself, a brief introduction to the political financing regime, and then a description of the basic mechanics of election day from voting through to the announcing of results. So the most fundamental question we can ask about the electoral process is why we have elections in the first place. And the answer is that it is one of the core defining elements of a vibrant democracy. It is what distinguishes political orders like the one that exists in Canada 
from other non-democratic states. Elections serve a number of critical functions. At a very practical level, it is the mechanism by which individuals and communities select their political representatives. Members of parliament are elected. They assemble in parliament and perform critical functions like scrutinizing legislation, voicing community concerns, and holding the government to account. At a broader level, elections are the means by which the community voices its political aspirations, its views about how Canada should function, and its hopes about future change. Throughout these proceedings, people will use, will make reference to the concept of free and fair elections. After all, simply having an election, the mere act of casting a ballot is not in and of itself sufficient to guarantee that vibrant democratic order that we all aspire to. People who think about and discuss elections use the concept of a free and fair election to describe the type of electoral process that guarantees us a true democratic order. It is a complicated and multifaceted concept. It involves narrow and broad concepts. Some of the components to free and fair elections include universal suffrage, that is to say, who is allowed to vote, meaningful competition between political parties, which is to say that electors have a genuine choice in terms of who they wish to cast their ballots for. It includes fair and transparent administration of elections, which is to say that the rules that govern the electoral process are fair, they are applied in a fair manner, and they are applied in a way that is transparent so that members of the public can be satisfied that they have been applied fairly. Security also forms a part of free and fair elections. It describes the circumstances in which individuals feel as though they are practically able to cast a ballot in favor of their preferred candidate to express their authentic political voice. Components of security can include measures like ballot secrecy. And underlying the notion of free and fair elections is the concept that the rights established are enforceable and are protected. That what we say about how we ought run our elections, in fact, matches the reality of the elections as they are administered. I should note that even this definition that I've described is a limited one. There are even broader ways in which we can understand the necessary preconditions to free and fair elections. Things like freedom of the press can be understood to be a critical and necessary component of a democratic order, albeit one that exists outside the strict confines of the electoral process itself. So I'd like to move to a different topic, and that is how it is we divide up the electoral map. We speak of having federal elections, but in a very real sense, we have 338 elections that take place simultaneously. Canada is divided into electoral districts, more commonly known as ridings, and the residents of each of those districts elect their representative to parliament. 
how it is that we go about deciding on what those districts are can be a somewhat complicated process. But boiled down to its basics, three considerations inform how ridings are drawn. The first is the concept of voter equity or parity. It is the idea that every elector's ballot should be worth roughly the same as every other elector's. In practice, what this means is that the population of electoral districts ought to be roughly equal. However, I say roughly because there are other considerations that justify departures from the principle of voter equal equity and parity. Community of interest is the concept that there can be groupings or communities that share certain common aspirations, a certain stake in particular issues, and that it may be appropriate to group such communities into electoral districts so that they can jointly deliberate and decide on who will be their representative. Equally so, geography can play a significant role in how electoral districts are formed. In a country as large and diverse as Canada, there are portions of the country that are very densely populated and other portions sparsely populated. For practical reasons, it may be difficult for a single representative to represent a very broad geographic area. And on that basis, we also see departures from the equity or parity principle. In practice, these principles play out through an independent boundaries commission that is established every 10 years following the census in order to assess and determine whether electoral boundaries need to be redrawn. And this is the result. As it stands now, this is Canada's current electoral map. And indeed, the picture above shows the results of the 2021 general election. And it's important to recognize that the amount of color you see spread across this map is not necessarily indicative of the actual results of the election. What matters are the number of ridings, which as you can see, vary dramatically. The size of a riding in northern Saskatchewan is fundamentally different in size and scope than a riding in downtown Toronto. The next topic I'd like to discuss is the timing of elections. Historically, elections were held largely at the discretion of the Crown, and in more modern times, at the discretion of the government of the day. The Prime Minister, who is the head of government, advises the Governor General, who is the head of state, when an election ought to be held. And as a matter of convention, the Governor General accepts such advice and directs the Chief Electoral Officer to prepare to administer an election. Over time, however, legal restrictions or rules have come into effect that constrain the discretion about when elections can be held. Importantly, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a component of the Constitution of Canada, requires that elections be held at least every five years. More modern legislation has further impacted how elections are called. Currently, elections exist under a fixed election date system. The Canada Elections Act provides that elections are to occur on the third Monday of every fourth October. However, it is important to note that due to the nature of a parliamentary democracy, elections can occur more frequently. And indeed, that explains why it is in this inquiry, we're looking into elections that took place in 2019 
and then again in 2021. The next thing I'd like to discuss are some of the actors or participants in the electoral process. Many different types of participants play a role in how elections take place in this country. Electors, those who cast votes, obviously play one of the most fundamental. Today, I'd like to discuss briefly the role of two other types of actors political parties, and third parties. Political parties are registered entities that exist to, amongst other things, contest elections. They are the vehicle by which individuals who share a common set of political commitments, beliefs, and aspirations can come together and attempt to express their political voice through contesting elections, trying to convince electors to cast votes in favor of them, and ultimately, through the democratic process, to gain and then wield political power. In practice, political parties endorse candidates, coordinate campaigns, and attempt to win as many votes as possible. Third parties are a different actor in the political system, one that shares some characteristics with political parties, but also important differences. Third parties are essentially anyone other than political parties, candidates, electoral district associations, or other specific defined categories of participants in the electoral process. These are independent entities that try to influence the results of elections. They too go and try to raise awareness about issues, convince people to take particular positions on issues in elections, and ultimately put forward their own community's voice as to political questions and ideals about how Canada should run. Examples of third parties include industry associations, trade unions, community groups, and indeed individuals who choose to go out in the electoral process and try to convince people on particular political topics. With that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Mr. Mohammed Hosin, who will continue with the presentation. Merci, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Hello, uh, Madam Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. So we'll continue the presentation uh, by discussing how candidates are chosen. So elections and the electoral regime, uh, in a broad sense, uh, are regulated very strictly. This regulation also applies to political parties. However, political parties uh, do have a, a large uh, a large margin for maneuver for their internal affairs. So it, uh, political parties can decide whether they want to organize nomination contests or simply uh, nominate a candidate. They can also choose the delay that will apply to this process as long as it uh, takes place 21 days before the scheduled date for the election. Political parties can also select the criteria that will apply to uh, potential candidates. When it comes uh, to financing, though, nomination context, uh, contests sorry, are held to strict rules. An individual can present themselves as an independent uh, candidate not belonging to any existing political party. 
Now, what is an election campaign period? So the election, the campaign period begins with the dissolution of the parliament until the day of the actual election. So this is a period of uh, 36 to 50 days when uh, special rules apply, especially in the area of political financing or party financing. So there is uh, no meeting of the House uh, or the Senate, and there's no organization that can hold the government to account during this period. So the government uh, is in a transition period during the political, uh, the electoral campaign. Uh, this convention uh, means that the government uh, must restrain its activities, uh, limit them to uh, current affairs, and avoid controversial issues, and always work in the interest of the public. No irreversible decision can be made during this interim position. During the electoral campaign, uh, parties, candidates, uh, and uh, third parties will dispute the election and uh, seek to influence the public uh, through uh, the media, uh, community activities, debates, and also door-to-door. I'm now going to uh, talk about the limits on political contributions. The, it is important to have rules in this respect because, of course, elections uh, do cost money, as, for example, uh, advertising for uh, different parties, transportation, location leasing of office space, and so forth. So the limits on political contributions limit the way uh, parties, candidates, and other Others uh, can spend the funds at their disposal. And this regime also puts a limit on the amount that can be contributed to the party from the public. An individual or a Canadian citizen, only Canadian citizens and residents uh, can uh, make a political contribution, and then again, without uh, overstepping uh, the uh, ceiling of $1,725. So this has to do with the, this is a contribution that can be given to each party, each candidate, uh, uh, writing uh, associations, uh, uh, nominated candidates, or candidates that are running for leadership of the party. What happens on election day? This is the day where polling stations open so that uh, voters can uh, cast their vote. There are other means of voting than uh, going to a vote, uh, uh, polling stations. In other words, uh, it is possible to vote uh, in anticipation by mail and using advance polls. At the, at the end of the, the voting day, polling stations are closed. The results for each writing are announced by media outlets. As uh, they receive updates from Election Canada agents in each poll. And in general, we are in a position to know on election night who will be the elected members of the parties in each riding and which party will form the next government. Of course, it's possible that there are delays in the uh, opening of the ballots. Who can vote? To be able to vote, you must be a Canadian citizen, have at least be 18 or more on the day of the election, and be able to provide ID to prove your Canadian citizenship. There is no longer an obligation to be a resident of Canada, which means that uh, Canadian citizens living uh, abroad are authorized to vote despite, um, no matter the length of the time they've been away from Canada. So how do we decide who wins? Our electoral system is called first past the post or single member plurality. And this means that each writing, the election is contested in each writing, each voter will vote for one candidate among the list of all the candidates for that writing, and the candidate with the most, uh, the highest number of votes is declared the winner without necessarily having a majority. 
And the party that has uh, the greatest number of writings and, of course, uh, of members, in other words, uh, then gets uh, the right to form the next government. So this brings us to the end of, of our overview of the uh, electoral system in Canada. Thank you. I think uh, that we have arrived at the time uh, to take a break. So we will make it a 15 or 20 minute pause. It's uh, 10 2, so let's come back at uh, 11 10. This hearing is in recess until 11 10. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 11 h 10. The meeting is in recess until 11.10. Okay, uh, right. That is the beginning. <clears throat> Gonna have uh, MP Mo. He's just—they're just grabbing their seats now, um, singing the national anthem in their heads. We got Scott Mo here. I'll, I'll bring up everything. So they're—they're they're taking the break for the next fifteen minutes. They said fifteen minutes. I say it'll be twenty-four minutes. Um, okay, so this is, uh, the committee is going on, this is across town, no, we're both in Ottawa, this is, uh, uh, you know, Ottawa, but, uh, parliament building, but not the same one, and this is another parliament, Scott Moe, Premier of Saskatchewan, the government of Saskatchewan is going to be in the committee, though the parliament isn't sitting, um, I wonder, will he, oh, he's by video conference, so <laughs> he didn't make the trip to Ottawa, unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter that much for us. Uh, hopefully he's got some good audio. And then, uh, Office of Parliamentary Budget Officer, uh, Yves Guru, Parliamentary Budget Officer, he's, uh, He'll be here. Um, well, he'll, he'll be. Yeah, I'm gonna put this on, and uh, that's uh, gonna be at noon. So in four, five, four minutes, gonna have honor uh, the honorable Scott Mo, Premier of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> I don't know. He's not paying his um, carbon tax, which is against the law. You must pay your carbon tax. Um, that's why I, I'd like. In income taxes, and this is kind of the same idea that so when you buy anything with carbon, you pay it. But anyway, so they're they're uh, it's automatically paid. So this is they're not going to pay it because they're saying, hey, why don't we get a carve out for our people? Um, they already like went through the courts with this, and now they're bringing it to that. So maybe the liberals are going to be. Upset? They haven't. They haven't said anything about this yet. The it's it's the media is more like, well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna, you know uppity about it? Like, um, what well, the liberals are down in the polls right now. So, and this is not a very popular program. Wait for April Fools to come out. Like that's when it comes out, and, and I believe it's twenty three or twenty six percent. Thanks for watching. Uh, should be a, a few more minutes, and they'll be uh, we'll be live here. So yeah, what's the liberal response going to be? Who knows? Like we, we, they haven't had a response at all. They haven't even said anything. They're kind of like quiet. So them not paying it is not good. Net would. A bunch of others. So basically, uh, Scott Morrow, the premier, is leading the charge of it. So he's going to be in committee. So it should be that should be interesting. Starting in a couple minutes from now. This basically was. This is what democracy is. This is why it's important that we don't have other countries interfere in our stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, how is it going to go? It said how it was going to go. Uh, what else? Yeah. What do you got here? Ooh, lots going on here. So yeah, Scott Moe. He's coming out 23%. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. 
uh, uh, Donna M. Thank you. 23% on April Fool's Day. Isn't that awful? Um, like it, it's, it, and I think it was a very bad, uh, communications. I agree with them on this. <clears throat> the government spent a lot of money in COVID, whether we like it or not. I don't care whether you agree with it or not. The fact is they did and they got to pay it back and they got to pay it back somehow. Right. This is so. What happened is they got to do a tax, but I, I thought the rule was you don't call it a tax; you hide it in somewhere. Well, they call this a carbon tax, and and the word tax is is the worst swear word in the Canadian English language. American may be even worse. America, you know, it comes with violence. You say that word, and you better duck a little bit. <clears throat> and this is like carbon tax. Like wow, like right in your face, and, and it's every time you go to the gas tank in your face. Uh, and then on the April Fool's Day, it's like, is it really a joke? You know, are they serious? Is it like, I bet you it could probably could fool a few people for about a few hours until they went to go fill up, and they're like, oh my god. And then wouldn't you feel like the joke's on you? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm just I'm, I'm bringing it to a semizio. What do we hear? Cloud MC, you have been uh that comment has been held for review. I have to review your comment, a Cloud Ace. What do you got here? Ace. Oh, Ace from uh um, Stephen King. I accept my disability and I stay the fuck out of the way and I suffer. That was... There we go. Now we all can see that. Oh, maybe not. Oh, look. Holy. Oh, I'd hit it three times. Uh, now they want a rain tax. Uh, yeah, Barbara Kelly. I did hear that. Is that was that a joke? Seriously, I think there is going to be a rain tax. <laughs> you know, um, your rainwater leaders, Brad Mettler, who pandemic treated E May, is the EMD of sovereignty. Food bank secures this to the families who really need. I don't know, they just need to be built. All, all of it, it's very actually simple. We really are not in a bad spot. Canada's actually in a really good position, um, but but we just haven't we don't have the political will to to unlock what it needs to be done and it's build. The country has like a million builders right now. We need about twenty million builders. <laughs> you know, um, it's we're, we're actually behind. On our infrastructure building, uh, needs needs to be to happen again. Now, twenty million is huge exaggeration, but I mean, like, so a lot of that would be part time people, but you know, involved in it, investment of some sort. But really, at least at least five times the number, five million, and <clears throat> to build it, they say we need two point four million homes. All right, and and that's now when you build the two point four million homes, that's not it. You need the homes, and then you need the hospitals, and you need the schools, you know, uh, the malls, the shopping, the infrastructure, the the you know, food processing, <clears throat> rain tax. <laughs> there's uh there's a law i can look up the number but there's a law in montreal um that if you rain your your lawn while it's raining you get a fine <laughs> it's against a lot of water your lawn in the rain
Yeah. Plants may be watered by hand at any time if it isn't raining. That's the fucking law. <laughs> That's the law. This is this is what happens when you get bored politicians. Uh, it sounds even better, I'll, I'll say, you know. <laughs> They do suggest that you collect rainwater in a barrel. You will help reduce the amount of rainwater that will other digest by the rain. Oh, there's going to be... If you have a pool, they're going to have a pool tax. Oh, God. <laughs> People looking over your fence. Oh, you have a pool. <laughs> $5,000 a year tax, sir. <laughs> There's rain that poured in there also. There's another tag. Uh. Oh, God. Look at Lawns at even number dresses may be watered on even number dates. <laughs> and at odd number of dresses at odd number dates. And Egyptian days include, not included, you can't, don't you water an Egyptian, that's it. Uh, evenings, 8 to 11, 8 to 11 p.m. If it doesn't rain. <laughs> this is like, this is page one, right? Page one of six on water regulations. <laughs> like, you have to pass the test. <laughs> Whoever did this regulation, you know, they had a very handy hand going on. By hand section here. Plants may be watered by hand at any time if it isn't raining. Oh, once again, I said that. All decorative ponds with waterfalls, water fountains, or water jets must have a water recycling system. They have to have a water recycling system. It is prohibited to let water trickle onto the road or onto your neighbor's properties. No water tricklage. <laughs> and then if not, you'll have to pay a tax. No trickling. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm, uh, you know, having fun with their water. But they, the, <clears throat> it is a city. So sometimes these regulations sound a little bit silly. Um, but remember, you know, we're talking five, six story buildings sometimes, so it doesn't apply to regular suburbia a little bit. It doesn't make sense, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, not at all, Frank James. I just find it very, very funny. Um, the water regulations. Just waiting here. Okay, here we go. Raw. The committee is starting. There's, uh, we got Mo. Mo. Yeah, Mo is, uh, it's, uh, uh oh. It, it says it's, they started and they stopped. They having some technical difficulties down there. Uh, you just got here, huh, James. So uh, the beginning, um, what, what we had was the explainer of what the heck this is going to be the next week about uh, the foreign interference. Um, and now I'm trying to get, well, well now it was going to be Live super chats are open. Uh, memberships are open. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, the the committee. It started at eleven o one, and then ended. It was suspended. Someone hit the the button. <laughs> it's it's over. So it started. Uh, maybe someone unplugged the camera. 77. 
So um, the commission is taking a break right now. Um, they did a did pretty, pretty damn good explaining. Um, and, and so did, uh, of course, the judge. The judge is right at the beginning, if you want to see. She does... She basically says what's going to happen the next week and how is it going to go. Um, a lot of it's going to be pretty – it's pretty straightforward, really. Um, the list is in the description of the people that are going to be the list. Um, there's going to be a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and it's going to be behind the scenes for people that are worried about repercussions. Certain diaspora groups, they're going to do it more protected of somehow. I think uh, more protected, you just have them – I think they should have it – in public, but the person is behind a blind, you know, they're questioned uh, on a screen behind a blind with a, a thing. All right, we're, we're, we're in, we got these politicians, they're taking their seats. There we go. You know, someone said it's like hurting, hurting uh, kittens, uh, kittens with very large claws. I, I just will simplify it. It's like herding tigers. <laughs> here, kitty, 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 go over here, tiger. <laughs> you know? uh, that's basically what you got to do with politicians. <clears throat> Imagine trying to herd Trump. <laughs> All right, it's going. We're in it. We're in it. Moza, get excited. Uh, consider items in Maine estimates 2024-2025. Uh, we welcome. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chair, point of point of order, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, sir. Hold on here. Thank I you, Mr. Chair. Picture um, lined up for I us. have been a member of this uh, of this committee. This guy's very uh, upset for five years now. He's now. very upset. And I take pride in the work of this committee, uh, and I take a particular pride, pride. in the fact right. that uh, this is a committee that has traditionally been collaborative, and we work together to get to the bottom of things and do the work that. Uh, constituents and residents and Canadians uh, uh, expect of us to do. Mr. We've always, Chair, worked, together. I, I, We've always I, I, worked together. I'm, let me get to my point. Please. Get to the point of order, please. And every single, for the last five years, every single chair, and there's been multiple chairs chairing this, uh, this committee, has always sought instruction from committee members whenever an action was to be taken. And that is a bedrock principle Mr. of Chair, how this is not has conducted order. itself for five years. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Please, please allow me to continue. continue. This is important. No, but please get your point of order, please, Mr. Kuzma. I am. I am. Last week, a meeting was called, was called without consultation and instruction of this committee. This week, we had two meetings scheduled without consultation or instruction or consent from this committee. A witness today was invited yesterday. We found out about this witness at 7 p.m. last night. There was no consultation, no instruction from this committee. And tomorrow we found out, actually we found out from Global News, that there may be another meeting tomorrow with additional witnesses. And again, no instruction, no consultation. And so I'm asking the, uh, the chair to explain to this committee, because this is completely out of tradition and the way we've operated in the last five years on this committee. This is something that Mr. is- Mr. Chair, new. I've been very patient. And I have not heard any section. I'd any like to ask the chair, I'd like to ask the chair to explain how this meeting came about. I have a few questions for the chair, how this meeting okay. came about, what efforts were made by the chair to consult with members of this committee and seek instruction and a further question, why is this meeting being held today on a constituency week? Uh, and uh, and why is this witness? Here uh, before us here today. And so this is a point of order. This is outside of the tradition of how this committee has conducted okay, gonna, itself over the last five you, years. I'm going to cut and you off there like to get to, get to an to answer. Chair to yep. explain, uh, uh, explain his actions. Sure. Well, first of all, to start, it's not a valid point of order, but I will answer your questions. Um, the premiers, representing 60, over 60% 60 of the population, wrote to the chair of finance 
to address uh, the issue of the increase of the carbon tax. The Liberal chair, maybe under political uh, pressure from his own party, refused to. As the premiers are the highest uh, office holders in their provinces, representing millions and millions of Canadians, I thought we should respect um, the provinces and invite the premiers to participate in our study of the estimates, which includes the government spending, including the carbon tax. Uh, the Foreign and Defense Commission will come in shortly. Uh, Please take your chairs seat. doing the commission such things. It is and obligation, I think, to the chair to call meetings, and I did so. I'm happy to go through some of the examples of other chairs from government-led parties doing the same, but it is within uh, the uh, prerogative of the chair to call such meetings, and I did. And we're ready to uh, start the meeting. Mr. Chair, again, point of order. Uh, a section 108 of the standing orders clearly states that committee members instruct the chair on any action. And so I ask you again, what instruction, what consultation, even basic consultation, did the chair undertake uh, to schedule this week's meetings, including the meeting that, again, we yeah, hear is going to be scheduled for tomorrow? And and to and to seek and to seek uh, again instruction from this committee. I think it's really important because this is a departure. Folks that are listening, I want them to know that this is a departure from the way we've conducted business at Ogle Committee for five years. This is new. Yeah, it is within the powers and the prerogatives of the chair to call meetings, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. Um, our clerk is looking at the exact quote ruling, if you wish, but it is fully within the powers of the chair. For example, the Liberal um, Chair of Natural Resources called a meeting without anyone's knowledge in order to ram through the anti-Alberta, anti-energy industry um, C-250. So it has been done Point in the past. Water. And yeah, please let me finish, Ms. Antwin. Um, it is fully within the powers of the chair to call such meetings, and I have. Go ahead, Ms. Antwin. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think you're, you're taking a little bit of liberty there, um, insinuating that there's uh, some sort of liberal government with, with pushing our liberal chair and another committee not to, to have these meetings. And certainly they're, they're respecting the time and, and commitments of their committee members. It's not a I point of order, Ms. Atwin. I, I'm getting there, actually, Mr. Chair. Well, I would actually like to it. highlight your own your own bias in making this decision. I'm noticing the stickers that have always been present as props in this committee. You love all, uh, pipelines and oil and gas, and it's very clear. And so perhaps that had a... a, a uh, a stake in this decision that you've made today. Mr. Chair, that's not a valid point of order. It's not Mr. a valid Chair, point of uh, order, I do. So let me finish. Yeah. I, I do love oil and gas. If it bothers you, I will close my laptop. Mr. Druin and Mr. Lawrence, and then we're going to start the meeting. So I'm not a regular member of this committee, but I've been a, a member of this committee for six years. Never would Tom Lukiski, a good Saskatchewan MP, have done this. Never in his lifetime would he have done this. That's uh, not a point of and order, And the precedent that you're setting, Mr. Chair, Mr. is Duen, that not a I can tell order. you your that's side will be pissed order. off with us because we'll call meetings at, at our, our disposal and, and your is, side will not be happy with that us. That is the chair's If that's prerogative. the way you want to set the precedence of this committee, I'm telling you, we're going to challenge you. Okay. That is the chair's prerogative to call a meeting if he wishes, if another committee wishes Mr. to do Mr. Chair, so, if you're saying that no motions and no instructions from the chair must be uh, undertaken from now on, that is false. That is simply okay. false. I'm going to read to you and for Mr. Kuzmirchuk as well. Committee chairs have considerable administrative responsibilities, starting with those involving the committee's program of activities and compliance. Chaos in there. With Chaos. instructions from the committee or an order from the House, the chair calls committee meetings. So, Well, Mr. Chair, point of order, and I believe, exactly, I think you said it right there, and it bears repeating. It bears repeating. In compliance with instructions from the committee, in compliance with instructions from the committee. In compliance with instructions from the committee. Yeah, let me, Mr. Let Chair, me you have address. neither sought, you let have neither sought you on that, from Mr. no Kamishka. consultation from this committee. Mr. Kismirchuk, let me address that. Uh, you have acted unilaterally, you have acted order, please. Hello, outside the will of the Mr. 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 Reporting to Parents Commission is back in session. with you, sir. Mr. Kismirchuk, let me address witnesses. Work with so I will invite the next. Council 
past, chairs have always respected Mr. that Mr. principle. Chuck, please and let me address the, the point of order. Mr. Dan and Lazar. That is the issue that I have with you today. If I Thank you. Respond. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. That. We are meeting our on next the estimates. In our next presentation, we'll review some of the information contained the in the overview to. report on federal government on entities involved in foreign, foreign interference uh, matters. Understanding Order 81 uh, for the meeting is meeting. The content of our presentation today is not evidence. Uh, the overview report, the written material in the overview report May I ask Mr. Chair, so that folks watching can know this, this is going to be the study on the main I forgot to mention, but my name is Aaron Dan, and I'm one of the commission council. I'm joined today by Mr. Kuzmirchuk. We are meeting on the estimates. I have the prerogative to call a meeting on the estimates that the committee agreed to. We are now when going it, to turn. When is it? When is it due, sir? That is regard. That is beside the point, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. We May are now 31st. Going to give, that's that's nice. May thirty first. That's fine. May We're 31st. now going to turn things over to no, Mr. Chair, our. Of order. You, if you just, I just want to clarify to this committee. You've mentioned main estimates, and I'll remind that this committee is responsible for vote one under Canada Post Corporation, vote one under Canada School of Public Service. Vote one under Canadian Intergovernmental Mr. Conference. Glenn, Secretary, I'm, interrupt you, so I'm hoping that Premier Mo will be able to answer questions about Canada Post Corporations. Okay. I'm not sure he will be because that's not his responsibility. So again, we're, we're, we're asking for... I will quote once and then we're going to get to... With the consent of committee. You did not get, get the consent of committee. we will get to Mr. Mo in the main estimates. CRA distribution of fuel charges. This committee is not responsible for CRA. Noting that billion going to 9.5, but it's the part of the main estimates, and we are studying the main estimates. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I've been a long time member of this committee before my appearance here. I understand what this committee is responsible, and you're misleading committee. Point, point of order, Mr. CRA Chair. CRA goes to finance, and you know damn well that's Go where it goes. Okay. You, you, you've been very... First of all, refrain from the language, Mr. Duan. Pardon my Mr. French. Duan. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chair, be, you've been very patient, but it, and I could recite numerous times that Peter Fonseca, Chair of the Finance, has adjourned and called without without instructions. I could I could rattle them off, Francis. So um, this is ridiculous. Let's move on. We've got the Premier Mo. I know that you guys don't want to talk about the carbon tax, and you don't want to hear from the people of Saskatchewan, but Canadians do. Thanks, Mr. Mo, our Premier Mo. We're going to turn. Mr. Mr. Chair, I have a I have a point of order. And, and, and this is going to be my last point of order, but it needs to be made. You called the meeting, you called the meeting unilaterally without instruction or consultation with the members of this committee. That is a fundamental bedrock principle. And furthermore, you called this meeting on the mains. The deadline to study this is May 31st. There is no reason to call this meeting during a constituency week when we literally have two and a half months to study domains. This is a political stunt and theater, which is part and parcel of what uh, of where the, our conservative colleagues are taking this okay, to get, get clips. Can you get to your point of order, please? Speak that of is my clips. point. That okay. is my point. Sir. A... You unilaterally called a meeting that was not necessary this week because you're you know, because your team is after. Uh, clips. Okay. And nice. uh, and again, I take issue and umbrage uh, with that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, but it's not a valid point of order. Ms. Vignola, then hopefully we can get to our honorable guests. Ms. Vignola, go ahead, please. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I simply wanted to add to the facts in this matter. According to the standing orders, meetings must be called 48 hours in advance. And members of the committee must be informed or at the very least consulted in the choice of witnesses, which is not the case and which has not been the case for some time. And contrary to what my colleague to my right would dare to claim, well, that I'm not interested in hearing from about Saskatchewans. Well, it actually is important for me to see all perspectives, even in Quebec, the carbon tax 
doesn't apply. And yet it's important to hear from all stakeholders, all perspectives. Now, that said, I would like now to decry, denounce the methods that are being used in going about this. Had we been informed, we probably would have given our consent. Let's hear from these witnesses. However, we were not informed, we were not consulted, and as Deputy Chair of this committee, I find this to be a great pity, not only in terms of my own preparation and my own research in preparation for a meeting, but also, of course, it's important to give witnesses uh, the time uh, and to ask questions of them that have to do with the matters that we are currently studying, regardless of whether it's uh, the estimates or another issue or matter. Now, not only is there a requirement for 48 hours notice when uh, there's a request made to hold a meeting, but during a non-sitting week, this is a constituency week, which are invaluable to all of us, for all of us. And, you know, perhaps you're only thinking of the uh, next election, but I think of my constituents in Pom Limualu that want to see me, that want to meet with me, that want to talk to me about the situations that they're facing when it comes to employment insurance, uh, uh, seniors, uh, retirement benefits, uh, immigration issues. I have a huge number of people that are knocking on my door seeking my support, and that's just not possible in this instance. Now, obviously, during a non-sitting week, committees, well, committees should take place, meetings should take place during the same time slots as during sitting weeks. And that is not the case. In the case of yesterday and tomorrow, you know, we uh, learned in the global news that there'll also be a meeting tomorrow, even though we received uh, that uh, uh, notice of meeting at 9.45 this morning. And I am deeply troubled. There should be greater respect displayed to each other, uh, respect for our work, for our duties. Mr Chairperson, on a point of order. I have a lot of respect for the member. However, this is not a point of order. Mr. Lawrence is right. Uh, if you could get to your point of order, uh, Mrs. McNola. Well, listen, I was referring to the House of Commons Standing Orders, uh, 20th of June 2024, uh, regarding uh, notice required. And uh, if this is not a point of order that I'm raising, what is it? <laughs> That 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 speaks to a problem here. If I I'm I'm not just talking about anything willy nilly. I'm specifically sorry. Well, I thought it was quite clear what I was saying. I'm referring to the standing orders. This isn't coming out of nowhere. Um, I've had one answer, but we're double checking. If you want or if you wish, bear with me. We'll suspend for a couple seconds. And we'll just reconfirm. <laughs> We are suspended for a couple moments. Well, <clears throat> waiting for Mo. The liberals are incensed. It's twenty three minutes in. And uh, they do, they just do not want to have this meeting go. Uh, they're like, well, it's a week that they're off. Of course, they just don't want um, any negative clips. Uh, understandable. And uh, the liberal, the conservatives are like, well, we just want to work. <laughs> hey, uh, we don't want the weeks off, so they've taken a break. Um, they're back at the other committee. Don't, don't fret not. We'll go back. We won't miss a bit. Okay, they're back. Yeah. Election of the chair, and then there's a different time period for 106.4. All right, here. Hold on a second. And there you go. Or, but not specifically to call a meeting. So, 
Well, I appreciate your comments. Um, we are going to proceed. Premier Mo, the floor is yours for Mr. five Chair, minutes. Mr. Thank Chair, you for point of point of order. Point of order. Well, I've, turned the, the, I've turned it over to Mr. Mo, our Premier Mo. This, you, okay, uh, this, this is about, another Chair, one. This Holy. is about standing order 108, which you have not addressed here. That states, and again, I want you to address it to this committee. That states, in compliance with instructions from the committee or an order from the House. The Mr. chair Mr. calls Mr. Committee Kismir, meeting, Chuck, can I interrupt you? I have. Mr. Kismir, you have Chuck, I have. Those things. You I have will. done none of those things. Let me, and it is a shame and a farce, as okay. Madame Vidal has stated. Get your stated, clip in, Mr. Kismir, Chuck, learned, and then I will address that. We have that we have learned about tomorrow's meeting from Global News, as opposed from... ...our chair. That is a farce. That is a farce. And it's a violation of the bedrock principles of the way that this committee has conducted its work over the last five years. That is shameful. It is shameful and disrespectful to the work of this committee. And as Madame Vignola has stated, we want to be able to prepare for our witnesses. We want to be able to have uh, due preparation so that we can do the work that Canadians expect us to do. We have neither been provided uh, uh, any opportunity to consult. We have we've been provided no opportunity to provide instruction, and we have not been provided opportunity to prepare for this day. And that is on the chair. And you have not responded to Standing Order 108. Uh, I have responded to that, Mr. Kuzmierczak. It is the committee has uh, instructed me to do hold meetings on the estimates, and that's what this meeting is on, on the main estimates. So I have ruled on that. We're now going to turn things over to Premier Mo for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I trust you can hear me all right. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I do appreciate the uh, the very warm Canadian welcome uh, to your committee here this morning. I believe it likely started with a request uh, by myself and a number of other premiers <laughs> to appear warm. before the Finance <laughs> Committee, and I believe that request uh, still stands, and we hope to hear back uh, from them. And I think this is an important conversation for each of us as elected members, as uh, next Monday uh, we are going to see the carbon tax increase to a uh, a level that was uh, previously never committed to to achieve. Um, and when at, at its introduction and and I think that's important for us to just think uh, about the words that we should never say never uh, in this in this nation never say never and I was at that meeting uh, many years ago in Montreal uh, where there was a commitment made uh, to go to a $50 uh, carbon tax and, and since then what we've seen is commitments to go uh, much higher than that but I would point uh, more recently uh, to uh, July 15th in 2020 to uh, some statements made by our Bank of Canada governor um, and I quote our message to Canadians is that interest rates are very low and they're going to be there for a long time uh, he goes on to say uh, if you've got a mortgage or you're considering making a major purchase or you're a business and considering making an investment you can be confident that rates will be low for a long time again I would say never say never because so much has happened since that point in time July 15th 2020 um, what that did is really uh, provide a confirmation bias for some poor policy decision and, and enhancing or advancing uh, continued poor policy decision taking uh, the carbon tax from 50 to uh, a committed 170 now and, and beyond um, of which we will discuss uh, here today and our ask is to pause uh, the increase that is coming on Monday uh, but also the development of clean electricity standards clean fuel standards which is really a second carbon tax and methane 75 standards which are unachievable uh, the oil cap Mr. Oil Mr. Chair a, a point of order I, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt uh, the Honourable Premier but I do have a point of order here I'm, you, I'm are trying you, to... are, you are interrupting though uh, uh, Mr. Premier, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chuck, he, he, the I, Premier just has a couple of minutes left could we let no, him no, finish no, and and I, I, like I am. On, but what I would like to, to uh, excuse me, for what Premier, I have a point of order. Right. Sorry, of order sorry, Premier. Premier. Let me interrupt you. I'll I'd, I'd like time. to on, on behalf thank of you. the thank you. residents. Of thank you, Premier, Premier. And, and we're eager to, we're eager to hear uh, from you. I just have a point of order uh, that yeah, I'd like to share and clarify. We have been asked uh, to study specifically. This committee has been asked to study about twelve vote ones. Okay. Uh, including the Canada Post uh, Corporation vote regarding the Canada School of Public Service. Of order, Mr. Kuzmerchuk? Could you tell us, explain to us the relevance of the uh, of the 12 votes that we have been assigned to consider? Because I don't see this particular subject matter connected in any way, shape, or form 
to the 12 votes that this committee has been asked to study. We are not the finance committee. We are the OGO committee. We have been asked to study I'm happy to 12 answer votes. That, Mr. Kuzmerich. How does that how does that relate to what we've been asked to study? Thank you. I appreciate that. We always allowed a very wide range of questioning on the estimates and the supplementary estimates. The carbon tax raise is included in the main estimates, and therefore that's part of it. So I'll allow Mr. Our Premier Mo to continue. And very much, Premier. I think, uh, important to Canadians, uh, as this is a one of the policies, and they are stacking, uh, that is making life more unaffordable for not only Saskatchewan residents, but all Canadians as a whole. It's making industries less competitive. Those are industries that employ people in my community and, and quite likely in yours as well. And it is really showing no measurable impact when it comes to uh, reducing emissions. And I, I, I would just point to the inflationary aspect of, of the carbon tax specifically today. And, and that was uh, when the latest consumer price index came out. Saskatchewan uh, today is at 1.7 percent, uh, down under the 2 percent projected target that the Bank of Canada had hit, a uh, one full point lower than the than the Canadian average. Um, and Statistics Canada had said specifically uh, that was due to a decision that the Saskatchewan government made to remove the carbon tax from home heating. And so uh, you can imagine what would happen to our CPI nationwide if we were to pause, first of all, uh, and then remove uh, the consumer carbon tax on uh, Canadians. And I would say, uh, where does this bring us today when we think about uh, never saying never. Uh, today, that same Bank of Canada over the last two years has increased our our interest rates ten different on 10 different occasions. Uh, just this week, they have declared that Canada is in a productivity emergency. And I would say that we don't need to accept this moving forward. We can make changes. Never say never. Um, there is another way, and Saskatchewan has been working towards that way for some time. Uh, the Bank of Canada uh, had also indicated that there needs to be um, investment uh, brought into our nation. We're second in the nation uh, when we compare on per capita provincial investment today. Uh, we're up 25% uh, last year, uh, projected to be first uh, this coming year with another 14% increase. Um, and we need to, I think, all Canadians encourage uh, just that investment, that competitive investment environment in uh, each of our provinces and more broadly across the nation. Uh, there are opportunities for us then uh, to take that investment in innovation and share it through commerce with the rest of the world, share it uh, through uh, Article 6 of the Paris Accord, for example, which this government signed and of which I worked on as environment minister with one of the previous environment ministers. Article 6, I think, is an opportunity for us to um, create policies that allow for that investment and then, uh, in turn, share those those investment uh, innovations with the rest of the world uh, through commerce uh, by employing Canadians in my community and yours uh, and utilizing some of the tools that we have, such as Article 6. And so there is another way. Never say never. Um, and we need to ensure that we are looking at some of our competitive environment, those that are employing and creating wealth in our communities across this nation to ensure that we're providing that platform to attract that capital investment, to attract those jobs, and ultimately uh, to provide that opportunity for Canada uh, to not be in a state where we're in a pro uh, productivity emergency, but are in a state where we are leading the world with the productivity that we are, uh, that we are experiencing as Canadians. That's uh, traditionally, I think, what we all would like to achieve. And I, and I hope uh, that we would find uh, some consensus on that today. And again, um, I wore my red tie in the spirit of collaboration. I wear it to our Council of Federation meetings where we come together uh, as, as uh, you know, from different party political backgrounds and different political stripes. Uh, but we come together with an effort and an initiative to, you know, find a consensus on behalf of the Canadians that we collectively represent at that table. And I would say that uh, this is an opportunity for all of us, those that are in the minority uh, government that we have today and, and in opposition to uh, do what is in the best interest of Canadians, not just for today, but into the future as well when it comes to uh, creating jobs and sharing some of the, the sustainable innovations uh, that have been invested on already in our nation and enhancing the opportunity for additional investment into just those innovations in the industries that we do well. Because the fact of the matter is this, and this is a, from a Saskatchewan perspective, we produce food, fuel and fertilizer, and we produce not only the highest quality, most affordable food, fuel and fertilizer that you can find in the world, and we produce it for over 150 countries around the world. We produce the most sustainable food, fuel, and fertilizer that you can find on earth. And I think that's something for each of us to, to remember is never say never. We can always do better. And we should be making every effort to do that around this table on behalf of the folks that we represent. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Mo. Mr. Redekop, please, for six minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Premier Moe. It's great to have another common sense conservative voice in Ottawa, to, uh, Saskatchewan voice, sorry, to, in Ottawa to talk about the carbon tax. It's very clear that the Liberals uh, are nervous about this meeting and, and that they don't really want to hear from Saskatchewan people, but I do. So, uh, as you know, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has produced a report that confirms this year alone, the average family in Saskatchewan is going to lose $525 to the carbon tax. And the NDP Liberal Costly Coalition plans to quadruple the carbon tax, meaning that families in Saskatchewan will ultimately see their losses increasing to $1,723 a year, according to the same report. So the NDP Liberal Coalition will be ripping out thousands of dollars from the pockets of people in Saskatchewan. What's the impact of the carbon tax on families? living in our province. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Mr. Uh, my apologies. That's that's the uh, the annual impact uh, directly to Saskatchewan families, uh, taking into account, uh, you know, what the, what they're paying for the carbon tax, some of the indirect uh, costs that are coming to them uh, due to the carbon tax, a cost, for example, at the grocery store. Uh, but what we have uh, in this province as well is that uh, we're very much a natural resource based economy here. Um, at, rooted in agriculture. And we're trying to climb that economic value chain. We're trying to, to climb um, with respect to the jobs that we're creating, the opportunities and the market access that we're creating. For example, uh, we're, we're attracting investment into the canola oil industry so that we can provide uh, canola oil as, a, as opposed to the raw seed. That's climbing that value chain. It's creating jobs here at home. Um, and, and, and where uh, the, the, the carbon tax comes in, in addition to the direct impact to Saskatchewan families that I would put forward, you know, drive more just because we are, are more geographically dispersed, in particular those families uh, in the north. Um, but it also comes in into uh, a significant impact in the jobs that are available here because industries are looking with, uh, you know, this is a hindrance uh, for uh, their investment. We have been able to attract significant investment in, in spite, I would say, of, uh, of this hindrance, not uh, in any way because of it. Uh, however, that's not to say that uh, we aren't having active discussions with the industry and the people of the of Saskatchewan on how we continue to reduce our carbon footprint here. And so the impact is very real to families uh, directly. It's very real, I would say, in particular to northern families, uh, where they uh, traditionally have been heating uh, their homes with electricity. Um, they are seeing some uh, solace uh, and, and savings in that uh, with the recent decision that the provincial government has made here. And we, again, extend to the, to the federal government the opportunity uh, um, to extend their decision around home heating fuel to all Canadians and all types of heating fuel. Um, but they are they are having some reprieve on that uh, as, as we speak. But I would say they uh, still have to drive a significant distance uh, for any uh, you know significant level of supplies. And so families very much are feeling it uh, directly. Um, they're also feeling it through the, you know, the job prospects and opportunities of which I'd say are strong in Saskatchewan, but certainly could be even stronger. So you've been a strong opponent of the carbon tax since you took office. Your predecessor, Brad Wall, was as well. Uh, you've had the opportunity to speak with the Prime Minister, launch legal challenges, et cetera. How many different appeals have you made to Ottawa to stop the carbon tax? All of them. Um, on every occasion uh, that I've had the opportunity to speak uh, with the Prime Minister, whether it be uh, uh, most recently, we had a significant presence at COP28 in Dubai. Uh, Saskatchewan did. We had over 60 uh, provincial and national uh, businesses, delegation, industry representatives, uh, post-secondary uh, folks that were with us there. I uh, had the opportunity to speak with a couple of ministers, including the Minister of Environment uh, in in that setting, uh, each and every time uh, through multiple ministers um, and, and the prime minister himself, uh, we have, uh, you know, voiced our, our opposition uh, to this, uh, what is essentially amounts to an inflationary tax. Uh, my predecessor uh, at the very early uh, days of its introduction, and I remember it well because I was environment minister at the time, I was in Montreal uh, when uh, the prime minister raised to his feet and introduced uh, this tax on, on Canadians, um, I believe it was October the 3rd, 2016, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but my predecessor, uh, Brad Waller, very quickly asked for, you know, has anyone done the economic analysis on this? And I think what we're seeing today with the Bank of Canada's statement, Bank of Canada governor's statement, or the Bank of Canada's statement around uh, the productivity emergency that we are facing in this nation um, tells us that, no, we haven't uh, done an economic analysis on this policy and many others, um, but it's high time we should. Um, and I am not in any way saying that we should be making decisions that are uh, increasing the emissions in our industries, but we should be looking at uh, what are the emissions in our industries relative to their counterparts and competitors in other areas of the world? Are we cleaner? Um, and can we do more? 
Uh, and in the meantime, we should ensure that we are making every effort to make our cleaner products available to the world, displacing some of those dirtier products that are that are produced in other areas. And I, I think uh, if you accept the fact that climate change is real, if you accept the fact that climate change is uh, a global challenge, not just one in, in Saskatchewan or even Canada for that matter, uh, we need to work together with our national partners on achieving global solutions. So as you know, the federal NDP has been a strong supporter of the carbon tax, and they voted to support this Liberal government every time, including a couple of times last week. Um, as Premier, how do you feel about an NDP party that supports this hurtful carbon tax and is seemingly against our farmers, against our oil and gas producers, and just not willing to listen to the pain of everyday folks in Saskatchewan? It's disappointing uh, because we have we have a, a provincial arm of that NDP party here that opposes uh, um, Saskatchewan's wishes too to remove uh, the carbon tax, uh, the consumer carbon tax off of uh, Saskatchewan families and ultimately uh, the cost that it instills on on the industries that are employing those very same families. When it comes to oil and gas, for example, and you know I'm I'm happy to say that if if the rest of the world produced oil and gas like we do here in Saskatchewan, uh, the similar type products, uh, global emissions from oil production would drop 25 percent overnight. Um, that has hasn't come about easily. That has come about by um, investment uh, in the Saskatchewan energy industry, investment in methane reductions. And so the the, the 60 percent methane reductions that were uh, put forward a couple of years ago, um, our oil industry was actually able to meet them. They cannot get to the 75 percent. That will close down Thanks, significant Premier parts Mo, I have of to, the oil industry. Yeah, I have to cut you off there. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Uh, Kuzmierczak, please go ahead, sir. I believe, it's, I, think uh, I believe it's uh, Charles. Mr. Sousa, go ahead, sir. Um, uh, thank you, Premier, for being here today. Um, can you uh, advise this committee, when were you contacted to appear before us today? <laughs> they don't want this committee to go forward, the Liberals. You, the Liberals are right My against it. My apologies. I, uh, we we uh, have moved away from most of the online stuff, but I do appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I don't know if I was contacted or if I had uh, had a discussion with another Premier or two about uh, our request was actually to appear before the Finance Committee. We've not heard back from the Finance Committee at this point in time. Um, and then, uh, so I guess I was contacted. Um, I can't say exactly when. I can find out, though. Did you have discussions last week about this? Uh, this past week. What day is today? Okay, that's fine, Mr. Spider. Yeah. Um, Keep in mind that the people of Saskatchewan, the tremendous work they do is greatly appreciated. <laughs> what days All of today? Canada has to stand united <laughs> in terms of improving our Whatever. economy, supporting trade, initiating competitiveness, and fighting climate, and ensuring that we lower, uh, we lower overall emissions to support a green economy. And I think you've you've said that in so many words. Um, and and you you reaffirm that it's important for us to stand united. And of course, the, the federal government has also invested 100 million or so in the Potage Mine, and we recognize the importance of regional economic growth for the benefit of all of Canada. Um, Premier, you applauded the Supreme Court of Canada's finding um, in the Federal Impact Assessment Act. You recognize the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada? Um, most certainly, uh, we do. Um, and you encourage Saskatchewan residents to also um, abide by the laws you put in force, like the sales tax that you've increased, the fees that you've imposed. You want your residents to pay their taxes. You don't want them breaking the law. Is that correct? 100%. We have a sales tax 3% lower than where it was under the New Democrats, yes. And so we want to make certain that everyone abides by the law. You're a man of law and you're a man of order. The Supreme Court also found that the federal pollution pricing system is constitutional. And I know you're disputing it and you're going forward and that's appropriate, but do you recognize the top court of this country when they make their decisions, sir? Certain, certainly, and we expect uh, these decisions to end up in a similar court at some point in time. You've already stated that you do want to lower emissions, correct? You want to correct. see Canada and on and Saskatchewan, you're the former Minister of Environment, you see the benefit? I would say Saskatchewan's already uh, participating in the lowering of our emissions. And there probably is a pricing system, a, a carbon trade within some of your major polluters now. I know in Ontario, we instituted a cap and trade back in 2017, 16, when I was Minister of Finance, to try to find a pricing system to exempt Ontario uh, from the alternative, which is the federal program, which they're encouraging us to do to initiate and support the green economy and enable us to be competitive and abide by international laws because, of course, our farmers and others are competing out there. We want them to do well. Did uh, Saskatchewan ever consider an alternative system? Yes, we did. All of them were costly to our industry, as is the federal backstop that we're experiencing now, as well as costly to Saskatchewan families. Um, 
And so you're of the opinion, never say never, but it sounds like kick the can down the road for next generation to deal with. Right? What we need is to take initiative and ensure that we are prepared to do what's necessary for future generations and ensure that we're competitive, right? Yeah, quite, so, quite proud of what Saskatchewan's doing. I mentioned the oil uh, industry um, and, and, and what they have already done through investments in that industry. But, uh, you know, our ag industry, our Global Institute for Food Security just did a study on uh, comparing, uh, for example, wheat and canola production and the, the amount of carbon in a ton of Saskatchewan wheat and canola relative to the next seven largest producers around the world. 64% lower carbon content in a Saskatchewan ton of wheat and canola than the next seven producers. When it comes to field peas, that's 92% lower. So I would say, uh, with all due respect, Saskatchewan industries are most certainly doing uh, I, part, I agree. and we're going to continue to. I, and I applaud the, the efforts that the people yeah. of Saskatchewan are taking we, to move forward. We appreciate that. If, sir, before I go on to my next point, sure. can you uh, uh, provide this committee with some uh, documents as to how you came to be here, like the your, your schedule and who it was that was contacting you and when it was contacted? Acted in order for you to appear today, can uh, you do if that? Committee, if the committee feels that's of relevance, um, it is. It what, is what, I, what I would ask uh, also is maybe this committee would encourage the chair of the finance committee uh, to allow the premiers that are that's the original request um, to, to to present at that committee as well. And By all I means, think it's important. Pro provide yeah. both. Uh, that'd be yeah. great. I uh, would. Uh, Chair, I'm going to, I'd like to move forward a motion, a notice of motion at this point, and I'll have it translated into French, and it reads as follows. That. When the committee undertakes to invite witnesses, that A, a witness list submission deadline be set by the chair with explicit consent of the committee. B, witnesses be invited proportionally to each recognized party standing in the house. And C, no such witnesses be invited without instructions of the committee. This is, uh, I'm moving this motion forward. Uh, point of order, point of order. I wanna clarify. If the member was moving motion or actually giving notice, I no, was I'm moving the I, I'm moving the motion. I have my, I'm sorry. But point of order. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Phillips. Uh, I, I don't I don't believe that motion is in order. We Excuse will. Have order. They're just. Oh, oh, okay. They're just doing a break thing. Super chats are open. What are you guys saying here? Let me see. Oh, we got, oh, 53 seconds ago. I watched this one. Canadian Constitution Foundation. I don't know. Criminalizing speech in Canada. Okay, here, they're back. Thanks, Mr. Sousa. So I assume that you're moving it as a matter of hand motion, which I don't believe it's uh, a matter of hand, so I'm not going to rule it in order, Mr. Souza. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I I would like to challenge that. I mean, right now there's been methods That's fine. made. If, if, and we if you wish to challenge the chair, we, I, we, I uh, do. Uh, I do wish to challenge okay. it and move forward the motion and explain why. I mean, there's been instances that we've already noted this earlier before the meeting that unilateral decisions are being made, decisions to move meetings and witnesses without notice to us. It's uh, impacting on members' privilege. It's also disrespecting some of our yeah, members. So gonna, it's a violation sorry, of our vision. So Mr. Seuss, I'm going to We will go right to the. Yeah, we'll go right to it. I'm advised by the clerk. It's treated similar to a dilatory, so there's not a uh, chance to speak on it. But we will go right to the vote on it, Mr. Sousa. Mr. Clerk. Shall the addition of the chair be sustained? Ms. Atwin. No. Mr. McKinnon. No. Mr. Monsieur Drouin. No. Mr. Kusmerjic. No. Mr. Shusa. No. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chambers. Sustain. Mr. Lawrence. Yes, sustain. Ms. Crump Newman. Yes. Madame Vignola. No. No. Monsieur Boulris. No. Three yeas, seven nays. Uh, so the motion, uh, I don't believe it's valid, but we will uh, debate it. Just give me two seconds, so I need to check something else with, uh, with the chair. So bear with me one second, Mr. Sousa. Okay, they're 
He's conferring with the clerk who really runs things. <laughs> no, it's definitely going on like this. The liberals are not happy of meeting on their off week. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Remembering it's, <coughs> it's just three, three weeks off. Yeah, they had three weeks off this last month. Um, so it's really, you know, and I don't know. Mr. Sousa, are you sending in both languages? Oh, yeah, I guess. Oh, yes, we are. Yeah. Um, colleagues, there is a uh, procedural thing with this that we have to go over with the analysts and the chair. So I'm going to suspend for a few minutes while we take a look at this. Just bear with us a couple minutes. Premier Mo, I apologize. Bear with us a couple moments. Okay, so while it goes to that, uh, I'm going to go over to the public hearings. Okay. Oh, the public hearings paused as well. why that is they must have paused for lunch yeah they must have paused for lunch um there was the last 20 minutes it was actually fairly interesting it's too bad um the the uh the feed is um well it's not the greatest that up. It'd be nice if I had a direct feed, but donate and we can put our cameras there. So basically, this is going to be going on for the. Well, this is supposed to be mo till till twelve, but the liberals keep throwing in all these motions. Um, I bet you uh, Premier Scott Mo he'll he'll definitely stay if asked to. I think you know he's in his office like. And these liberals, too, I am very complaining about it. Like, you know, you get to sit in your office nowadays with this teleconference thing, frick, you know? It's not a big deal. It's great. Uh, I don't understand what is in the back and forth about. It, they just don't want this. They don't want Scott and Mo to have any clips or to say anything. And remember, he's not paying the carbon tax. He's, like, leading the the charge of not paying it. He's like saying like he's not paying it. Like the one uh, liberal MP says, do you want your people to, to do the law abide by the law? Um, why aren't you abiding by the law, which is carbon tax. I remember the, the, they took it to uh, court and, and everything like that. So definitely. Not going that way. Okay. What do we got? Yeah, so the uh, and the other one, public hearing is on a break as well. Which I'm not sure. And I can't bring the feedback at all. It's live or nothing. So let's go back. MP Mo said quite a f few things. Uh, it, it was definitely uh, the liberal MP Kazmierczyk. <laughs> he was he started the liberal foray against um, having this committee, of course, right? <clears throat> and uh, and then later on. It's uh, the the other limbo MP uh, Sousa, Charles Sousa. He he started questioning like, hey, you know, he he did the question above about uh, you know, do you want your people to to pay for the sales tax that you increased? <laughs> you know, the dig, <laughs> and, you know, why aren't you paying this? And they're gonna we're gonna see going forward what the heck the liberal response is. That'll be from the PMO office. We won't hear about that today. It definitely is going. This was this committee. Okay. Oh, okay. They're back. Fine. All right. Oh, there we go. Sound. Mr. Sousa. 
There they are. They're voting. You're muted, Mr. Sousa. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Mr. Chambers. No. Mr. Lawrence. No. Ms. Grant Newman. No. Madame Vignola. Oui. Monsieur, Monsieur Boulris. En faveur. Seven yeas, three nays. Okay, that passes. Uh, we're now on to Mrs. Vignola. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Sousa there. Mr. Mouge. Premier Moore, I'd like to thank you nevertheless for being here today. Now, I do have a couple of questions for you, particularly to do with the fact that you find that the current government is too much of a centrist government. Now, coming from Quebec, I kind of agree with you there. Now, when it comes to centralisation, the federal government is trying to encroach on areas of jurisdiction that belong to you and that belong to Quebec, for example, in the area of health care, with strings attached or dividing up transfer payments. Now, from my recollection, you had called for a transfer to the tune of 35% of the health care services budgets, uh, budget. And just like the other premiers, you didn't get that. What would a 35% to healthcare transfer allow you to do, allow you to improve, not only within the framework of your own budget, but in terms of the healthcare services provided to uh, people from your province? Secondly, does the federal government, can the federal government really know what your healthcare needs are in Saskatchewan? I will answer those in reverse. Um, so the second question of the the uh, federal government knowing what the health uh, care, wh whoever the federal government is, not just this administration, um, what what the needs are in Saskatchewan or British Columbia or the territories or uh, in Atlantic Canada or Quebec or Ontario, um, at a high level possibly, uh, but they should always be looking uh, for opportunities to work with uh, the the subnational jurisdiction on how they can traditionally fund. Traditionally, our our health care was funded 50-50. Uh, there was tax points uh, um, that were uh, moved to the, the province a number of years ago, and that's how um, the chair of our Council of Federation at that point in time was Premier Legault uh, from Quebec, and we very much were supportive of returning the health care funding balance back to uh, the 35-65 that it was always uh, in Tended uh, to be. Uh, what would that mean uh, to Saskatchewan? Well, you know, what where we did land with the federal funding was a 2.6 percent increase, I believe, over the next five years. Um, we just released our budget here this past year. It was 10.4 percent was the lift that we had uh, provided to healthcare. Um, some of that is actually the change in in how we deliver healthcare uh, here in the province, and so. Um, a 35% lift would restore the, the balance. Uh, I think what you're seeing happen today is provinces, and you're seeing a number of their budgets come out uh, as we speak. Provinces are making up the difference uh, in many cases, uh, and that's what we are doing here, and that's why I think the very uh, importance of, of this committee meeting on ensuring that we have a, a palatable and attractive investment environment, uh, it could, because it's only in our case in Saskatchewan through the strength of our, our growing economy that we're actually able to make uh, that 10.4% investment in health um, a 9% investment in education, again, another provincial area of jurisdiction. And so uh, we have many points of agreement with uh, with uh, Premier Legault uh, at our Council of Federation table and beyond. I think Premier Legault uh, intervened, as did uh, eight other provinces, um, seven other provinces, uh, Quebec and ourselves, pardon me, uh, that intervened on uh, Saskatchewan's beside uh, behalf uh, in the the Supreme Court case uh, when it came to uh, uh, removing the carbon tax, uh, the consumer carbon tax on on Canadians, uh, uh, we in turn have uh, collaborated with Premier Legault on uh, advocating and working through our First Minister's table Merci. to increase our. Thank you, thank you. Provinces. Merci. Well, thank you. On that very matter, as far as Quebec is concerned, we don't have a carbon tax. 
and the impact on the price increases, according to 165 economists across Canada, well, and I don't want to in any way minimise what uh, the residents of Saskatchewan are feeling and experiencing when I say this, but in Quebec, it is the carbon market alongside California, which is the wealthiest state of the United States in Quebec, the carbon market has put back in the coffers $1.5 billion. The Canadian provinces had the opportunity to join Quebec in that uh, carbon exchange uh, that uh, was not only good for the government coffers, but also for businesses, companies and corporations because it stimulated the innovation in those companies. At the end of the day, why did Saskatchewan make a different choice? And if Saskatchewan wants to get rid of the carbon tax, well, what steps will Saskatchewan take in order to reduce the impacts of climate change and to drive down uh, greenhouse gas emissions? You'll recall that the carbon tax is a similar measure to uh, one that was put in place in the past to... Uh, diminish or reduce uh, ox oxidous sulphur um, emissions. And we have 65% fewer emissions of uh, oxidous sulphur. And we'd like that to happen Canada-wide, and in Quebec in particular, thanks to a uh, carbon marketplace. So why didn't you follow suit, uh, i.e. the carbon market or the carbon exchange, which is kind of r r lucrative in both the middle and short term. Great. We're out of time. If you could offer as short as answer as you can, please. This really speaks to the diversity uh, in our nation. What works in one area of the nation may not work ideally in another area of the nation. And, and I think this is a reason why uh, if you don't have a federal government that isn't working collaboratively with all um, sub-national governments across the nation, you are destined uh, to fail in your policy development. Uh, with respect to the carbon tax specifically, uh, we've always said that it's a, a harmful tax from, from day one. And uh, we've always also said outside of Quebec, uh, it's been reasonably fairly imposed, as harmful as, as it is across the nation. What we've seen more recently uh, with the uh, decisions uh, on, on that impact uh, heating fuel in Atlantic Canada uh, is that again outside of Quebec and uh, now this tax isn't being applied fairly across the nation or imposed fairly across the nation uh, in any way and that's why we made the decisions uh, that we did uh, when it comes to home heating fuel uh, for giving the carbon or re rebating the carbon tax on uh, natural gas and electricity. Sorry, I'll pass your time. Uh, Mr. Bulleris, uh, welcome to OGO. Uh, you have six minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and thank you to our guest. I'm very glad to have an opportunity to speak with the Premier of Saskatchewan today, even though I still don't really understand how it turned out that he's appearing before this committee when we're supposed to be turning our attention to other issues, i.e. the estimates. But given that he is here, I'll take this opportunity. Premier Mo, you'll agree with me that uh, climate change is uh, having increasing impacts on communities, many of your communities in Saskatchewan, that over the recent years have experienced substantial forest fires, is an increasing number over time. It has an impact on public health and on the evacuees that have had to leave their homes in 2023. Your province had thousands of forest fires, which is far above the 150 uh, average, uh, and the surface area that was affected was 10 times bigger than what would normally occur. And the skies were smoke-filled for days on end and folks had difficulty breathing. Now, Canada is uh, a laggard on the world stage when it comes to our greenhouse gas emissions. Canada did sign the Paris Accord, and I imagine you uh, are aware of uh, the objectives under the Paris Accord. Now, how is it that we shouldn't make the big polluters pay, those that have a real bearing on our climate change? What's your game plan to deal with those big emitters, please? Well, I would first of all say the average forest fires in Saskatchewan is 300, not 100 or 150. And we had 450 uh, last year and we experienced some rain that helped us out immensely. Uh, Alberta and northwestern uh, 
British Columbia had a much more challenging year. Yes, uh, climate change does uh, impact weather, which we're experiencing, I think, in fairness, uh, all across the nation and, and around the world are experiencing to some degree. Um, the Paris Accord, I'm very familiar with the Paris Accord, and in that accord, uh, there are a number of opportunities, I think, for us to uh, provide a platform. Let me back up. I don't agree that Canada is a climate laggard, and I certainly don't agree that Saskatchewan is a climate climate laggard. I think Saskatchewan and Canada are leaders when it comes to developing industries that are reducing emissions in the in in, uh, in with innovation, uh, and then sharing those around the world. And again, I said through the Paris Accord, there was Article Six, uh, the uh, internationally traded mitigation outcomes option, of which uh, I would hope that this uh, and I would encourage uh, this federal government to act on uh, and to work collaboratively. For example, in uh, with the Saskatchewan agriculture industry in uh, we're selling air drills all around the world. We'd love to be able to recapture some of those carbon, um, some of those carbon credits back uh, to our Canada and back back to our nation and to our province, and ultimately to our uh, our agricultural industry and our our innovators in that industry that are building some of the latest and greatest technology that are sequestering carbon mm -hmm. in our soils, ultimately making Saskatchewan agriculture one of the most sustainable uh, producers of food in the world, and marginally very very close uh, to being net zero today when you compile that with uh, precision agriculture, when you compile that uh, with the tier four engines uh, that Saskatchewan agriculture producers are paying for and utilizing in every piece of equipment they have. So Canada is not a climate laggard. Cli Canada is an innovation leader when it comes to uh, providing innovation to reduce emissions, whether it be in, from Saskatchewan's perspective, but, <clears throat> the ag industry, the potash industry, the uranium industry for clean nuclear power, or the, oil, or the oil industry. And so right, uh, I think we need to look at this. Premier. Premier, I'm sorry, I know that you like to speak. I know you like talking, Premier, but you haven't answered my question. Now, if you look at the figures, Premier, Canada is the second biggest uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter. It's not me saying this. This is a UN report that has stated this. In 2016 and 2020, on average, we emitted 16 tonnes per inhabitant of greenhouse gas emissions. That's four times bigger than the uh, global average. And we are a far cry from meeting the UN's uh, climate objectives. How are you going to make the big polluters pay for what they are responsible for in terms of climate change? You circumvented the question, you waved your magic wand, and uh, you, you think that with giant uh, vacuum cleaners, you're going to be able to sequester uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But what about the people you represent? How are you going to protect them from climate change? With all due respect, you're bouncing back between gross numbers of carbon emitted and then a per capita, a per capita um, uh, measurement. And, and, and you're, you're not able to do that um, with any credibility with the question. The goal is not for the Paris, it's for the, the big climate polluters to pay. The goal is for them to reduce their emissions uh, because they are employing people in your community and my community with all due respect. Um, per capita emissions is the wrong metric to use. And I would encourage everyone at this committee and across government to not be using that metric. If you want to use that metric, Saskatchewan is the largest per capita exporter in Canada and one of the largest per capita exporters in the world. And so what we are producing, yes, it is emitting global emissions, uh, but we are providing uh, that food, fuel and fertilizer, the cleanest food and fuel and fertilizer to over 150 countries around the world. And we are uh, displacing, uh, in the case of potash fertilizer, for example, it's 50% lower in its carbon uh, carbon emissions per ton produced. Um, we are displacing fertilizer that is being produced by Russia and Belarus today by making more Saskatchewan fertilizer available. Credit to the federal government that invested in the latest uh, fertilizer, uh, the latest potash uh, mine that is being developed here, a $20 billion investment by a global company. And so the goal is not for uh, our employers uh, to pay more. The goal is for them to emit less and to displace higher emitting like competing, competing industries around the world. Uh, that is how we build a strong Canadian economy. That is how we lower global emissions. And that's how we employ Canadians uh, in your community and mine. Thanks. That is our time. Uh, we're now on to the five minutes. Rounds, uh, Mr. Lawrence, please. Thank you. And thank you, Premier, for coming here. And uh, as a member of the Finance Committee, let me express my extreme disappointment with the chair unwilling to hear uh, the representatives of over a million Canadians in the great province of Saskatchewan. Um, I want to I want to focus relatively narrowly, um, and that's with respect to the inflationary impact of the carbon tax. Tiff Macklin in Finance Committee uh, made it quite clear 
that actually 0.6% of inflation, which equates to around 20 to 30% of inflation, given the rate uh, on, on a day, uh, is responsible is the responsibility of the carbon tax, and that the increase will be responsible for another 0.15%, meaning that over 30% of inflation is a direct result of the carbon tax. Now, we had unable, we've been unable to validate this until you took the actions that you did, Premier Mo. And I'm wondering, have you seen an impact in a reduction in inflation by, uh, by Saskatchewan's actions with respect to the non-collection of the carbon tax on home heating? The, uh, the uh, Statistics Canada, in their first uh, report, it said, in, and I quote, in Saskatchewan, the collection of the carbon levy seized in January 2024, uh, contributing to the province's year-over-year -year price decline of natural gas. Uh, we're seeing it uh, in Manitoba as well, where uh, the province of Manitoba has foregone their um, their fuel tax uh, on uh, the, the fuel that, that they sell each and every day. Um, what you're seeing is the CPI is lowering in Manitoba as well. And so, I, you know, my question uh, to this committee would be, uh, if we were to lower, not increase, uh, but to lower or e eliminate uh, the what will be 17 cents uh, per litre of fuel uh, charged uh, to all Canadians coming this Monday when they fuel their vehicle up to take their children to uh, to soccer, or to hockey or to whatever uh, sport or school uh, that they might be going to. Um, what what do you think that would do to our consumer price index across the nation? We'd likely achieve our 2%. We're at 2.7% now. And I think that would be positive. And it would give the Bank of Canada the, the opportunity, hopefully, to start to lower the interest rate, start to uh, solidify that certainty for uh, investment, both foreign and domestic, uh, into Canadian communities and Canadian industries, which, again, I uh, would uh, allude to are, are the most sustainable in the world. The Saskatchewan story uh, around the, the most sustainable food and fuel and fertilizer that we produce and provide to the world is Ontario has a parallel story. Quebec has a parallel story. This is a story that we told when we went to COP28 in Dubai. And this is a story that we would encourage each of you as federal uh, federal members representing uh, Canadians, all of us collectively representing all Canadians to share at every opportunity. Um, we are not climate laggards in this nation. Uh, we most certainly are innovators and leaders when it comes to addressing the challenges that we might face uh, globally. Thank you, Premier Mo. So just uh, just to summarize, and I'll pass over to my colleague, uh, is that uh, in the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklin, the governor of the Bank of Canada, said that we would see a third a reduction in inflation. And we've actually seen that in the province of Saskatchewan as the rate nationally is 2.7, and the current rate in Saskatchewan is 1.7%. So we've had this validated, which, as you said, if the lower uh, in, inflation is, means the lower interest rates go, which means we have more investments, which can enhance our productivity, which can make all Canadians more prosperous. I am just shocked that, that Liberals want to keep Canadians poor. Thank you. The, op the opportunity we have is to remove uh, the consumer carbon tax on on all things for for everyone. Um, that would reduce our our inflationary uh, the inflationary effects that we're feeling when we fuel our vehicle up 17 cents a liter. There, um, that same 17 cents a liter is being paid for the truck that is bringing that vehicle to our grocery store, and so and and and, and the fellows that are producing it. And we see that uh, in Saskatchewan as well, not with their direct fuel, but with uh, uh, some of the other fuel sources that they are using uh, in transporting that food. So uh, it is a challenge. Um, and uh, and I think, you know, as you can tell, I, I feel there is a much better way for us uh, to work collaboratively, whether that be across party lines or across, um, you know, subnational jurisdictions in the nation, if that uh, may be, to uh, really uh, provide uh, the, the Canadian way on leading uh, the, the global conversation around climate change. Perfect. Thank you, Premier Mo. Uh, let me begin, begin with pointing out comments that came from a sitting cabinet member, cabinet minister. Minister of Rural Economic of Canada, Goldie Hutchings. She suggests that a discussion that we'll have down the road when we know that this one is working, but I can tell you Atlanta Caucus was vocal with what they've heard from their constituents and perhaps they need to elect more Liberals in the prairie so that we can have the conversation as well. She directly linked the prospect of carbon tax carve outs to voting Liberal. How, Premier Mo, has this changed your relationship with Ottawa and has it given you and your Prairie colleagues confidence that Ottawa is acting in good faith when it comes to the carbon tax? In about 10 seconds, Mr. Mo, or Premier Mo, sorry. 
Well, I, I don't think there are going to be very many more Liberals elected uh, in Saskatchewan anytime soon. The, uh, the fact of the matter is this is disappointing, um, but it does stack on a number of disappointing items. Uh, listen, our relationship with the federal government is uh, issues-based and policy-based. Uh, we don't agree with this policy, and we don't agree with those statements. Thank you, Premier Mo. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Cramp Newman. Uh, Mr. Duran, welcome back to OGO after a lengthy uh, absence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Premier Mo, as my father always taught me, when you point the finger, there's always three fingers pointing right back at you. And I know that you haven't reduced your provincial sales tax or removed the provincial sales tax on heating, uh, but I, I don't want to get into that, but I know for a fact that hasn't been done. I know that you haven't reduced income taxes. I've looked at year 2023 and year 2024. It's the same. And I know that it's important to talk affordability, but we have to, if you're going to point the finger at us, I think it's important to recognize that you also need to do something. Now, yesterday, the Prime Minister asked you to come up with a credible plan that will respect our Paris Accord. And you've said something today, um, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, to be, to be frank, um, you're against the clean fuel regulations. Do you have canola farmers in Saskatchewan? Yeah, certainly. We have, uh, we'd likely be uh, one of the largest canola producing jurisdictions in the world um, and are uh, advancing uh, that into uh, uh, ultimately uh, climbing that value chain with canola oil. Um, and significant investment, I would say, in canola oil manufacturing. The conversation around the carbon tax has been part of that uh, investment challenge, I would say, but we are finding our ways through that. Are you aware as to the why they've made those such investments into Saskatchewan? And do you know there why are, the clean the canola growth council, the Canola Council of Canada, canola growers of Canada were all supportive of the clean fuel standards? Do you understand that? Do you know why? There's potential. Because potentially they would use some of that oil uh, to reduce the emissions in the gasoline uh, that we are burning uh, or utilizing that families are burning across Canada. And there is some of that uh, conversation uh, that is happening. However, uh, I think there is a, a much more uh, collaborative path forward on what will actually be achievable in this space. Uh, this is going to cause the cost of, uh, of gasoline to go up uh, for families. Uh, we are in the process as well at looking at, um, you know, should we be a feedstock uh, of transitioning really a food product to a fuel product uh, for places that are um, already have the clean fuel standard in place, like California, for example. And so uh, that is an ongoing uh, conversation, not in all states uh, throughout the U.S., um, but an ongoing conversation in, in, but, uh, in Canada as well. But in order to develop the local market, that clean fuel standard is the regulation that allows canola farmers to sell more products for fuels. That's an important policy. That's why they've been so supportive of this particular policy. Now, I, I want to go on to, you You said you've participated to COP28. Uh, I, I'm assuming that you're in favor of international trade? Yeah, absolutely. We trade with over 150 countries each and every year, export uh, to them, uh, provide them with food security and fuel security. And I'm assuming that you're also aware that many countries uh, across the world, uh, whether it's Europe, the UK, hasn't made this recent announcement. You know what a carbon import tariff is? Uh, I am aware of what a carbon import tariff is. So do you know what the impact, if Canada does not have a price on pollution, how devastating that would be for our farmers in Canada and Saskatchewan? I know that there, we have a federal government that should be engaging uh, proudly on behalf of the industries that are employing uh, not only Saskatchewan residents, which I would remind everyone are Canadians as well, um, but all Canadians uh, with respect to uh, what we are doing uh, in our industries today. Uh, as I said, the, the Saskatchewan story is not uh, is not only in Saskatchewan. It, it, every province has a story uh, about what they are doing, how they are reducing their emissions in the industries that are employing people, creating wealth. And I would ask respectfully our federal government and all of those involved to take that story abroad. That's what we did at COP28, and that's what we continue to do through our uh, 10 uh, trade offices, provincial trade offices that we have that work alongside our high commission offices and our, our ambassador offices around the world including uh, one in London and one in the uh, in Germany representing the European Union. No, I, and I certainly support the work that uh, Saskatchewan farmers are doing. I've been to their farms. They are uh, innovators. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan is doing some great work in terms of being able to measure that particular output. Um, but I'm...
just I'm 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 afraid that if we don't put a price on pollution, then we are not going to be competitive uh, in our exports market because eventually what's going to happen is that jurisdictions that do not have a price on pollution will be slapped with an import tariff. I don't yeah. see how that could be advantageous to our Canadian farmers. Yeah, I, I, and I and I rival that concern uh, with uh, the, the the federal government making these policy decisions that are going to put our our national and I would say our continental food and fuel security at risk. Um, and that is exactly what we saw happen. And that's why I'm year, pleading yeah. with you to come up with a, a regional plan that makes sense for Saskatchewan. Absolutely. If you want to exempt farmers, we that's did. up to we you. Did. But a regional no, approach is much better than a federal approach. No. I'm just the, the prime did. minister asked you to come up with a plan. So yeah. I'm pleading with you, come up with a plan that makes sense for Saskatchewan farmers. Thank you. We did. We did. Thanks. That is just past our time. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, go ahead for two and a half minutes, please. Merci beaucoup, well, thank you very much again, Mr. Chairperson. Now, earlier you said, uh, earlier you said that the carbon exchange was perhaps not an effective uh, initiative for Saskatchewan. It's just been great for Quebec for the past 25, 30 years. I could uh, tell you about uh, childcare, the anti-scab uh, legislation and other uh, whole host of things. But uh, that said, do you feel that uh, Toronto's uh, trade uh, exchange is, is bad for Saskatchewan, the New York one, the Toronto one, and I'm trying to establish a link here with the carbon market. In a sense, it works in the same way, and it would make Saskatchewan bring in substantial amounts of money for both Saskatchewan and the federal government without hurting the rest of the economy, as uh, you alluded to in your opening remarks. Are you against stock exchanges? Because stock exchanges do apply to Saskatchewan. Is it only the carbon exchange that you have a problem with and not stock exchanges per se? Uh, no, and we have many uh, companies here that uh, not only, I would say, uh, trade and are traded on, uh, you know, Toronto Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange. We have commodities in Chicago, but also globally. Uh, many countries that are uh, investing in Saskatchewan are on global stock exchanges as well. And that is a, you know, a way for them to to access uh, capital. And, and and we all know precisely what, what stock exchanges uh, do. Um, when it comes to the uh, the, the heavy emitter uh, carbon space, uh, we, we have a provincial plan in place for that. In fact, uh, in many ways, worked with Alberta and led the nation alongside Alberta with the formation of a, of a technology fund uh, and working with our industries on what's achievable, when it's achievable, um, and uh, ensuring that they are making the, the adequate investments to achieve uh, lower emissions uh, over time, uh, ensuring that we are not putting forward unachievable Merci. targets. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. My, my final question. You don't want a carbon exchange. You don't want a carbon tax. You're making investments to improve uh, technology. But what solutions, we're trying to come up with solutions here. What solutions have you come up with that will enable Saskatchewan to reach its overall emissions targets when it comes to actually cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions? I apologize, we're, we're past our time, but if you're able to offer up a, a brief response. Significant solutions in the nuclear space when it comes to our electricity grid. Significant solutions in, in trading through commerce, uh, innovation in our ag industry, which I said is the most uh, sustainable in the world. Same goes for oil, same goes for potash. Um, and, and the opportunities through uh, internationally traded mitigation outcomes uh, to capitalize on trading carbon credits back and forth globally uh, through, through that system. And so we have the Provincial Tech Fund. We have uh, a fund set up that our industries can access uh, to re invest in reducing uh, uh, their carbon footprint, but I would say uh, that they are doing so anyways um, on their own, and uh, and we continue to uh, set targets with them through our heavy out our output based uh, emitter program provincially uh, put forward that we have here, and they're doing a, a very good job when we uh, compare them to their global competitors. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bullaris, please for two and a half minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Preston, Premier. 
you've used arguments that we've heard bandied around in, about in the past, that, that i.e. that uh, when we reduce pollution by unit of production, well, then we compare well with other countries such as Russia and Venezuela. But that's a red heading most of the time, because if we reduce pollution in that way by, say, 15 percent, and yet there's an increase of over 50 percent in overall pollution, well, the upshot of that is greenhouse gas emissions are up. And that is contributing to climate change, forest fires that are threatening your own communities. So reducing the dense, density of pollution by unit of uh, uh, of uh, pollution doesn't really mean that much. Now, you said that uh, the price on carbon is being borne by consumers and individuals, but what solution would you come up with when it comes to pricing carbon for companies and corporations? We have that solution in place uh, with our, our output-based uh, heavy emitter fund. Uh, they pay into it tech fund and they're able to access uh, those dollars for uh, investments in innovation. And like I said, they're going far above uh, accessing just that fund for investments in innovation. Uh, they're making their own. Um, I, I haven't put forward any arguments. I've put forward facts. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, buying something globally, you'll have a uh, an ingredients on the, uh, ingredients list on the side of your box and you'll have a price tag on it. I would say put a carbon content uh, uh, piece on that box as well. Uh, when you are purchasing oil that might be made in Saskatchewan and on your fuel pump, you shouldn't know that since 2015, we've reduced the emissions 65%. That's very real. If the rest of the world did that, global emissions down 25% overnight. If you're producing a, a, a granola bar or a wheat product or a canola oil product, 64% lower carbon uh, in a Saskatchewan based product, Saskatchewan produced product versus somewhere else in the world. By buying that product, you are making the environmentally, the sustainable decision of buying a lower carbon product. The same is true when you buy potash fertilizer made in Saskatchewan. Not only would I say that it is very arguably more ethical uh, than other places in the world, but it's had half the carbon content per ton. Uh, and you are doing right by uh, providing that fertilizer for your farmers. You're doing right because it's cost competitive. Uh, it's highly, highly, uh, it's, it's a high great quality, um, but it's the most sustainable product that you can buy in the world. And if you uh, truly do care about the environment, you should you should buy your products from Saskatchewan. And I would say equally, you should buy them from Canada as well, because we are doing the right thing, whether it be in industries, whether it be in families, whether it be in communities, uh, we are making every effort to reduce our, our footprints and we're doing it and can do it without uh, a federally imposed carbon tax, I would put forward. Thank you, Premier Mo. Mr. Barlow and then uh, Ms. Atwin to finish. Mr. Barlow. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Premier, for being here. Uh, first, I want to you know, say congratulations on the economic uh, output of your agriculture sector in Saskatchewan. I see it exceeded $2 billion in exports uh, again last year. Um, and I just want to put some, the, the numbers are quite staggering, as you talked about, in terms of the production from Saskatchewan uh, and the impact it has not only on Saskatchewan economy, but Canada. When Saskatchewan exported 91% of Canadians, uh, Canada's chickpeas, 88% lentils, 80% of Canada's, Canada's durum wheat, 67% of Canada's dry peas, and more than 50% of Canadian production of canola, barley, oats, and canola oil comes from Saskatchewan. When you see that kind of output, what impact does Saskatchewan's agriculture sector have not only on Saskatchewan's economy, but Canada's economy? Oh, I, I just say you said $2 billion in exports. It's $20 billion uh, in ag exports, $50 billion in total uh, exports from Saskatchewan. And to uh, uh, Mr. Bullerese's question earlier, um, that makes us the highest per capita exporter uh, in the nation. Uh, and we are exporting the most sustainable products that you can find on earth. And so the, the carbon tax uh, does have an impact on each of these industries, a, a very real impact. And I'd say an impact on uh, the, the families and people that work in these very industries as well as we've discussed over uh, the last the last period of time, but I would say that there's a a larger problem problem looming when it comes to the investment attraction. In order to for us and, and our goal is to continue to expand uh, these industries out to produce more of the sustainable goods that we produce for the, uh, make those available to the world. Uh, we need to attract investment uh, to do that. Um, when you look, uh, for example, at primary agriculture production. You listed what we produce there, and it's the spinal cord of the Saskatchewan economy. Every community in this province is dependent on it in some way, uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, when you look at the, the, the fertilizer uh, cap that was being bantered about a while ago, that would reduce uh, our production in this province by 20, 30, 20 to 30 percent. 
why would we reduce production um, when in a, in a world that needs food security and requires food security and is looking for food security, why would we reduce the production of the most sustainable food that you can find on earth and not look for ways to enhance that production and make it more available to Canadians, displacing some of the other food that's produced in other areas, or better yet, take some of the innovation that we have in Saskatchewan, sell it through commerce, uh, utilize our internationally trade mitigation outputs to capture those carbon credits back to Canada, Saskatchewan, and the ag industry so that they can reinvest uh, in even more innovative opportunities to make sure that not only are we doing better when it comes to uh, reducing our carbon footprint and food production, uh, but we're sharing that technology, we're sharing that innovation with the world. We're doing this in India right now. The second last time I was in India, and our exports to India are up in the last while. Uh, second last time in India, I stood on an air drill built in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in a, a farmer's field uh, just outside of Shandahar. They had sold a thousand of those air drills. Those, the latest technology in zero till air, air drill uh, technology that you can find on earth is now being transferred through commerce to India. That's a good thing for the environment and it's a good thing for the sustainability and food production in India. Thanks, Premier. And it's, I find this discussion we're having uh, quite uh, incredible when you talk about the environmental uh, sustainability and, and successes that Saskatchewan farmers have put on, and yet you continue to be punished with carbon taxes and, and higher carbon taxes rather than being applauded for some of the accomplishments in innovation and precision agriculture in Saskatchewan. We, we know the numbers. Saskatchewan farmers paid $12 million last year in direct carbon taxes alone. When that carbon tax was up 23% on Monday, they will, Saskatchewan farmers will be paying, paying $15 million in direct carbon taxes to heat and dry or heat and cool their barns, dry their grain. That doesn't include the carbon tax they'll be paying on transportation. Another $36 million just on the carbon tax from transporting commodities through rail. Premier, what is the economic impact on the sustainability of your farm families in Saskatchewan if they are continuing to absorb these higher uh, carbon taxes? Well, it will it will come home to roost in years where uh, margins are thin. Uh, and we had certain areas of the province, uh, as was noted earlier, that uh, did experience drought, not just this year, but last year. We had some areas of the province that had uh, record production. And so I, I would just say uh, the successes that we're having um, are, are, we feel somewhat unrecognized. And I would say the industry feels they're unrecognized. And and, and so we would ask all uh, federal MPs, our federal government uh, members on, on all sides to recognize what we're doing, not only in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan agriculture and Saskatchewan industries, but recognize what Canadians collaboratively are doing uh, in the various industries across. This cost is not helping. It isn't driving innovation. Uh, it most certainly isn't driving uh, the, the investment environment that we need to ultimately uh, drive that, that innovation that is going to make our industries uh, more, uh, more productive. In fact, the, the Bank of Canada uh, has said uh, just this past week that actually we have a productivity crisis. Um, and I would say that we need to have another look uh, a very high level look at how are we going to create that investment environment because with that investment comes innovation, with that innovation comes uh, industries with Canadians working in them all across this nation, whether it's manufacturing in Ontario or Quebec or, or natural resource production in, in the Prairie provinces um, and into uh, British Columbia as well, or, or all of the, the good things that happen in Atlantic Canada. We need to attract that investment, drive that innovation, and then look at how we can share that innovation with the world through commerce, yes, um, and that is ultimately the, the, the recipe for success for the manufacturing industry in Ontario and Quebec, is they are selling uh, their cars, vehicles, not only to Canadians, but to, to other people around the world, and there's some, there's some of the latest you, technology Premier Mo. available. Thanks, Premier Mo. Uh, we're now, uh, Ms. Houghton, please, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Premier Mo, for being with us today. I'm just going to begin uh, by quoting the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in their ruling around carbon pricing. Climate change is a threat of the highest order to the country, and indeed the world. The undisputed existence of a threat to the future of humanity cannot be ignored. A provincial failure to act directly threatens Canada as a whole. So, Premier Mo, you mentioned that you do believe we need to lower our carbon emissions. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And you took part in, in COP discussions. So do you support the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change? We supported the work uh, that was done um, with respect to tripling the nuclear uh, footprint, Canada signing on to that agreement. We think that will go a long ways in reducing uh, global uh, emissions. 
questions. We did not support the methane 75 announcement that came out at COP28 by our, our federal minister of environment. Um, and those are about the only two, um, the only two discussions that we had uh, alongside. Is that why you sent a delegation of, of 16 members? No, what we did was go to uh, unfortunately tell the story that uh, Canada didn't. Um, and that was uh, exactly what we're doing and how we're producing uh, the products in Saskatchewan. I, I mentioned potash. I mentioned okay, thank you. I'm just going to focus it back on, um, on Canada. But, Sorry but, to interrupt but, you, sir. Yeah, I'm looking nationally. This is why I went. This is why I went, is we went okay. to tell the Saskatchewan story. We have a, we have a, oh, sorry, sorry, yes, thank in the you. Emirates. Yeah. I, I need to, I need yeah, to. It's, it's a good it's story. A you and I'll sit down and I'll share it with you one day. Sure. Um, so do you support Canada's commitment to the Paris Agreement then? Certainly. In, in, in particular, Article 6, of which uh, we would like to see some activity in Article 6. And so, again, I'll, I'll point to a, a point that Ms. Vignola made that just this week, 100 economists signed off in a letter uh, in an attempt to dispel some of the main arguments of Mr. Polyev and other opponents, including yourself. These economists say that a carbon price is actually the least costly way to lower emissions. So if, if you agree we need to lower emissions, uh, and we're, we're looking at affordability challenges for, for Canadians across the country, mm -hmm. and this is the, the least costly way, uh, what would you say to that? It's not the least costly way in Saskatchewan. And I, a number of so you those disagree with these economists? A number, a number of those economists are the very same economists that were appointed uh, by your government to the Ecofiscal Commission back in 2016 uh, when uh, so you disagree there, with there the was economists? an attempt. Yes or no? A, the, the the last agreement that all Canadian sorry, sorry, all such a Canadian short period subnational of time. leaders agreed on was in 2016. It was a Vancouver Declaration. That's okay, the last. Okay, thank you. I have, I have to ask another question. Sure. So you've also mentioned that you you see that the carbon levy is showing no measurable impact. So we actually have statistics from the Canadian Climate Institute findings that the the carbon pricing system has actually helped lower emissions by about eight percent currently, and we're on track to meet our targets. Um, it accounts for about thirty percent of that emissions reductions plan. Um, and so, would you agree with our findings? I would agree we could go much further with some uh, collaboration around recognition of the investments in uh, in the industries from coast to coast to coast in Canada. I'm also going to focus on the rebate piece because, you know, constituents in my community are certainly con concerned about the environment, uh, but they're also, you know, faced with this affordability challenge. And so I'm going to look at some some of the folks from, from your part of the world here. Alan from Sask Saskatoon says the carbon rebate he gets four times a year from the federal government is crucial for his household budget. Without the funds, Alan, who is on disability assistance, says he'll have to scale back on spending for his everyday needs. Jermaine from Saskatoon says she relies on the carbon rebate for essentials, and while on disability assistance, the carbon rebate is a key part of her budget. Peter Gilmer, an advocate for the anti-poverty ministry in Regina, says those on low incomes rely on rebates to pay for essentials. Do you know how many people in Saskatchewan rely on these rebates to get by in the midst of an affordability crisis? In general, they get less back than they than they pay. Can you table some data to, to prove that for us, please? It's sir? in the parliamentary budget officer's uh, report. Uh, been quoted many times, and uh, I can send you that, yes. So do you, you don't know how many people in Saskatchewan may be worse off if you cancel the carbon rebate? Well, I talked I talk to Kevin a lot, and he's quite concerned about it because he lives about four hours from his major centre, a trip that he makes uh, every week or two weeks at the, at the least at the, mo at the least amount of time. Um, I talked to Jamie, uh, also up in Olalash, Buffalo Narrows Age area, who is uh, very much uh, was challenged with the electric heat uh, that he has in his home, um, of which the provincial government has made a move mirroring the federal government's decision on, but also living uh, three to four hours away from uh, from a major centre, a trip that he has to make uh, often, both on the business side as well as a personal side with his family and to get to work. And I'll just end on the, the clean fuel regulation. So here, here in my province, um, we actually had our premier uh, legislate an additional eight cents on top of uh, what, what New Brunswickers are paying at the pump with no just justification for it. So uh, would you plan to do a similar thing in, in Saskatchewan? I'm not aware of what uh, happened in that case in New Brunswick. Um, so I, I can't say whether we would do a similar thing, but our, our overarching goal is to keep taxes as low as possible, uh, in particular taxes that are that are ineffective, like the carbon tax. And sir, would you agree that uncertainty around the price on pollution isn't good for businesses? I would say that the price on pollution is creating uncertainty in the investment environment in Saskatchewan and Canada. You don't attribute any of the, the investments in our renewable energy sector or the new green economy to some of these policies from the federal government? Listen, the economy that we have in Canada is not new. Uh, it may morph and move over time, uh, but it's our Canadian economy. It's not a new economy, and we need to do everything we can to attract investment into it. Um, and the carbon tax policy that was promised to be a cap out at $50, now $170, and who knows where now, uh, combined with a number of other policies, are uh, creating uncertainty uh, for the investment environment. And I would say uncertainty that subnational leaders are trying to navigate through as best they can.
What kind of windfall would the oil and gas industry experience if the carbon levy was canceled? Yeah. Uh, there'd be no windfall. What you would see is a return to uh, a significant investment into some of the cleanest oil and gas that is produced on Earth. And I think that would be a good thing for the globe. That is our time. Actually, it's past our time. Thank you very much, uh, Premier Mo, for sticking around. Colleagues, we're going to suspend for a few moments as we change the table and bring in uh, Mr. Giroux and his team. We are suspended. Okay, so MP Mo, <clears throat> that was MP Mo. The Liberals uh, allowed it kicking and screaming. They got about, uh, well, they got about 30 minutes out of it, but the chair, uh, you know, conservative bent as he was, uh, basically extended it, and, and Mo, uh, of, of course, acquiesced to the request to stay longer. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, um, I don't know. I threw buffalo wings on the pole just because I wanted <laughs> buffalo wings. And it's kind of close if, uh, you know, if you go to a, a Buffalo um, Sabres game, there's more Canadians there than, so, you know, it's kind of a Canadian city uh, part of the time. So, um, the other committee is on lunch. Um, They'll be getting back when they get back. This committee is doing that. It was right on live too, so not much you can do. And uh, the chats are open. Yeah, Buffalo, the Sabers. It, it definitely has more Canadians in their stands. Uh, and uh, it, when Toronto plays. It's horrible for the uh, Sabres because <laughs> in Toronto, the Leafs play. Um, there's more Leafs fans at a home stadium, you know, in Buffalo than there are Sabres fans. But they got an NFL team, though. So. Okay, so what do we got here? Youth in carbon tax is ridiculous. It's coming up on Monday, so it's Monday, 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 carbon tax. This rain tax, I, I don't know about this. This is I keep hearing about this. Rain tax. That's got to be in April. For, oh, no. Oh, it's a stormwater fee. Okay, uh, in Toronto, and it pisses everyone off. Well, rainwater leaders are uh, are expensive, and basically, uh, when they talk about climate change, a lot of this is is there's a hundred year water cycle, and uh, the fifty year, seven year, and most of the time, uh, what we've been building on is like the seven or twenty or seventeen year. Whatever exactly, but it's around that about 15 years, we'll say about the 15 year cycle. But there's a longer cycle and there's bigger stuff that happens, and um, so those storms aren't accounted for. And um, <clears throat> we haven't been maintaining the it's the lead, the lead water system, it's the clean water, gray water, you know. And uh, that that's definitely what they'll say. Oh, climate change. Well, no. And then on top of it, where do you build first? We build the long waterways, which um, are floodplains predominantly. You know, you look at a river over time. It's a snake. Anyway, um, it's back. Thank the Lord I could stop talking. All right. Get excited. Get excited. Strip. Good morning or good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. The other committee is Thank in there. Oh, we got ye. to appear before you today. Ooh. We're pleased to be here to discuss our He's report pleased. on the government's He's expenditure pleasing. plan and main estimates for 2024-25, which was published on March 7, 2024. With me today, I have our lead analysts on the report, Jill Giswold and Caitlin Van Der Rees. The government's main estimates for 2024-25 outline $449.2 billion in budgetary spending authorities. 
requirements approval is required for $191.6 billion. Statutory authorities total $257.6 billion. Consistent with previous estimates, money transferred to other levels of government, individuals, and other organizations account for most of the planned spending, totaling $283 billion. Notable areas of planned spending in these main, main estimates include $81.1 billion for elderly benefits, $52.1 billion sorry, for the Canada Health Transfer, and $46.5 billion for interest payments on the public debt. We'll now continue en français. Le budget principal. The main estimates for 2024-2025 also represent reallocations of almost $2.3 billion dollars made as part of the Refocusing Government Spending Exercise. Further details on these reallocations can be found in the 2024-25 departmental plans that were tabled with the main estimates on the 29th of February 2024. As the 2024 budget has not yet been tabled, the 2024-25 main estimates do not obviously include the new budget measures. As a result, budget authorities for 2024-2025 will increase based on funding requests expected to be made in the supplementary estimates. Caitlin, Jill and I would be pleased and happy to answer your questions about our analysis of the main estimates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Giroux, and thank you, by the way, for uh, sticking around. We'll start with uh, Mr. Lawrence, please, for six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Giroux, and uh, um, you've been in the press almost as much as Ms. Taylor Swift, I think, in recent days. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with respect to your analysis of the, of the carbon tax. And so um, I, I do want to just have a discussion of this and so uh, we can get some clarity on, on your report uh, uh, because I think it's been as uh, misreported and demagogued as it has been reported. Um, so with, with respect to the, the financial impact, the total, which includes well, not only the fiscal but the economic tax and uh, carbon tax impact, um, for the average family where the backstop applies, uh, is there more money coming into Canadians' pockets or leaving their pockets? So there's two elements to that question. If one looks at the fiscal impact, that is the amount of the carbon tax paid directly, indirectly, and the GST that applies on these embedded direct carbon taxes paid, minus the carbon rebate, uh, most families are better off. We estimate around 80%. Uh, however, once we estimate also, we include the economic impacts of the introduction of a carbon tax, we find that these uh, economic impacts of introducing a carbon tax, they'll have impacts on some sector of the economy, the oil and gas sector, the transportation sector, for example. Um, and investment income that will be slightly lower, then we find that most Canadian families in provinces where the federal backstop regime is in place will see a small negative impact of the carbon tax. So it, uh, for, the, for the average Canadian family, especially if we move forward into 2030, as this government is, is intent on increasing the carbon tax, we're going to see, because Canadians can't just opt out of the economic uh, Im impact of the, so that like separating that, uh, I understand why for sort of understanding it purposes, but the reality is that Canadians, every Canadian is affected not only by the fiscal, but the economic. So the, the net in 2030, Canadians will have, uh, and now, will have more money going out of their genes than coming into their genes. Well, it's um, income growth that will be lower than it would otherwise have been. So that's what we refer to when we say a negative impact. It's not necessarily that their absolute level of income will go down, but the, the net impact is a reduction to a scenario where, compared to a scenario where there wouldn't be a carbon tax. So if the carbon tax was cancelled, uh, Canadians would be, and everything else holds equal, Canadians would be wealthier. Yes, they'd experience, on average, uh, income growth that would be slightly faster than what would, will happen 
with a carbon tax. Perfect. But that presumes that there's nothing that replaces our carbon tax. Perfect. And then I just want to move on to your, right, get into some of the specifics. So in, uh, in page three in your recent carbon tax, carbon tax report uh, in table two, um, you you have an average of uh, you have an average of the uh, fiscal impact. Uh, and, and then in, in Alberta, you say the net cost is two thousand seven hundred and seventy three dollars uh, in my province of Ontario. It's eighteen hundred and twenty. Um, so is that to say that the average uh, the average family um, in Alberta would be would lose two thousand seven hundred and seventy three dollars uh, and the Ontario family one thousand eight hundred and twenty dollars. That, that would be the cost of the carbon tax to their family uh, or the household, as you say. Is that is that an accurate understanding, Mr. Shrew? Well, that's uh, compared to a scenario where there wouldn't be a carbon tax. So it's not necessarily losing, but it's lower growth or income growth than would otherwise be the case. So in that sense, yes, you can characterize it as losing compared to a scenario where there is no carbon tax. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Giroux. Um, you, you've had uh, one of the one of the questions that has also been uh, been posed with respect to the uh, the fuel the fuel charge is does uh, is the um, is the cost the net fiscal and economic uh, cost greater uh, than the rebate um, keeping it with the fiscal and the economic is that greater than the rebate in all the provinces where the nonstop or not where the uh, carbon backstop applies my apologies nonstop car. <laughs> Um, that's that's the case for most uh, income quintiles, except for those at the very uh, in the bottom 20% of income quintiles. It varies by province, so uh, it depends on the specific economic fabric and income distribution and, and household composition. But generally speaking, uh, one one of the ways that uh, I've heard referred to as a carbon tax is that it, it is uh, it's, it's sand or uh, that is in the gears of the Canadian economy and it's slowing our productivity. We saw Tiff Macklin come before this committee and saying it's adding uh, a third of the of inflation and it's and Canada is facing as as the governor of Bank of Canada or deputy governor said said we are facing a productivity. Uh, do you believe, crisis I should say, do you believe that the reduction of the carbon tax would allow us to be more productive? Uh, I'm not certain about that because uh, reducing the carbon tax or eliminating it would certainly have economic impacts, but I, I'm not convinced that it would do anything with respect to productivity. So it's not something that we have looked at, like the productivity impact of a carbon tax or not. I think there are many factors that come into play when determining productivity and the productivity increases uh, or increases in productivity of specific sectors. So I wouldn't venture that far into the analysis. Thank you very much. You. Uh, Mr. Kuzmirchuk, please. Uh, thank you kindly, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you again, Mr. Giroux, for being here with us today. Always enjoy uh, your insights and uh, and enjoy uh, the uh, the knowledge that you share with us. Um, you've you've stated uh, when you've done your analysis on carbon pricing, you've you've uh, you said that we need to sort of look at uh, the broad picture, and uh, and to sort of continue on the theme of Saskatchewan here today. Last year, I uh, look at a report on the CBC. Um, Last year, in 2023, there were 494 fires that had burned about 1.9 million hectares. And uh, the uh, Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency, the vice president, Steve Roberts, said that in his, tw in his 25 years experience, he's never seen anything like it. And you look at, uh, in that same article, Colin LaRock, who's, the, uh, who's a professor at the Uni University of Saskatchewan, has, say, has, say, has said, and I quote, we had huge fires, astronomical numbers. And uh, on that note, the, um, the uh, Insurance Bureau of Canada stated that climate-related weather disasters cost insurers $3.1 billion in damage last year, $3.1 billion. Tell me, You've stated that your analysis doesn't consider the costs of climate change, the costs of doing nothing, which is what the conservative 
uh, members have put on the table nothing to address climate change. Explain to us why you didn't look at the cost of climate change, which to me boggles the mind that you wouldn't include the cost of climate change. That is so obvious to anyone that sees the fires burning. So that's a, an interesting question. Uh, in fact, I, I'm glad that you're asking me because it's a question that gets raised very often. Um, my mandate is to estimate the cost of government proposals. So the carbon tax is a government proposals. The cost of climate change is a relatively new area. And we have tried to estimate the cost of climate change under scenarios, two scenarios, where all the commitments are fully respected globally, as well as another scenario where only actions that have been implemented are, in fact, uh, implemented, nothing more. And we find that there is a cost. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but there will be costs to climate ch of climate change and over a long period of time. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that even like greenhouse gases, they've been emitted over decades, if not centuries, and it's a stock issue as much as it is a flow issue. So two issues to distinguish here. Even if the world was to stop emitting greenhouse gases today, there would still be global warming because the planet, according to climate scientists, have all, has already warmed up. So if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases, the forest fires that have presumably been attributed to climate change could continue. And it's not me saying that, it's uh, climate scientists. So there's that issue that one has to keep in mind, even though there have been climate elements and climate events, climate-related events, so it, that the climate policies will prevent things from getting worse. But the point at which we are today, that's where, where we are. It just, it just uh, with all due respect, and I really appreciate your analysis and the work that you and your team do. It's hard work, but it seems to me that you are only looking at one side of the ledger when it comes to this analysis. Uh, Mr. Sorry, is it fair to say you're really looking at Mr. one? Mr. Mirchuk, we lost you there for a bit. Do you mind starting just at the beginning and I'll oh. start your time? Shh. Sure. Just yes, that last you. statement. No, I, yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, it seems like you're only looking on one side of the ledger. You're not weighing uh, the costs of climate change here. Is it fair to say that your analysis is only looking at really uh, one side of the ledger? Analysis is typically a cost analysis, which is okay. what I've been mandated by, by Parliament to do. So estimating the costs of proposals, if there is there is a further analysis that is deemed feasible and required. I'm sure that there are lots of think tanks out there that are more than happy to do that analysis, looking at the cost benefit analysis. And the government, if the government itself has cost benefit analysis, I'm sure it would be more than, than happy to, to disclose that. To my knowledge, there hasn't been that much work undertaken on the cost benefit analysis because it's a complicated field that requires lots of data uh, spanning several years. So that's why even though it would be ideal to have the cost benefit analysis, the benefits are always not very tangible and not easily measurable. How much time, Chair? Got about a minute. Okay, uh, great. So if we're, because I take issue with your with your net analysis, I think it's incomplete, and I think it only looks at at at, at one one side of the ledger. Um, if we just look at the fuel charge impacts uh, directly, which you speak about as well too, and you talked about eight out of ten households being better off, uh, can you uh, can you speak to that a little bit when you're just looking at the impact of the of the uh, fuel charge and uh, as compared to the uh, Canada carbon rebate? You mentioned eight out of ten families are better off. Can you speak to that? Just on the fuel, fuel charge, not the net analysis. So when we look at um, the impact of the carbon, the fuel charge, um, the amount that households pay directly, so when they fill up the gas tank or when they heat their houses, um, and the embedded energy component of goods they buy or services they buy, 
Uh, we look at that and we compare that with the carbon rebate they get. We find that, roughly speaking, four out of five households are better off uh, with a carbon tax and the rebate than without. Thank you. That's very clear. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, please, for six. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Giroux, Ms. Vandalis, Ms. Giswell, thank you very much for being back with us here again. You know, I have a great deal of admiration for the analytical work that you do. It's very precise, it's invaluable, it's really in-depth, and uh, it's really hard work that you do. I really appreciate it greatly. Moreover, for the main estimates 2024-2025, the government didn't see fit to, to put its PDF document on its own website. So you'll forgive me for saying this, but we had to refer to a CSV format, which was completely illegible, or just look at it on the screen and take notes on a piece of paper. So congratulations to you for having been able to produce your report on time uh, given all of those uh, constraints and difficulties. Now, the Canada health transfer will increase by $2.7 billion, uh, apparently. This is a, a hypothesis, a supposition. The main estimates came out before the budget, which was announced, uh, slated for the 16th of April. So everything could change. Now, let's say that there really is an increase of $2.7 billion dollars and that the transfers will be for a total of over 50 billion dollars as you stated in your report. Now were the government uh, to uh, meet the demands of premiers across Canada, i.e. to transfer 35 per cent of their health care budget, well what would the total health care transfers be? Do you have a sense? Unfortunately, I don't have the figures uh, right here at my disposal, but uh, a couple of years back, we did a study to estimate the share of the provincial expenditures in health care that was covered or offset by the Canada Health Transfer. And one of our findings that I recall quite well, in fact, is that the definition of health care per se had evolved over time in order to cover more services. And that, of course, it changes the total amount with a view to achieving a particular target. But unfortunately, I don't have the figures here. The main estimates that were tabled in late February, early March contains... All right, so we're going to go to the committee. Foreign Interference Commission. Uh, the judge is up. They're back live. They're back from lunch. And they're going as we go. 752 victims. And Flight that's, PS752 that's that was shot have. down in the early morning of January 8th, 23 minutes after taking off from Tehran's Imam Khomeini International Airport by at least two missiles. The associate, pardon me, two missiles of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary what? Guard Corp. The Association of Families PS752 Victims seeks to unite grieving families, keep the memories of the passengers alive, and seek justice. Yuri Novodborsky is a longtime critic of the Russian regime and a director and founding member of the Russian Canadian Democratic Alliance. The Russian Canadian Democratic Alliance seeks to unite the Russian community in Canada and to advocate against the Russian regime. Jaskaran Sandhu is a lawyer and co-founder of Vaz News, which is a news outlet of record for Sikh and Punjabi diaspora communities. Mr. Sandhu has been actively involved in the Sikh community with a particular focus on advocacy for the last 15 years, including as a board member and executive director of the World Sikh Organization. Mehmet Todi is a Uyghur Canadian activist, the executive director of the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, and co-founder and former vice president of the World Uyghur Congress. 
Grace Dye Wallensack is the National Director of the Fallon Daffa Association of Canada. She is the co-author of a report released by the, Asso uh, the association uh, titled Foreign Interference and Repression of Falun Gong in Canada. This report details the instances of repression experienced by Falun Gong at the hands of foreign state actors of the People's Republic of China. She is also a member of the Canadian Coalition on Human Rights in China, an initiative led by Amnesty International. She's advocated for the human rights of Falun Gong practitioners since 1999 and acts as a government and media contact on behalf of the Falun Gong community in Canada. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Chuck Kwan is prevented from joining us today by unexpected circumstances. Fortunately for us, uh, we are instead joined by Ms. Winnie Ng, uh, who is a longtime advocate for the Chinese Canadian community and, among other things, serves as co-chair of the Toronto Association for Democracy in China. Those impressive introductions out of the way, we'll turn to our first panelist, Dr. Ismailian. Would you please describe uh, your community or communities? Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Association of the Families of Flight PS75 to Victims, I want to thank uh, the Madam Commissioner and her team for, for their efforts in this all important endeavor and giving me the opportunity to offer my testimony. Like many in the Chinese and Russian and Indian communities, several hundred thousand Iranians have made Canada our home. We are deeply concerned by the increasing threat posed to Canadian democracy, our civil society, and the communities who strive to participate in a cultural mosaic that makes this country so special. I would like to first start by emphasizing to this commission the urgent importance to officially include the Islamic Republic of Iran in the terms of reference in the mandate of this commission. By this inclusion, this commission will be able to garner the cooperation and input of other security, diplomatic, and intelligence organizations in order to reach a more accurate and comprehensive view of the extent of the threat that the Islamic regime poses to Canadian society and the Iranian-Canadian community. As we all know, Iran is fundamentally a diverse, multi-ethnic society with people of different faiths and ethnicities, making up the rich cultural tapestry of Iran's national identity. The first immigrants from Iran are reported to have arrived in Canada in 1901. By 1979, the Iranian community in Canada was no more than a few thousand scattered around the country. In the aftermath of the revolution and the Islamic takeover of the government, the Iranian community in Canada has grown exponentially. Current estimates indicate that there are over 400,000 Iranians residing in Canada with a high concentration of Iranian Canadians in Ontario. While initially most Iranians were refugees who have fled the brutal repression and persecution of the Islamic Republic regime over the past four decades, Iranian residents of Canada include students, academics, entrepreneurs, and skilled workers from all walks of life. The Islamic regime has not been oblivious to these facts, and since the 1980s, the Islamic regime has focused on Canada for various reasons, including, among others, Canada's vicinity to the United States and the opportunities they may seek in their political and clandestine agenda. In the aftermath of what became known as the Woman Life Freedom Uprising in September 2022 that was sparked by the brutal murder of Masa Jina Amini, Iranian Canadians made history by coming together in the largest gathering in a political rally organized by my association and other activists in Toronto. In Toronto. On October 1st, 2022, over 50,000 people came together in Richmond Hill to express their solidarity with the brave young men and women in Iran and their opposition to the brutal Islamic regime in Iran. While the majority of Iranians who have immigrated to Canada are secular, they have not demonstrated a clear tendency to organize around ideological or partisan institutions. Despite the growing number of immigrants from Iran, engagement in the Canadian democratic institutions has been sporadic at best with only a handful of Iranians finding their way into provincial or federal political positions. Ontario has had a few MPPs and provincial ministers from among Iranian Canadians, and so far only two MPs have reached the federal parliament. 
we are yet to have any ministers in the federal government from members of our community. Behind the political arena, Iranians have made remarkable progress in academia, business, arts and culture, medicine, and many other fields in Canada. This unfortunately has brought Canada and the Iranian community in this country squarely in the crosshairs of the Islamic regime and its nefarious plans to not only cause division and mayhem in the Iranian-Canadian community, but to also disrupt the Canadian political system in an effort to peddle influence in favor of its policies. I will talk about this in my next comments. Before I turn to our next question, I have been reminded that I need to slow down so that the translators who are assisting us uh, can follow us and translate along. Um, so I'm reminding myself, and I'll also take this moment to remind our panelists that uh, uh, if we could slow down, that would be very useful. Yeah. Uh, turning back to you, uh, would you please describe the forms of foreign interference that your community experiences? To pick up where I left uh, off in this first part of my comments, uh, I would like to bring into focus how the Islamic regime in Iran seeks to interfere in the political system of democratic countries along the activity, along its activities to disrupt and divide the Iranian communities around the world. As I noted earlier, the Islamic regime has demonstrated to have a special interest in Canada, and as such, it has made efforts on many levels to further its agenda using the leverage it can muster through the Iranian community in this country. We can consider these efforts in two main categories. First, to interfere in Canadian political affairs in service of the regime's interests. And second, to monitor and survey the Iranian community in Canada and identify political and civil rights activists who seek to promote democracy in their home country but also to use its operatives to intimidate, harass, sometimes even threaten community members with the intent of blocking any dissent or organized efforts to expose the corruption of the regime on the international arena. Furthermore, there are several reports that have become public exposing terrorist conspiracies through Canada aimed at the United States that have been planned, funded, and directed by the Islamic regime in Iran. As an example, two years ago, uh, there was reports about the assassination or kidnapping plot of a uh, well-known reporter in the United States, and there were reports that there were three Canadians on the list of the kidnappers, but we never heard any a report from our government or any report from intelligence services that who those people were and what was the plan. <clears throat> there is an existing indictment about that in the United States. Let me give you other examples for each of these main categories that merely represent the tip of a much larger and nefarious iceberg of interference by the Islamic regime in Canada. I, if I go to my personal experiences, uh, I've been targeted for um, uh, on social media, I've been targeted uh, in Canada. If I go to uh, some experiences, uh, verbal attacks, physical attacks, um, like 20th of May last year was one of the examples. I'm sure police has a report of that when we, have a, we had a gathering in Toronto. When uh, I was in Toronto on October, last October uh, in downtown Toronto, there was a person uh, approached me, he was on a motorcycle, and then he stopped, and he was searching his pockets for something, and then I had to leave the area, go back to the hotel, report to the police. Uh, and RCMP and police, I'm sure they have the reports. There were only a few examples. I'm going to go to some names of the uh, former officials of the Islamic Republic. I can say uh, that a former minister of the Islamic Republic, when he was here, he threatened me too. So I would get to that. But once when, when I went to a grocery store um, on uh, the spring of two years ago, when I went back, I had two flat tires on one side. I reported that to the police, and still I don't know what RCMP did or what the New York police did, and I didn't get any report back. So about what they do in Iran, my parents, they are banned to leave the country. My mother is 73 years old, my father is 74, and they, they plan to travel to Canada in November to participate in the fourth anniversary of the downing of Flight PS752. Their passport was confiscated, 
and now they know that uh, they can leave the country at least for six months. We don't know what happens after six months. And I can say about other family members of the victims in Iran, also they have been tortured, they have been imprisoned, and uh, we have several reports supporting that fact. A very small minority of Iranians in Canada are engaged directly or indirectly as either sympathizers or sometimes even overt operatives of the Islamic regime. This is a small minority has, however, leveraged its financial advantages that mostly originates, originate from inside Iran and political backing advantages that, mo that political backing from the Islamic regime to create institutions disguised as community advocacy groups, media, social media, or even research institutes that effectively seek to undermine the majority of the community that oppose the regime, as well as the, to meddle with the influence Canadian to be, with, with or influence Canadian government and non-government institutions in favor of the regime's agenda. The level of sophistication of these plans is highly disconcerting to our community. And many of us are making our best efforts to identify and expose these covert and overt activities that we find highly dangerous and disruptive. Hence the importance of including the Islamic regime in the terms of reference of this commission. This small minority has demonstrated the intent and capacity to cause division in the Iranian Canadian community while creating an atmosphere of fear and intimidation here in this country. Many Iranians who participate in public events, such as the massive October 1st rally, wore masks to avoid being identified by the regime operatives. A documentary that was made about Flight PS752 had to anonymize many crew members in the final credits of the film because they were in fear of persecution and threats by regime operatives. Another highly concerning example is a multitude of revelations of the increasing number of Islamic regime officials who have sought and been granted permanent residency in Canada or got visa to come to Canada. When I go to examples, we have uh, a person, Mahmoud Reza Khavari, he is a former banker and he was the head of National Bank. He immigrated to Canada in 2011 and he was involved in corruption and uh, I'm sure the Canadian government and the intelligence services, they have reports about him. <laughs> we have Murtaza Talai. He was the former chief of police of Tehran. He was seen in Richmond Hill two years ago working out in a gym. This is a person who was the chief of police of Tehran at the time of killing Zahra Kazemi. He was the chief of police who founded morality police in Iran the same organization who killed Mahsa Amini and other innocent girls in Iran. We have uh, Sayyid Hassan Ghazizadeh Hashemi, the former minister of the Islamic regime that was seen vacationing in Montreal, Canada last August. I go to that thread right now. When I raised the issue on Twitter and I wrote to the, uh, our government, this man had an interview with some uh, media outlets inside Iran, and he said, when I come back to Iran, the actions of Hamid Ismailion and the foreign media will be re retaliated. But he was free to walk in Montreal, go visit Casa Loma in Toronto a day after, and finally he went back without any consequences. Now I know that he can come back to Canada, but we are, we are, we are concerned that how a former minister of the Islamic regime can come to this country, threat uh, the, the activists here, and just freely go back. I go to another name, um, son of the current speaker of the Islamic parliament in Iran, Eshaq Alibaf. He even initiated a lawsuit in a, against Canadian government to obtain visa to come to this country. Hopefully, you know, uh, I'm happy that we heard his visa finally got rejected after the outcry of the community. Another person is uh, Iran's representative in IKO, International Civil Aviation Organization. He lives in Montreal, Farhad Parvarish. Not only because of denial and his role after the downing of flight PS752 in misinformation campaigns, 
but this person had connections with God's force. He's the person who was the head of Iran Air for years for smuggling weapons to Syria with commercial airplanes. But this person is in Montreal and he's representing the Islamic regime. These are merely the high profile names that have been exposed and unfortunately indicate the severity and the scale of this highly dangerous problem for Canada and the Iranian Canadian community. I would like to emphasize that these are not benign attempts by regime officials who seek a better life in Canada, but serious indicators of money laundering as best at best, but also efforts to increase the presence and influence of regime operatives in Canada. I share our community's concerns that there may, may be thousands of other lesser known regime of affiliates, affiliates, officials and operatives who have found their way to Canada and the threat their presence poses to our society and communities. Last but not least, our example of how regime operatives have breached the very depths of our democratic institutions in order to interfere and paddle influence. Just recently, a member of the Iranian community in Canada sought to run for as, for as a member of the federal parliament. The intensity of the smear campaign against him went far beyond the normal fervor of political competition in Canada. We believe that this is indicative of a much more sophisticated and multi-layered attempt by the regime and its operatives to hinder the participation of Iranians opposed to the regime in the Canadian democratic institutions. On the other hand, there are examples of organized support for those who are known to be aligned with the Islamic regime in Iran. There are many alarming reports of a of a certain member of the federal parliament to be supporting regime sympathizers and even meeting with regime officials and parliamentarians in Canada. Again, these are just the tip of the iceberg that is visible to us, and we fear that these examples are indicators of a much more serious and dangerous problem that must be investigated and dealt with. Let me end with another example. The Islamic regime has a stranglehold on every aspect of social, political, economy, cultural, and civil life in Iran. The sports is, of course, no exception. Every sport category is closely monitored and influenced by various security, intelligence, political, and even military arms of the regime. All international sporting events are carefully orchestrated by the intelligence, propaganda, and military establishment of the Islamic regime. Every sport team, most especially soccer teams, are accompanied by multitude of those operatives who not only seek to direct and monitor the athletes, but also disguise this, their covert operations under the guise of the sporting events. For example, the entourage of a given soccer team usually reaches over 50 individuals in number, with nearly one third of those individuals having no connections with the given sporting events. After, shortly after the downing of flight PS75 to by the IRGC, where 177 innocent civilian lives, including that of my wife and nine-year-old daughter, was taken, we heard rumors of a so-called friendly soccer match that was planned to take place between the Canadian and the Islamic Republic national soccer teams. It was planned to be held in BC uh, place in Vancouver. Against the backdrop of the tragic murder of so many Iranian Canadians, this was outrageous to us as families of the victims, but also to the community as a whole. Given the lack of diplomatic relations between Canada and the Islamic Republic regime, one wonders who was behind the planning and execution of such an event. Who were the liaisons on behalf of the Islamic regime here in Canada? Who supported or sponsored the event and why? We were asking how were the visas for the entourage being processed? Ultimately, we believe that this was an attempt to a sports wash, the criminality of the Islamic regime, and to bury the story of flight PS752. Fortunately, the community came together and posed not only serious questions surrounding this nefarious plan, but also helped to put an end and cancel the event. Again, this example demonstrates the level of sophistication and nefariousness of the Islamic regime's 
scheme to influence and meddle with community and political discourse in Canada. Thank you. The last question uh, for now is, would you please describe the impact that foreign interference has had on your community? Yeah, as I explained before, uh, I notice every time we go to rallies, several members of the community that wear masks, uh, sunglasses, hats, do not be identified. There are reports that uh, when they travel to Iran, their cell phones get confiscated, they get persecuted, interrogated. Their family members in Iran are under pressure. Even, even we have had members who met Canadian parliament members here and their family members in Iran have been pressured or have been interrogated. So uh, this is the least that I can say. But as I said before, this does, doesn't let the members of the community to get engaged in, in, especially in political levels. We have organizations here that they don't have any relations with the civic organizations in the community, with the cultural organizations in the community, like Tiragon, Civic Association, civic organization like us, or even political members of the community, like our parliament member, Mr. Ali Esasi, but they are everywhere. And they get funded by, by unfortunately, by our government. We have reports of some organizations that have been founded by the Department of National Defense or Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, these are the questions on the table, that who are these people and what are intelligence services organizations, they know about them because uh, the community is fearful to ask and to, to act because we know that they have endless financial resources and they can initiate lawsuits against everyone. Even now, when I'm testifying right now, I have to be very careful because uh, we are ordinary people, and uh, uh, it's not easy to fight with some organizations that uh, they have financial resources, and they know people, and they, they get the best support, not only from Iran, from other countries like Russia, China, the government of Russia, government of China. And um, uh, I hope that this commission will start to, to uh, add Iran to the, to the terms of our preferences. One of the other things that I have to say, when we go to uh, Department of Justice in the United States, you go to the website, there are several people that uh, you see that have been charged with foreign interference, but we don't see any Iranian name in Canada that have been pursued by Department of Justice. Recently, there was a person, Salman Samani. He was the Deputy Minister of Interior Affairs in Iran at the time of blood in November in 2019. 1,500 people got massacred in the streets of Iran. And this person came to Canada and got, obtained a visa, and he was here. On, like, fortunately, the Canadian government, they found him, but now they're deporting him instead of putting him on a trial for crimes against humanity. This is what the families of the victims have asked for several months, and our association is supporting, too. When they say there's no consequences, I mean, the community doesn't feel safe, and uh, they're worried, and uh, when this you know, these names that I mentioned, when these terrible people are here in this country, and when they see that some organizations are very active, that's why the community doesn't feel safe to participate in lots of activities. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Yuri Novodborsky. Um, Mr. Novodborsky, would you please describe your community or communities? Bonjour and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Yuri Novodvorsky, and I'm here to represent the RCDA, the Russian-Canadian Democratic Alliance. Uh, I was born in Russia, but for the past several decades have lived first in the U.S. and now as a permanent resident in Canada. I uh, have been uh, opposed to the Russian regime for many years, but only became involved in activism in 2022 following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
And in September 2022, we connected with other Russian activists across Canada and different cities to create the RCDA, uh, an organization based on the uh, values of democracy, human rights, anti-imperialism, and in particular, opposition to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'd like to thank the Commission for giving me an opportunity to appear here and allowing our organization to participate in this step of the inquiry. Uh, so to describe our community, it is uh, very multifaceted. Uh, people have come over from Russia to Canada at different stages of their life, some of them coming as economic migrants, some of them as refugees, uh, students, work visas, um, people who work in different professions, including information technology, entrepreneurs, medical professionals of uh, many different religions, and also many different uh, of many different geographic origins. People who, of course, come from the major cities of Moscow, Saint Petersburg, but also I have met people at events who are from Siberia, from the Far East who themselves are from or who have relatives from the ethnic republics that make up the Russian Federation. And uh, this expands into also people having very different opinions across the political spectrum. Uh, we have people, uh, members who have been opposed to the Russian regime for years or even decades. Uh, some people who only began to realize the extent of atrocities committed by the Russian government after they came to Canada and were exposed to uh, different sources of media. And unfortunately, of course, there are still some people who uh, support Putin and his regime. Uh, when we organize our events, we try to make them as uh, open as possible to reach as wide an audience of Russian Canadians as possible. We have letter writing events to political prisoners in Russia, events and fundraisers to support Ukraine, and many events that are focused on uh, supporting dissidents in Russia, the LGBTQ movements, and other politically repressed groups, as well as other cultural events that correspond to our values. One of the key points we'd like to emphasize is that in its propaganda, Putin's regime tries to emphasize that uh, Russian society is a monolith uh, supporting the politics of the Russian government, the atrocities it is committing. And uh, that is not true. I'm, with all the conversations we have, we see that uh, Russians have many different opinions. Uh, Russian Canadians especially, and they are not always able to voice these opinions because they fear retribution or because after decades of uh, being exposed to Russian media, they have retreated into a sort of political apathy or unwillingness to voice their opinions. And this is one of the obstacles that we seek to overcome. Um, even with people who uh, support Putin's politics. Very often, this is not active support. It could be the result of somebody uh, immigrating to Canada at a later stage in life, and uh, they remain surrounded by Russian news, and so they are not aware that any sort of alternative uh, organizations or alternative news exists that provides a different perspective from what uh, Russian propaganda is telling them. Uh, we try to make it our goal to connect with as many Russian Canadians as possible. Uh, and our goal is to show that there is an alternative Russian position, one that is against the politics of the Russian regime. Please describe the forms of foreign interference that your community experiences. Thank you. So in general, we see foreign interference happening in one of two forms. The first is disinformation and news manipulation. And the second is direct and indirect threats against members of the Russian Canadian community. Uh, disinformation and news manipulation, uh, partly true news stories or completely false news stories, they are generally spread over social media or Russian news platforms or alternative news media sites. But it takes different forms depending on who the target audience is, whether it's uh, the Russian diaspora in Canada or the wider non-Russian Canadian audience. Just, so, just a question I have to your, uh, the best of your knowledge, is there uh, any specific social media that are used for that, or, or there's many of them that are used? So I would say that the methods of the Russian government uh, 
involved spreading the message across as wide an array of communications channels as possible, meaning you can find their messaging on all uh, social media platforms. But there are definitely some social media platforms that are uh, targeted more, that have more channels, uh, more fake accounts, uh, things like that. So for the Russian diaspora, the main focus, uh, especially for the younger population, uh, they get a lot of their news from Telegram news channels, um, also YouTube channels and uh, Russian TV over internet, uh, especially for some of the people who are older. And for the um, for the non-Russian audience, I would say Telegram is probably less a factor. More people there uh, would get their news from YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and now TikTok especially. <laughs> so uh, when targeting the Russian diaspora, the focus of the news manipulation is uh, pushes either pro-Russian news stories, stories that paint the regime in a positive light, and also blame the West for any problems that exist in the world. Uh, and also there's a focus on conspiracy theories, uh, basically promoting uh, false science. The purpose of these stories is to have people trust government less and put uh, less faith into actual journalism, doctors, scientists, basically anybody who actually has area expertise uh, with the goal of making them more susceptible to Russian propaganda. When targeting the wider Canadian non-Russian audience, um, as I mentioned, the social media, um, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok now, uh, the focus is on uh, less on pushing pro-Russian news up front. And instead, first, it's to prepare people and put them in a position when they are more susceptible to pro-Russian positions. Uh, the focus is generally on divisive issues, divisive Canadian issues, uh, to undermine faith in democracy and increase political polarization. Uh, what happens then is when somebody is exposed to news sources like this, and especially coming from many different channels, it creates an atmosphere of believability where they feel that this is a common sense position, uh, that it's coming from many different angles, uh, because it does seem to be coming from many different accounts. But the source for all these is usually the same. It's either directly controlled by the Russian government, or it might be some marginal source that has been promoted by the Russian government. And uh, what this does is it increases social division and dysfunction. Until recently, there have also been two Russian TV channels that essentially were, uh, there was Russia, Russia Today, RT, which presented itself as partly independent from the government, and Sputnik TV, which I don't think even tried to present themselves as independent. But in both cases, they were essentially mouthpieces of the Russian regime. Uh, they were both sanctioned or banned following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but I believe they might still be available uh, over the internet. And the purpose of uh, the purpose of this misinformation that uh, is targeting non-Russian Canadian audience, the focus on divisive issues, the reason why the Russian government is trying to increase social division and dysfunction is uh, because it uh, makes the entire society and government more dysfunctional and less able to react in terms of crisis. Um, we saw this with uh, some other governments uh, when the pandemic was occurring uh, with COVID and now with uh, when it comes to Ukraine support, where instead of it being a medical issue in some governments, it became a uh, political issue due to increased polarization and the federal government was not able to achieve a, an effective response to the crisis. With aid to Ukraine, we see some governments where the majority of the population supports sending aid to Ukraine, the majority of, uh, of politicians support sending aid to Ukraine. However, the government is not able to actually reach any sort of uh, decision or action because of the increased dysfunction in the system. And this is partially a result of Russian propaganda efforts. Uh, Another reason why Russia focuses its uh, manipulation efforts to create social dysfunction is that 
uh, democracy, democratic states present an attractive alternative to the state, the regime that Putin has implemented, a uh, criminal and corrupt regime. And when democratic states become more dysfunctional, it allows Putin and his regime to point to them and, and show that, well, make the case that things are not any better there, and that at least in Russia you have some semblance of uh, stability. Finally, the other reason is that compared to authoritarian systems, democratic states are in, some, in many ways more resilient to corruption, which means that they are more difficult for Putin's regime to control. And um, by increasing polarization, increasing social divisions, it leads society in a direction where corruption becomes more possible. Um, moving to the other major form of foreign interference I mentioned, direct and indirect threats against members of the Russian community. Um, some of this is similar to what uh, Dr. Hamed Esmayon mentioned with the Iranian diaspora. Uh, some of it might work a little different, but uh, there is a focus on harassment of relatives in Russia. Uh, many Russians who come here, they come with families, but many of them still have parents or relatives who still live in the Russian Federation. And we've had cases where uh, Russian activists have been identified here in Canada, and then police uh, initiate some sort of harassment actions against their family back home. If you've ever walked by any Russian consulate in Canada, you'll see that it's surrounded by cameras. And through identification uh, via recorded video or through following on social media, but they are able to identify people here who engage in any sort of protest action, and they are uh, they are willing to put pressure on completely unrelated, uh, well, uh, relatives in Russia who are completely unrelated to any sort of protest activity. Another form we have seen of pressure is the refusal of consular services. Uh, there was a case documented in the media uh, here in Ottawa where a protester, somebody who was engaged in activism against the Russian government, uh, they were refused access to the consulate, which means they could not uh, renew their documents, could not provide any forms they need from Canada. And this is a major concern to people uh, in the Russian-Canadian community because not everybody is yet a Canadian citizen. If you are here on a work visa, student visa, uh, even if you have PR, at some point, Canada will likely ask you for some documents from Russia, whether it's um, just an extension of your passport or something else. And refusal of consular services essentially puts people under the threat of potential deportation. And especially when you've been engaged in uh, political activism, that becomes very dangerous. Another form of uh, threat against members of the Russian-Canadian community is the uh, employment of criminal charges in Russia, which is essentially a uh, greater degree of threat from the previous two situations I mentioned. But uh, a, the laws passed in Russia allow a criminal prosecution to be opened against you if you engage in any sort of political activism abroad, uh, but even for something as innocuous as having social media posts. And we've had cases where people who have PR in Canada are applying for citizenship, nonetheless, because they posted something on social media or engaged in some sort of activism against the Russian government, they have criminal charges laid against them. And then this becomes an additional obstacle when they attempt to gain citizenship. So it is a major threat. Um, and an extension of this is that it makes it more dangerous to travel outside of the country. Many countries still practice extradition to Russia. Uh, for example, uh, Turkey, which is a major transportation hub, uh, extradites people to the Russian government, uh, as does Thailand and some other popular tourist destinations. So that all is a, an additional danger if you have criminal charges against you. Uh, finally, there's always the risk of hacking and electronic surveillance. Um, it's well documented that the Russian government invests considerable resources into uh, hackers and uh, ways of accessing electronic devices. And when you engage in political activism, this becomes an active threat. Uh, but not only members of the Russian community, uh, this is also a potential threat for the Canadian government and for Canadian government entities. Um, as was documented in the 
uh, in other countries uh, in their investigations of Russian interference. There were cases where uh, Russian hackers got access to political parties, which led to po potentially compromising situations. Please describe the impact that foreign interference has had on your community. So the overall effect on the community that we see is that although many Russians are critical of Putin's regimes, uh, there are, they see that there are many risks to them speaking out in public uh, about their views. And what this does, it, it helps Putin to maintain an image of a uh, united and monolithic community that supports the politics of his regime when the reality is actually quite different. Um, we've heard uh, often, why don't more Russians uh, speak out against the war or participate in uh, anti-Russian activity if, uh, if they're opposed? And, and this is one of those reasons, because there is a realistic fear of retribution. Um, I've spoken to many concerned people at many of our events, and uh, some people are uh, very in support. Some people are softly in support, but for many of them, they're, they are aware that these threats are real. And so they always have to make that calculation of how far they are willing to go because they're essentially putting themselves and their families at risk. Um, many other people retreat away from politics entirely and hide behind apathy. Uh, some people are, some people are truly trying to like segregate themselves from politics completely. But in many other cases, uh, what we see is that uh, years of Russian propaganda has created this uh, feeling for many people where any sort of resistance is pointless. Uh, they feel alone. They feel like they're the only ones who have these opinions against a united uh, Russian state. And uh, this is the goal of many repressive governments' propaganda, to make the individual feel powerless and unable to, to accomplish anything of value, um, which is something we try to work against. Uh, but uh, it, is a, it is a difficult process to break through that propaganda. Um, one of the focus of our activities is to connect with such people and show them that uh, alternative organizations such as ours uh, that value human-centered values do exist. Uh, one other question that came up uh, as we were preparing for this public inquiry is, uh, why don't more Russian Canadians uh, participate uh, in government inquiries or turn to the government uh, with any uh, information regarding foreign interference? And it's more or less the same answer, that they see that there are substantial and clear risks to doing so, whereas there's not a clear safeguard uh, that the Canadian government provides for those who put themselves in risk or risk losing their legal status or have some threats against their family. Uh, I and other members of the RCDA and members of our community are very grateful for the opportunity to live in Canada as part of a democratic society that emphasizes human and civil rights. One thing I'd like to bring up is that uh, we definitely want to see uh, a efforts to limit interference by any foreign actor that can compromise the integrity of the Canadian democratic process. Uh, but what we would like ideally is a targeted and sufficient response. Because in our experience from the foreign interference that we have seen, the actors are often based on foreign soil or with ties to the consulates and the embassies, not necessarily uh, members of the general Russian Canadian community. And uh, the concern is that if the commission recommends a sweeping response that adversely affects the entire Russian Canadian community, it may be limiting its own effectiveness and in an effect counterproductive. A heavy handed response could impact the civil rights of all members of our community, the vast majority of whom are law abiding Canadian residents and citizens. So we urge the commission to recommend targeted measures that focus on the specific sources of foreign interference. Thank you. Can you just tell me maybe you said that uh, what is the size of the Russian community in Canada? So uh, I'm not an expert on the statistics, but from my understanding, just, just the bulk one. There's about half a million people in Canada who have uh, uh, ties or origins 
uh, with Russia, but this is over many decades, specifically immigrants from the Russian Federation. I believe it is around 80,000 as of the last census. However, I do believe that uh, that number has increased at a faster pace over the last few years, as a lot more people have tried to find ways of leaving the Russian Federation and, uh, and moving to Canada. Uh, some of these people would probably not show up on censuses as they may be here on work on student visas or PR, but uh, th those are the numbers I have. Thank you. We'll turn now to our third panelist, uh, Mr. Mehmet Todi. Uh, would you please describe your community or communities? Thank you. Should I open this or? I, I, I think the mic is. You have to bring it down. Is that you have to? Okay. okay. Just. But, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation and. Uh, no, I, I think one moment, sorry. I, I think, yeah, you have to turn it on. It was or? already on, I think. Just, Just try it. How about now? It is on actually. Hello. I I it's it's sounding a little quiet to me. I wonder if uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can switch. Switch. Okay. Okay. How about now? It's much fantastic. better. Okay. Thank you. And I believe uh, the success of this uh, uh, public inquiry on foreign interference is crucial for the, uh, the future of our nation. And uh, unless we study it and uh, figure out the loopholes and close it down, the, the stake of inaction will be very high for our future generation. And for that reason, uh, uh, I really want this commission to be successful and uh, serve the best interest of our nation. Uh, for our community, the Uyghur Canadians are from coast to coast to coast, approximately 2,500. And the latest, uh, latest uh, sensor from uh, Census Canada is about 1,700 people, Uyghur Canadians. At least 1,700 people identified themselves as Uyghur Canadians in 2017. As of uh, February 2017, Chinese government confiscated all the passports from Uyghurs as part of this genocide campaign. And so we haven't seen anyone skipping from the country. And uh, there is some... Uh, uh, international uh, migration from uh, some countries just like Turkey or some Central Asian countries to uh, the Canada, maybe approximately a couple of hundred maximum. But the newbornness and that 2,500 is probably the maximum. It translates as three to 400 families. Please describe the forms of foreign interference your community experiences. Uh, just uh, just let, uh, let me give a little profile for the Uyghur Canadians as well. Yes, please. And we are a small uh, community, but uh, we have 13 members in Canadian Armed Forces and the seven members in the police and RCMP others, and the 23 nurses, seven family doctors, and the 28 PhDs. 13 professors in Canadian universities and a 76 master. So despite we are small, we are very vibrant and we are active communities and we are the first generation of uh, Uyghur Canadians and we're trying to integrate the society at the same time, contribute to society. And in terms of interference, yeah, that is, um, uh, that is the advocacy point of Uyghur organizations since maybe 20, 25 years. Personally, my first uh, interaction uh, with Canadian government started in 1998, as soon as I landed in Canada. Since then, I have had more than 100 meetings and parliamentary briefings about the interference of Chinese government to our family members and the harassment and the direct phone call from Chinese state police. And uh, I remember my <clears throat> first media report about this one is published in 2007. 
Legion is always watching. It was published. It was published on McLean magazine in 2007 on May 14th, and uh, this article <laughs> featured uh, two incidents. One in 2004, seven Uyghur acrobats uh, brought by Chinese government for uh, a show in Canada to celebrate Chinese New Year. They defected in Canada, and so they asked help from our organization, from me. Uh, I came from all the way uh, from Mississauga to Ottawa, just picked them up, and then immediately there was an attack by, uh, from the Chinese embassy and the consulate, and uh, somehow accused our organization, me, just uh, uh, hijacking them. And so at the end, they went to press and they uh, declared that they uh, applied for asylum. Uh, with their own will, and so that story is uh, 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 closed, but the attack never. And uh, since then, uh, the Chinese government uh, constantly attacked. And then, to th uh, April 2004, uh, I was uh, uh, heading to Munich, Germany, for the establishment of World Agro Congress. And at the just before uh, the one day prior of my departure, I was called by Chinese police from Kashgar to my hometown. And they brought my mother and one of my brother and I put on the side, just forcing me not to go to Germany and not to participate in the foundation of World Legal Congress. And so this article is talking about that. And uh, another main, uh, the background of this article is 2006, approximately this time. The Chinese, uh, the Uzbekistani government abducted Hussein Jalil, Canadian citizen of Uyghur origin, when he visited his mother in law in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And uh, uh, within a couple of months, that gentleman was smuggled to China by Chinese government. And uh, he eventually uh, sentenced for life. And still, we don't know he's alive or dead, but his uh, four children and uh, the wife still living in uh, Burlington, Ontario. And I was campaigning for the release of his angel. And uh, this article was published uh, within that context. At that time, Chinese agents were very active and they're just following me through uh, various uh, cars and uh, they visiting my home and knocking doors and uh, with the, uh, the Chinese language newspapers and the st numerous statements from the consulate of officials, even threats. So this was the first report about the Chinese interference or intimidation. It was 17 years ago. 17 years ago, I'm talking about 2007. And since then, just another thing, probably it highlights uh, the, the, the interference of the Chinese government. I left my hometown in 1991. Since then, Chinese government did not allow any of my family members, including my mother, siblings, or far close relatives, did not allow any of them to apply passport just to visit me. I cannot go back. So it is also total isolation. Just for what? Just to speaking up uh, about... Uh, the rights of Uyghur people and the Chinese human rights abuses, just very simple exercise of our basic freedom in Canada. And for that reason, when we say interference, and uh, maybe uh, many people uh, may think that uh, that is not the proper word, or at least it is a proper between state to state relationship, for example, the interference of hostile uh, government, for example, in Canada through misinformation, disinformation campaign or a deception or stealing uh, uh, property, uh, intellectual property and others. But when it comes to individual level, it is about threat. It is about hijacking of your family members to force you or compel you to live within the rule of hostile regime in democratic country like in Canada, and uh, force you to be informant, and use all of the state powers, just like proxies and institutions or covert uh, agents on the ground, just like uh, police stations, just to chase you and put pressure on you to stop 
of what you are doing. And so uh, for individual level, uh, the foreign interference is totally different. And for that reason, just uh, uh, I would like to highlight that one. And when we say the individual level, it is about travel ban. For example, I cannot travel to Turkey because of Chinese pressure. The Turkish government put a travel ban on me. Otherwise, I don't have any criminal record anything in Turkey. I cannot go to Central Asia because of the, the Chinese government's pressure. And some uh, the Middle Eastern countries where uh, the China has developed very strong relationship. And uh, it is... Uh, it is smuggling of people, and it is rendition, it is repatriation when we say a foreign inter interference in individual level. And it is the misuse of Interpol system. Put a red note on your name, and so you are any, at any time you can be arrested. It happened in our communities many, many times. And uh, misuse of UN system and push the UN uh, uh, organized institutions to provide, for example, if I go to Geneva, testify, or uh, just to campaign work to talk about the Uyghur's issue, and the Chinese government just fi finds a way to get the, my personal information beforehand. And it happened, many UN staff also uh, testified uh, about that, and for that reason, the Uyghur situation is quite unique, not only in China, at the same time in Canada as well. For example, everyone is Canadian citizen, I believe, in this room, and if you apply for Chinese uh, visa, you will be subject to different rules, different application form. And if, as a Uyghur Canadian, if I apply to visa to the Chinese embassy or consulate, I will be subjected to different formalities. And for that reason, our communities they don't go to Chinese embassy, they don't go to Chinese consulate, because there are some troubling uh, component of the application. And for that reason, uh, just uh, the foreign interference could be a broader language, but if you break it down, there are a lot of uh, components in it, just I would like to highlight. And uh, another form of uh, foreign interference, uh, which is unique for Uyghurs, it is transnational repression. Transnational repression means, uh, I uh, touched a little bit, including the, the travel ban. But, uh, the many Uyghur, Uyghurs, uh, the member of exiled Uyghur communities in jails in many parts of the world, including Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. They don't have any criminal record just because Chinese government wanted them uh, repatriated back to China. And uh, so uh, the, those, uh, the host countries arrested them. And after the interrogation, they couldn't find anything. And so we have to use the UN system, Committee Against Torture, put pressure on those countries to stop the extradition. And so transnational oppression is a very important part of the foreign interference for the Uyghur communities, and many Uyghurs cannot travel. Even with the Canadian passport, we're free to travel in some countries. And that is where, uh, uh, for example, uh, the people are calling me from uh, somewhere in Africa, Egypt. Egyptian government deported more than 37 Uyghurs just upon the Chinese request. And at Thailand, it happened uh, for Thailand, Kazakhstan, and uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and uh, those countries, even Turkey, and uh, Tajikistan. And uh, for that reason, transnational repression is a very big part of uh, foreign interference when it comes to Uyghurs. Um, I would like to... Uh, I would like to highlight uh, a couple individual uh, stories. There's one, uh, the lady in Vancouver, uh, Tornasa. She's, uh, she's a nurse, and she was protesting in front of the Chinese uh, consulate in Vancouver on a weekly basis, and she harassed by the Chinese uh, the consulate officials or any other because she couldn't identify. The three or four times, even physically attacked in Canada. She's a Canadian citizen. And uh, there are another gentleman and, uh, in Edmonton that has uh, 
physician wrote a letter to the Minister of Immigration and Public Safety a year ago. And he was about to die. And the Chinese government isolated his own daughter for 20 years without giving or a passport or without uh, responding to the, uh, the correspondence from Canadian immigration. And at the end, that physician wrote to both the Minister of Immigration and the Minister of Public Safety at, at the same time, forward that letter to the Chinese embassy as well, just asking them in humanitarian basis, just allow his daughter that's just to travel to Canada to say goodbye before uh, his final minutes. And the Chinese government did not respond, and the dead father, without seeing his daughter, just died a couple of months ago in Edmonton. And so uh, it is, there are a lot of personal tragic stories like this. And so uh, this uh, the situation of Uyghurs, and some of them already highlighted in our report, uh, intended on ending. It should be attached to the, uh, the paper submitted to the uh, commission. And uh, there are individual testimonies, and uh, most of them, the Uyghur Canadians, and uh, the story of harassment, intimidation, and the threat. And not only, uh, it is not only for my personal experience, many Uyghur Canadians are experiencing the same thing. Just uh, before any major campaign uh, the items we launch, or before finalizing uh, finalize any campaign items, for example, uh, just before uh, the parliamentary hearing, just some disturbing messages all the time I receive, somewhere from uh, the cities in China, that I uh, very ugly content. And uh, I think it is also in the report. The last year, uh, the January 16th, the early in the morning, just as soon as I got my office in Ottawa, and uh, I received a phone call. Uh, the, the phone number was looked like uh, it, it looks like the Hong Kong number, not uh, the Chinese mainland Chinese number. So I picked up the number, uh, the phone, and it was Chinese state police. And they put my mother's brother or my cousin on the side of the phone. Just it was just week away for the parliamentary vote on the, the M62 motion for the resettlement of 10,000 Uyghur refugees. And uh, just openly uh, saying that my mother was dead and the two sisters were, were dead. And I asked, how about my brothers and their spouses and the children that we don't know, that sending me a message. And uh, later on, I confirmed it uh, 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 through a, a third party that uh, my mother was uh, dead in a concentration camp at the age of 76. But still, I don't know when, even she has any grave, uh, which date, what time, which year even, I don't know. And how about my two sisters, I don't know the when, exactly which date they were killed. And so basically, uh, uh, sending that kind of uh, message and implying me that this is the cost you have to pay, uh, pay if you continue to advocate. And so uh, yeah, the cost for the, uh, the advocacy here in Canada, it is really high for some communities. It is unfortunate. And also there is a lack of protection in Canada as well. And uh, just the most disturbing thing is uh, that we, uh, we wanted to have a legal summit in last year from July 3rd to July 6th in Alma, Quebec, at a small town, lovely town, with legal professionals. And in July 2nd in the evening in Montreal, we uh, we dined in, at one Uyghur restaurant. And after we finished, we were heading to hotel. And I invited one official from Global Affairs to the dinner, and he was there. As soon as I left, uh, within two, three minutes, I received a call. And he, uh, that official from Global Affairs told me that, Mehmet, your uh, two cars are following you. Be careful. And so I made some sharp turns and I got my hotel and I immediately called back. And he said that he tried to uh, intervene. And those two cars, uh, the license plate 
the plates are covered, and so just one person could not uh, catch up to, and uh, basically it escaped. It is happening here in Canada, in Montreal, not in somewhere else. The people are watching you, following you. It happened in 2006 when I campaigned for the release of Los Angeles three SUVs just to, I didn't know, and my neighbors reminded me, do you know those cars? Whenever you come, they will come. Whenever you leave, they are leaving, just behind you. And then I called uh, some uh, security department, just asked help. I just, I don't know who they are, but uh, just, I really do afraid about my safety. And a couple of days uh, disappeared. And so now more than ever, and we are seeing reports that the Chinese military members with fake ID just coming to Canada and living with us and uh, police stations. We identified, actually, uh, the one human rights organization in Spain identified number, number, num number of them in Montreal and in Toronto and others. We don't know how many. We don't know how many are walking on the street right now with us together. And so this is real danger. And in 2018, when I visited Italy in Rome, I saw the, the Chinese police with the uniform. I scared. And now we are reading the news that there are a number of police stations in Canada. And so uh, the function of those police stations is not here just to go to party. And they collect information, they monitor your schedule, and they send that information to the public safety in China, and they coordinate together. And uh, them in China reach out to your families, family members, and uh, take hostage of your family members and force you to do something against your will here in Canada. And uh, they work in coordination, and they are uh, a piece of uh, the whole integral part of the government body. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a number of names they are being called, uh, United Front and uh, community organizations or uh, the provincial uh, organizations. But if you dig deep uh, their function, basically on the name of providing service for the Chinese communities, just getting some uh, information, extracting information, spying, a collection of intelligence, so uh, it is really uh, the important issue that has not been touched in Canada since long, since 2000. And for that reason, it is really important for this commission just dig deep, uh, just to find out the loopholes in the system, if, if you have any uh, faulty line in our system just uh, to close it down for the safety and the security of uh, the Canadians in the future. You touched on uh, this topic in, in your previous answer, but uh, would you please describe the impact that foreign interference has had uh, on your community here in Canada? Uh, okay, it is really tough. And last summer, I traveled uh, some uh, provinces and the cities and I visited our community members and because I have been uh, going through the same uh, tough situation. I just imagine uh, you have some uh, uh, joyful event in your family. You cannot share that event with your family members back home. You cannot send texts to them. You cannot call them. And you cannot share photos, and all communications are uh, cut off. And it is the same situation for all Uyghur Canadians all across the country. They don't know even their family members alive or dead because Chinese government just blocked the whole communication. And uh, using their own, uh, uh, what is called in China, uh, the 50 cent party or special uh, trained propagandist just to send the propaganda about how Uyghurs are happy, this and that, 
but in reality, uh, then none of them uh, can freely communicate with their family members because since 2017, Chinese government arrested. If anyone back home has any history of communicating with people abroad or visiting certain countries, just that became the reason for detention and uh, for internment in concentration camps. And so many people disconnected from their loved ones here and abroad or Canada. And uh, many Uyghur Canadians afraid to call them, just uh, in fear that they may give them a trouble. And so basically, uh, the Uyghur Canadians live in total darkness without getting any information about their family members, whether they're alive, and also family unification. And some of them uh, sponsor their family members to come to Canada. And the Chinese government refused to issue a passport, or sometimes if they, when they receive uh, any correspondence from our embassy in Beijing, they cannot go to Beijing. Or there are certain time window uh, for applicants to fulfill certain uh, procedures. And uh, it is not that easy because of that environment, the police state, and uh, in the midst of uh, uh, act of genocide. And for that reason, this impact is huge on the community and uh, they develop kind of, the, all of them, they have the same problem, just to stress and uh, uh, kind of uh, depression and a low productivity and uh, some uh, uncomfortable uh, situation family families as well. And uh, they lost uh, the joy in the family, and they, draw, they lost that kind of family environment, and they lost the connection and, uh, from their uh, back home. And usually, uh, we uh, the Uyghurs are uh, family loving people, and we count our previous ancestors and. Uh, uh, we connect uh, the through, even uh, as someone uh, died, uh, we weekly basis, we used to visit the cemetery and uh, tell a younger generation, here's your grandma, here's your grandfather, and the name. The connection uh, was established through that uh, culture. But now the Chinese government also destroyed all cemeteries and the cultural and the religious shrines and the sites and the people lost that connection as well. And so here in Canada, we double lost that connection. And for that reason, uh, we are trying to survive. The Uyghur Canadians are trying to survive. And uh, I'm uh, truly grateful of our communities, despite this tough situation they are going through. Uh, solidarity and... Uh, uh, help among them uh, is really, that spirit is really high. And we uh, just come together on a weekly basis and uh, share the pain and uh, the console went to another. Just, we became just like a family members and uh, there is no city boundaries and we have a social media groups and we chat and we establish online school for our kids to learn our uh, the tradition and uh, the mother tongue Uyghur language. And we try to recover all the books and the histories that Chinese government destroyed and burned. And so uh, as a, uh, the generation uh, passing through a critical moment, we try to connect the, our past to future in Canada and elsewhere, that is despite this uh, kind of uh, heavy, heavy uh, physical and uh, uh, mental uh, uh, situation. I have a question for you, Mr. Dutty. Um, you mentioned that you have been threatened um, actually many occasions, I understand. Um, um, do I have to understand that you reported these threats to some authorities? Yeah. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit about 
the support you have received, if any, from these authorities. It's not necessary to identify the authorities, just to give us uh, a bit of... Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, that is, uh, yeah, just when we report, we expect something could come out after the report, and uh, there should be some mechanism in the government when they receive that kind of serious threat uh, for someone. There is some mechanism uh, which is triggered to action, but we don't have in Canada. And uh, just a very uh, the sad example is just two years ago, uh, we had a hearing with uh, CBSA. We had a, a lawsuit against CBSA. Uh, the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project was the intervener, and we, uh, we thought the CBSA did not uh, fulfill its juris jurisdictional duty, not stopping uh, the imports made by the use of labor force labor. And so just right before the hearing, or just after the hearing started, the, both my phone and the, my legal counsel's phone hacked right at that time. We couldn't use. And at that time, my legal counsel, as she's sitting there, she, uh, the, after she said, okay, it happened the same for my phone, and so, she said, okay, I'm going to report the police and I'm going to go there, go here. I said, just you can go, it is a waste of time. And I have gone through numerous times about and we don't get any result. And it turned out to be the same situation and uh, my legal counsel spent a lot of time and energy trying to get an answer. And similarly, a year ago, I think, uh, JIS, the one Jewish organization, they want to have a fundraising to sponsor six Uyghur refugees come to Canada. Just as soon as that fundraising event started, and there is an intervention by the third party, and inserted just pornography to that webinar. So that fundraising didn't happen. The small to big people are very uh, focused to disrupt the normal activities. And uh, you may think, uh, what's the big deal of fundraising? Yes, it is not a big deal, but for some people, it is a big deal. And uh, as we work with the government, IRCC and the Global Affairs to uh, resettle the 10,000 Uyghur refugees, the Chinese government is sending delegation to delegation to a number of countries where Uyghur refugees reside. And initially, our government officials did not understand uh, why the Chinese government is so busy. Just so those Uyghur refugees in third countries, and we are helping them to resettle in Canada, nothing to do with China. Yeah, that is the normal thinking. But for Chinese government, uh, it is not the normal thinking. The Chinese government, they would like to keep the Uyghurs in those countries where they have a full control over. They don't want those Uyghurs to come to uh, democratic societies and receive education and uh, after 10 years and 20 years to confront the Chinese government on the international arena. And so uh, if those Uyghur refugees uh, live in Turkey and some other places, at uh, a maximum, if they do well, maybe they can open one shop or restaurant or do some small business. That's it. But Chinese government is much better than the coming to Canada and receiving the higher education and uh, becoming a professional, uh, establishing a professional career that can be uh, challenging for Chinese government in future. And for that reason, Chinese government starts to intervene and put pressure on those countries just to stop the exit of the Uyghur refugees. And it happened in Kazakhstan, and uh, the global affairs and the immigration had to wait for two years, just work, just to get one family out because of the Chinese pressure. Otherwise, that family has nothing to do. And those families, family members, have received UN mandated refugee status. And Kazakhstan, by law, obligated to assist them to resettle in third countries. But because of Chinese pressure, they blocked the exit. And so uh, this is uh, 
know, what it means when we call foreign interference, just it touches your life. It touches your safety. It touches your security. It touches your family comfort. It touches your career. It touches your future. You don't get sleep. Uh, you don't know what kind of bad news you are receiving when you wake up tomorrow morning. And so this is the exact situation of Uyghur Canadians right now. Thank you. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I wonder if now would be an appropriate time for an afternoon break. Yes, it's 2.20. So we'll take a 20 minutes break. So we'll be back at uh, 2.40. Okay. Order all rise. The commission is now in set, uh, recess until uh, 2.30. Uh, no, yeah, 2.30, 2.40. That's the house of compose just got uh, So it's 2.22, 2, 22 minutes after 2 o'clock, uh, 14. So um, this is going. Um we need to interject these these individuals a bit more, I believe. <laughs> this will go on, gotta you know, a little bit, keep it rolling a little bit back and forth, just because, um, like many people, myself included, can go on and uh, you lose people in the process. Skittles, Skittles, ooh. Yeah, I got one. Worked at a candy factory. Um, the first couple of weeks, I uh, sad to admit I was eating a little bit of candy and and going home with a little bit of a stomach ache. You know, a little bit of a stomach ache. Buying because you know you get these candies at like super discount. So you can buy a bag of them for like 10 bucks. Sometimes uh, you can get the... Anyway. Those pretty good deals. Not good deals, though. You know. Like, maybe I'm not going to buy that on the way out this week. Another thing happening. The House of Commons is also meeting today. It's nice. It's ongoing right now. So we'll probably just about three or four minutes, just so while the support staff. Yeah. There are billions of dollars missing elsewhere. Yeah. I, I... Billions. That's fine, Mr. McKinnon, but uh, I don't think it's uh, for you to. Uh... This is. Thank you, and uh, to. Mr. Lawrence. Just lining up something members. here. And I think uh, All right. on our side, we're ready to vote. Okay. So the talks are here. People so lining it up. This is just I, I think that it's important to to put some context into uh, into the into the meeting today. Um, uh, when we look at the carbon tax, uh, we heard today testimony from the PBO. We've heard testimony from the governor of Bank of Canada, uh, both nonpartisan uh, experts in their respective field, that the, car that the carbon tax is, in fact, um, causing individuals to go hungry. It's causing children to not be able to eat at night and go to bed hungry. This is a significant issue. And so my understanding of it, and I could be wrong, I have no inside information, but my understanding of it is that the premiers wrote to the finance committee um, and and asked uh, before the April 1st, when the carbon tax is set to increase by 23%. We don't have much time here, so we can postpone and live in an imaginary world where this doesn't exist, but it does. We have April 1st deadline. They wrote to the, to the finance committee, the liberal finance committee, and he deemed it. He deemed it that it was inappropriate that somehow the premiers, that millions of Canadians should not have a voice, that we should just all sit here, sit here and watch children not be able to eat at night because it might upset our schedule. Are you kidding me? How out of touch? Hey, we are, we, we are here. Hey, yeah, but uh, back, yeah. hold on, hold on. What about I'm everyone to just take I'm it sorry, yeah. but... Je ne mangeais pas. Je ne mangeais. Listen, 
I missed meals, sometimes a whole day's meals, and the carbon tax didn't exist back then. Now, you know, is the ta carbon tax really doing all of this? Can we get back to brass tacks? It's important to hear from premiers, but it's important to not use them as political pawns, and I would like to put people on notice in that regard. Thanks. Before we continue, we just remind everyone of... Uh your voice levels with our interpreters, please. My Mr. apologies, Lawrence, to, please. Yeah, my apologies to the interpreter. Um, but I'm not apologizing for my comments because they represent the reality. We heard today from the public, from the uh, uh, from the parliamentary budget officer that the carbon tax is increasing food. We're facing an affordability crisis. I met yesterday with a single mom, as a couple kids, whose whose mortg whose mortgage eats up her entire paycheck. So she has to use a food bank. Like, this is not a laughing matter. This is serious, guys. And and premiers wrote to the finance committee, and the liberal chair decided that their voice wasn't important, that the millions of Canadians that they represent didn't count. And so, yes, our chair followed political uh, proper parliamentary procedure and called a meeting so that the premiers, the leaders of millions of Canadians could testify from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, from Saskatchewan, from Alberta. I, I'm sorry that we had to move around our schedules. I know that we're all very busy, but millions of Canadians want to express their view that the carbon tax is hurting families and it's hurting Canadians. And so, yes, I, I don't think it's asking too much for 12 members of Parliament to move around their schedule for their voices to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else uh, wish to speak on this? Sorry, it's Mr. Back. Yeah, I'll get you. Yeah, I'll get to Mrs. Vignola and Mr. Lawrence. Do we? Sorry, do we get Mr. Backrack checked in? Are you joining us? And we're losing Mr. Bullerays. I miss you, Chair. I uh, unfortunately I don't have my headphones. Um, okay, we'll recognize okay. thumb up or down, thumb down for you then. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Vignola, then uh, Mr. Lawrence. Well, I'd like Mr. Lawrence to put on his headset because uh, previously, before I put my colleague on notice, regarding the fact that we don't need, it doesn't have to be just due to a carbon tax that uh, people can't pay their rent or they have to skip meals because I actually did both of those things for years and there wasn't a carbon tax back then. But honestly, we need to be respectful towards our witnesses. We need to really dive deep into the issues that they're experts on before we question them, you know, it's not just a matter of having people showed up who've been calling on, to, who've been asking to see us for, for, for months. It's, it's a matter of respect towards the witnesses. I know that the 1st of April is on the horizon and it's not April Fools here that I'm referring to. But the fact of the matter is we need to be respectful towards our premiers, their valuable time, which is just as invaluable as ours is, if not more, and that whether it be a premier from another, from a Canadian province or, or the province of Quebec, they have a, a hell of a lot of responsibilities. And so we need to be respectful towards them. I don't think that my 80-hour shift of uh, p per week suggests that you know, I'm lazy and, and, and the reason I'm speaking now against having these meetings uh, uh, like uh, is because I'm lazy. It's not about that. I work hard. It's a, it's a matter of respect to those witnesses that we have before us. And we also have teams that are working in the background and we're continuously, you know, keeping their nose to the grindstone, leaving them in panic mode when really we should be more respectful towards them and towards the witnesses. You know, none of this should be rushed through. I just wanted to put that on the record. I'm ready to vote whenever you see fit. 
Thank you. And uh, to the extent that my colleague took any personal offense, I, I apologize. I was not in any ways attending that she was uh, lazy in other ways. What I am saying, and I, I make no apologies for this, uh, is that uh, Canadians are facing an affordability crisis. Uh, and thank you for sharing your personal story. And uh, I've heard uh, from uh, from tens, if not hundreds of people in my riding who are going through that exact scenario. And the reality is, the facts are the facts. The parliamentary budget officer came before us today and told us... Point of order. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Atwin. I believe we're debating a motion that's on the floor, so I'd like to question the relevance of Mr. Lawrence's comments right now. Uh, I think uh, he is speaking on it, but we he, we always allow very wide uh, uh, latitude with uh, debate. Go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so uh, um, just to respond to that, um, I... What I'm talking about is the carbon tax, which is what the uh, premiers wrote to the finance committee about, which was the genesis of the situation of which we find ourselves to right now. Uh, we've seen seven out of ten uh, premiers objecting to the federal implementation of the carbon tax, um, and it it um, it the carbon tax has caused significant significant financial challenges for Canadians. Uh, and it's this Prime Minister who has chosen to divide Canadians for political purposes. It's this Prime Minister who said that Canadians uh, in one part of the country have to pay the tax while others don't. It's this Prime Minister and this Point little of government. order. Point of order. I don't see how this relates to whether or not um, we I'm meet sorry, tomorrow. Mr. McKinnon, if you could just wait for us to uh, interrupt and recognize you for your point of order, but go ahead now, please, sir. Sorry, uh, I don't really see the relevance of how this uh, how this relates to our decision before us to meet tomorrow or not. Yeah. Thanks, you can continue, Mr. Lawrence. Point is uh, that this, it's this prime minister and this liberal government has always operated by dividing, seeking uh, to pit different groups of Canadians against each other. Just point of order. Yes, Mr. McKinnon. The decision before us is whether we meet tomorrow or not. It has nothing to do with the allegations about what this government is up to. Uh, I, I encourage all members to stick to the topic at hand. Right, that's not for you to uh, encourage other members, but we take your point, Mr. McKinnon. Mr. Lawrence, you can continue, sir. Point of order. It is entirely my I'm privilege. sorry, Mr. Mr. McKinnon. If you wish to have a point of order, that's fine, but please wait till I recognize you. Right. Point Go of ahead order. on the point of order, please, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, I will challenge the chair. I, it is entirely within my purview to urge the members to to take whatever action I deem appropriate. It's not up to the chair to c criticize me on that basis. But I certainly do encourage all members to realize that we have before us a decision on whether or, what, whether or not we meet tomorrow. And I, I think we need to adhere to that uh, to that motion. That's fine, Mr. McKinnon, but uh, I don't think it's uh, for you to uh, decide on the relevance, as we've stated before, and many, 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 many times in this committee and others, that uh, we always allowed a rather wide latitude in discussions, especially in debate. But I understand point your point. Please, if you could just wait for me to uh, finish my commentary, Mr. McKinnon. But as I said, we always allow a very wide latitude on these issues. I was going to refer back to Mr. Mc, uh, Mr. Uh, Lawrence, but go ahead point, and mean Mr. Point McKinnon. of order. Yes, I am not deciding what is relevant or not. I have expressed my opinion as a member, uh, sub subbing into this committee that, that this discussion is not relevant. I'm entitled to make that uh, observation. Um, and uh, and uh, I'll let it rest there. Okay, um, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you very much. And so the, the point that uh, I'm making, and I, I do appreciate my liberal colleagues listening intently to my uh, to my commentary, um, and, uh, and, but I'll, I will 
sort of for, for their sake, sort of, uh, I guess, distill this down into the relevance. So as I said, uh, I believe it was four premiers um, that I've seen uh, media reports on have, have written to uh, the Finance Committee to ask to talk about the impending increase in the carbon tax. Thus, the urgency is April 1st when it goes up by 20%, 23%, I should say. Uh, we've, heard, we've heard testimony today from the Parliamentary Budget Officer that it increases the cost of food, that every, every on average a family in Ontario, Alberta, any everywhere the backstop applies are out of uh, are out money. Um, in some cases, thousands of dollars. We and uh, so in so just it, right from his report from the PBO, the fiscal and, and economic net. Uh, uh, loss in Alberta for the average household is nine hundred eleven dollars. In Saskatchewan, it's five hundred twenty-five. In Manitoba, it's five hundred two dollars. In my province, uh, the beautiful province of Ontario, it's six. The Foreign Affairs Commission will come in shortly. Please take your seats. The Commission on the Environment will come in shortly. Please take your seats. The Commission on the Environment will come in shortly. We're at an affordability crisis. People are, are are barely getting by, and I guarantee you that every one of the MPs on here is, has gotten emails, letters, or calls from distressed constituents that are having finding it difficult to get by. And Mr. We're, Chair, point of order, just again, uh, getting back to relevancy as tomorrow's meeting, I understand where Mr. Lawrence is coming from. Uh, he's not a regular member, so if it was so important for regular members of the Conservative Party to show up, they would have shown up. I, I believe it was Jack Layton who said, if you want a promotion, you got to show up to work. They didn't. I'm sorry. And I recite. And Mr. Lawrence knows he's had tremendous respect for me. This meeting was called at the last minute. And I just want to inform the committee members of the consequences of if we don't treat this motion today, the premiers will not be uh, testifying tomorrow. There will be a motion to adjourn. You can feel the majority of the members are not on side with what happened. I'm just saying out of respect for the witnesses that are supposed to show up, that nobody consented in this committee, this is what's going to happen tomorrow. So we ought to deal with this today out of respect. And then at some point, the committee, if they wish, they can ch they can pass a motion to have the premiers reappear at a point where all committee members are in favor. Merci. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Continue, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, uh, thank you. And as I, I was saying, is the carbon tax is, is a substantial and pressing issue. And the reality is, we're not living in a vacuum. The carbon tax hasn't isn't a policy that's being proposed for a year or two years or five years down the uh, down the lane. The, uh, the carbon tax is a is hurting people right now, and it's set to increase by fully twenty three percent. The premiers of our uh, of our great country, four of them, have asked to speak to parliamentarians. Um, I I am more than willing and more than able to schedule my time in order to be here. And it's completely within parliamentary rules uh, to have any four conservatives that they want on this uh, on this committee, Mr. Druin. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, so uh, we we regularly sub in and sub out individuals uh, for various different reasons. And so that's not unusual at all. Um, certainly in finance committee where I am a regular standing member, we, we've had uh, numerous different members from the Liberal Party, from the NDP, uh, and from the Conservative Party, as well as the Bloc Québécois. Uh, the reality is, is this is a time-sensitive, pressing concern. We, uh, at April 1st, it, the carbon tax is going to increase by fully 23%. We've heard, we've heard uh, from, uh, uh, we've heard from... Point of order. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Lawrence, uh, yeah, no Ms. Atwin. Uh, I would ask uh, that this is very quite repetitious. Um, so if you could make, in, make a new point, perhaps, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Atwin. Um, and I, I do apologize. I probably did lose my train of thought through the numerous uh, disruptions. But um, in getting back to uh, to where I was, um, and so when we when we look at so 2024, I went through the various uh, uh, net loss, uh, the the money coming out of Canadians' pockets when they can least afford it. Um, in fact, um, GDP per capita since 2014 has not increased a dollar, not a penny, not a percent. In the United States, it's increased by nearly 50 percent. Canadians are getting poorer, and then this is a sucker punch. Uh, at Point the of order. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, once again, I, I fail to see the relevance of this uh, to the, the question at hand. Also, I fail to see the relevance of having 
any premiers speak to us on estimates. Uh, it's a matter, it's, it's, it's totally out of their purview and totally out of the realm of uh, legitimate action for the OGO committee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I find it uh, funny you're talking or calling relevance on uh, the motion and then refer to something else, but I appreciate that. Mr. Lawrence, we'll go back to you. Thank you very much. As, as I was saying, uh, Canada is in, an, in a point, point of order. Wow. Go ahead, Mr. McKinnon. Two words. So my, uh, my comments on relevance have to do with, with the current speaker's speech and how they're going on off, uh, way off topic. And uh, I... I the, the question before us is whether we should have meetings, a meeting tomorrow. And the, the matter being brought forward is that these premiers are going to speak to us about things that are not on the uh, on the, uh, the docket for the uh, OGO committee itself. It has nothing to do with estimates. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Mr. Lawrence, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And so just to circle back once again um, to uh, inform my my, uh, my colleagues on the other side, um, the the primary subject of, of the meetings uh, that are scheduled, that is the subject of the debate of this motion um, and the larger sort of argument or debate um, is the carbon tax. So I'm going to talk about the carbon tax. So they can continue to object to that or they can just acknowledge the fact that a motion about carbon tax, you can talk about carbon tax. Um, um, so, when we when we look point, at point of order, before we turn Ms. to McKenna, our uh, fourth panelist, I just wanted to follow up to you, Mr. Tony. Tax. We, uh, we want to I remind the committee uh, that the uh, question before answer, us is not about carbon tax. The add, question before uh, us before is we whether or not we're to Ms. Wollensack. Okay, we're there back live. Going back uh, live here. The last thing I would like to add is. <laughs> They're point of order uh, like crazy. I would like to talk a little bit about okay. uh, the 2021 federal election. And when election decision was uh, announced, and uh, as organization, we developed a number of uh, policy right, action items and distributed that to all political parties. And we have received a response from Conservative Party. I just had some apple strudel. And also, we uh, we made a little pamphlet, a brochure kind of, and we uh, distributed to all uh, community members and uh, supporters all across the country. And we asked them, okay, if someone knocks your door, and these are the five items you ask uh, those uh, candidates whether they support. And uh, so at the end, uh, to make the long story short, the Conservative Party adopted four of our policy uh, action item in their election platform and uh, made public. That is one of the important reason the Chinese government went mad about it. The increased campaign against Conservative Party. And on December 15th, uh, 2022, I had a, a, a conference uh, in McGill University. I shared the, uh, the stage with uh, Honorable Aaron O'Toole. And I shared some of my personal thoughts on how the Chinese government uh, interfered in the 2021 election. And so uh, the number of uh, the policy items we proposed and uh, adopted by the Conservative Party of Canada in the election platform, just I believe one is the acknowledgement of Uyghur genocide because Parliament voted and acknowledged unanimously, but the government of Canada did not. And so we want the Conservative Party, if they win the election, just uh, as, a, as a government, acknowledged the atrocity crimes that Chinese government uh, is committing against Uyghurs as a, as a genocide. And the second, the, the, there was a, a discussion uh, at the U.S. Congress to pass a specific legislation called Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And we want the Canadian government or a parliament to pass the similar legislation, and we call it Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prohibition Act. It was one of the policy items we proposed and the Conservative Party adopted. And the third one is, uh, it was... Uh, there are two, uh, the Parliamentary Committee report, one is uh, Subcommittee of International Human Rights and the Standing Committee of uh, 
uh, Foreign Affairs, both uh, committees uh, adopted a number of policy recommendations when they issued the report on Uyghur genocide to the government. Uh, the one uh, the common element of that uh, report was to create a uh, special uh, refugee stream to help those Uyghur refugee, refugees stranded in unsafe third countries and uh, help them to settle in Canada. So number third, our policy item that uh, adopted by the, the Conservative Party was to help to Uyghur refugees. And the fourth one is the divestment, because uh, Canada Pension Plan has investment in China and on Chinese companies, either directly or indirectly uh, tied up with the Uyghur forced labor or a supply chain, or directly or indirectly tied up with the, what is called as uh, uh, integrate, integrated joint operational platform, IJOP system. The Chinese government created a system that basically uh, from all street cameras or all uh, surveillance uh, devices, whenever the, the, uh, the number of Chinese high-tech companies also developed uh, the facial recognition technology for Uyghurs, and they got, received a patent. Huawei is one, Dahua is one, Hekivision, Alibaba, uh, SenseTime, a number of them. They received a patent just to identify the Uyghurs wherever they are seen on the street, and they trigger police alarm within 15 seconds, just allow police come to the right spot to arrest them. And uh, Human Rights Watch called it integrated joint operational platform. So all data will be uh, centralized in that the platform and then compare with the personal ID of that individual and uh, just to uh, create the profile of that person, uh, that there's a score system in China, especially for Uyghurs, as you know, and then just immediate arrest happens right after that. That system is called iJob system. So Dahua, Huawei, Hekivision, Alibaba, SenseTime, Hytera, all of them part of that system. And our uh, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board invested on those companies. And so, I'm a, a pension contributor. I don't want to receive my pension from the money Canada Pension Plan made through those companies when they are actively engaging or involving or benefiting from Uyghur forced labor, surveillance, or genocide. And for that reason, that was one of our campaign items. And the Conservative Party of Canada adopted that campaign uh, as well to their election platform. And the last, the one uh, was about foreign agent registry. It was important uh, for Canada to identify the foreign agents or agents who are receiving money from foreign hostile governments and working for the interests of those governments. At least we should know. And for that reason, that was one of the campaign items and the Conservative Party of Canada adopted. And after that, and we have seen the increasing level of uh, attack against the Conservative Party. And from time to time, uh, I uh, exchanged it with the uh, former leader, Conservative Party leader, Aaron O'Toole, and Michael Chong, and a number of other Conservative colleagues who are a member of uh, Parliamentary Uyghur Friendship Group. Uh, so, there are uh, the two election debate. Uh, the one is French, one is in English. If you look back, uh, the Aaron O'Toole, during the election, uh, the debate on TV, they mentioned the Uyghur genocide and uh, tried to squeeze uh, the Right Honorable uh, Justin Trudeau on the debate, uh, saying that uh, uh, he did not acknowledge the Uyghur genocide and he didn't do anything. Uh, in that regard. And so, election is over. Uh, within th two or three weeks, I guess, uh, I'm not going to name that MP because it was our private conversation. 
I was called by one of uh, the very important MP and I said, okay, there is an internal review process that will start just to figure out what is the issue, why we lost the election. We may not be that much vocal on a number of issues because uh, initial, uh, the initial level, we, we are uh, thinking that we failed to communicate with the Chinese Canadians. And some of our messages regarded the tough. And for that reason, uh, we support the human rights and uh, we understand the situation of Uyghurs. And so uh, during that conversation, I told this is the wrong message. This is the wrong message to China. And this is the wrong message to other political parties as well. And if you take this uh, stand, then uh, the, the message will be clear to other political parties. If you talk about China, there will be a consequence, you lose election. So all political parties tend to follow the same thing. And secondly, this is kind of exactly what the Chinese government wants. This is not the right policy. So that is the end of the, the conversation. And uh, recently, again, with the same MP, I exchanged a number of times and I said, okay, you should have, you should have st stick on your point. Highlights on the election platform. Now you see in whole Canada, this is part of our national conversation and we are talking about the same issues. And somehow you step back. That was not a good message. And so uh, I believe the Chinese government was not happy about uh, the Conservative Party that adopted uh, the number of our policy recommendations in their election platform, including the acknowledgement of Uyghur genocide and uh, promising to pass uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prohibition Act and uh, do something about the divestment of Canada pension plan uh, and uh, university endowment for uh, the pension uh, the fund. Uh, we have a number of uh, universities. We identified nearly 119, 115 or 119 million dollars investment from Nigel University invested in Chinese companies tied up with genocide. We issued a report and so there are some other uh, universities are doing the same. And we have uh, the clean university initiatives and a number of university students to work on it just to expose the uh, investment portfolio. And the Canada pension plan is the biggest. And the provincial and uh, the federal pension plan is the biggest. And so we just including that uh, recommendation in the election platform, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada could uh, cause some uh, so, sort of retaliation from China. And that's, uh, I, uh, that's my belief. And uh, also, if you look at the, the, uh, the change of tone in the Conservative Party, for example, if you look back the Aaron O'Toole and the old question period, Aaron O'Toole at least uh, confronted with the prime minister at least 10 times, I, I know, during the question period, to ask a question about Uyghur genocide and the government response to it. With the new leader of Conservative Party, I met twice, and uh, I frequently meet with the deputy uh, leaders of the Conservative Party all the time. They offer support, but if you look at the, the specific performance at the, the question period, and a new leader of the Conservative Party has yet to mention we were genocide in the parliament, in compare to Aaron O'Toole. And so <clears throat> you can see that difference. And uh, as a person advocated for this cause, as a person dealing with the, the high level individuals from both parties, and especially uh, prior to the 2021 election and after 2021 election, prior or after the election, let me uh, say like this. And if I look at their performance and their uh, talking point and uh, the issue that they are raising in the question period, and it is different. That is just because of the, the internal review report after the election 
and within the Conservative Party, and the removal, I, I say removal of the Erno tool from the leadership position. And that is all something to do with the adoption of the five points, uh, uh, the policy recommendation we offered. And that is what I believe, and I shared uh, my thoughts with um, Aaron Utwell a number of times. Uh, we exchanged it. Uh, he's a responsible person, and he did not uh, he did not tell me exactly what he thinks, but at least he knows. Uh, and so I hope that he will explain more to um, this uh, inquiry. Thank you. We'll turn now to our next panelist, Ms. Grace Dye Wollensack. Ms. Wollensack, uh, let's start by making sure that you've got access to a microphone so we can hear what you have to say. Wonderful. Would you please start by describing your community or communities? Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, uh, Grace Wollensack. Uh, I'm a national director of the Falandafa Association of Canada. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for the Public Inquiry Commission for organizing this panel. It's really crucial and important, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. So about our Falun Gong community, uh, I'd like to start off by introducing Falun Gong, also called the Falun Dafa, as it probably is new to many people. Falun Gong is a peaceful spiritual practice rooted in the Buddhist tradition. It consists of five meditative exercises and moral teachings centered on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. Falun Gong emphasizes morality and the cultivation of virtue. Falun Gong was introduced to the public in 1992 in China and quickly gained popularity due to its powerful effectiveness in helping people improving their physical and mental well-being and spiritual elevation, with the number of participants growing to between 70 million to 100 million by 1999. The Chinese government praised and awarded Falun Gong for its health benefits and moral teachings before the persecution began. A high-ranking Chinese official once stated that Falun Gong could save billions of yuan, the Chinese dollars, on health care costs cost in China each year. Falun Gong is open to everyone with no membership enrollment. People can come and go at their will. It is a way of life. Learning and practicing Falun Gong is free of charge. There is no clergy and no temples. All relevant materials and information, including audio, video, and books, are available with a translation of 50 languages on the Internet to the public at no cost. And all community events and activities are organized and run by volunteers. Today, Falun Gong is practiced by people of all ages and all walks of life with different as, uh, ethnicities in over 100 countries, including Canada. The Falun Gong community hosts events mostly in public spaces in various cities across Canada. Since COVID-19 pandemic, some activities have gone online. In, in Canada, we, our community like include the people from different uh, ethnic groups like uh, Chinese, Iranians, Vietnamese, Korean, and the local uh, Canadian communities uh, from uh, different professions, you know, like just as, as normal like uh, society uh, members. So anybody can start learning Falun Gong by visiting the website of learningfalungong.org. Each year, thousands of people in Canada attend the free online classes. We don't have, because of no membership enrollment, so we don't know the exact number of people who practice. And so like maybe a thousand or 10,000, that's a big range. So China's campaign to eradicate Falun Gong. In July 1999, the Chinese Communist Party launched a nationwide eradication campaign against Falun Gong in an as a extrajudicial manner, large scale arrests, detentions, and imprisonment accompanied by brutal tortures and inhuman treatment 
were reported by human rights organizations like Freedom House and Amnesty International. The persecution is uh, considered one of the worst human rights violations since the Cultural Re Revolution in China. The practitioners have experienced with over 100 torture methods, including electric shock, rape, and sexual abuse, sleep, food, toilet uh, deprivation, being exposed to extreme cold or heat, and being forcibly sent to psychiatric hospitals, where they are injected with unknown psychiatric substance. Like each day, like 16 to 20 hours uh, of forced labor, in extreme poor hygienic uh, conditions, some in toxic environment without protection. Mass killings and large-scale false organ harvesting have been happening over two decades, supported by the evidence from the China Tribunal and other credible sources. False disappearance and displacement, harassment and surveillance, and social exclusion and discrimination are other widespread phenomena experienced by Falun Gong practitioners in China. So millions of families have been torn apart. The state orchestra the systematic human rights violations constitutes the crimes against humanity and the potentially genocide. The CCP also waged a mass hate propaganda and a harmful disinformation campaign demonized Falun Gong and its practitioners with thousands of state controlled media outlets and internet in, in, in China to incite the hate and justify the persecution. So uh, a most frequent asked question is why a Falun Gong being persecuted in China? So there are four uh, key reasons. Falun Gong's massive popularity and the rapid growth outnumbering CCP members, which is about 60 million at the time of the persecution started. Second, completely independent of the Chinese uh, government control. The Chinese government want to set up a Communist Party branch in Falun Gong and also charge fees, which got rejected, and so they, they were not happy. The Falun Gong's guiding principles incompatible with the communist atheist ideology. Number four, former CCP leader Jiang Zemin's jealousy and the political motivation also played a large role. Jiang wields Falun Gong as a threat to his power, while Falun Gong has no political pursuit. It is a, it's a spiritual. Thank you. Would you please describe the forms of foreign interference uh, that your community experiences? Okay, yeah. So the persecution has not only been confined in China, but also been extended worldwide, including Canada. There are well-documented directives from the CCP top leaders to extend the persecution of Falun Gong beyond China. The objective is to stifle and marginalize Falun Gong adherents and impede human rights advocacy. The Falun Gong community in Canada advocates against the CCP's persecution of Falun Gong practitioners in China, Canada, and elsewhere in the world. The community's efforts in Canada, including combating disinformation about Falun Gong and the increasing awareness of the CCP's crimes against the humanity, this is achieved through outreach and truth clarification activities. For example, displaying banners, boards in pub public uh, uh, places, distribute the flyers, collect the petitions, protest at the Chinese embassies and consulates, art performance by Shen Yun and other initiatives, and also through seeking the support of uh, politicians and uh, government. In, in the course of this uh, carrying out um, of these advocacies, the Canadian Falun Gong community has witnessed and uh, experienced extensive foreign interference and uh, repression in the past uh, two decades by the uh, Chinese Communist uh, regime. So, uh, in, actually, in the in the in, in uh, recently, we uh, Falun Dafa Association issued a report 
with uh, 20, 130 pages documented this uh, 20 some years of uh, foreign interference with over 90 uh, examples and cases to uh, yeah, to uh, to show actually that's the just the uh, tips of iceberg. The what we have experienced so much and uh, in in the wide range of uh, spectrum of their tactics and the strategies, like used the uh, pound in this uh, persecution uh, in overseas. So, yes. Uh, so like uh, this report uh, can cover the. Tactics used by the CCP's influence Canadian elected officials and the different sectors of society to marginalize or surprise public support of Falun Gong. The tactics include a political infiltration, manipulation, intimidation, hate incitement, disinformation, assault, harassment, cyber attack, and uh, surveillance. They are used not only by the Chinese embassy and the consulate, but also by the CCP agents and the proxies on Canadian soil. The United Front Work Department, the Communist Party's primary tool for foreign interference, plays a key role in spreading CCP influence in Canada. The report also documents the CCP's interference towards Canadian communities, business, festivals, and other art and cultural events etc. to exclude the Falun Gong community from participation. The campaign of coercion and manipulation harms Canadians' interests and erodes Canadian values as well. We also experience uh, persistent the damaging, physical the and the verbal assault the and the harassment, yourself surveillance, and the and cyber attacks against Falun Gong practitioners in the public uh, space, consider that. and the and continued systematic control again, of the Chinese community the circus, media the and the digital space in Canada to promote the CCP's narratives and the silence the Thanks. voice I of the Falun Gong community. So I'm going to elaborate more about hate propaganda and discrimination in Canada. PRC seeks to mind, interfere with Falun Gong and those practicing it in Canada so by demonizing staff. them through the spread of hateful disinformation about the Falun Gong and its uh, practitioners within the Chinese Canadian community via Chinese language media, internet, and otherwise to the Canadian public more broadly and to elected political representatives. Over the 25 years, hate propaganda against Falun Gong was disseminated in Canada by the follow following ways. One, the Chinese embassy and the consulate via anti-Falun Gong displays, rallies, websites, and the dis dissemination of propaganda material to Chinese media and to all levels of Canadian government officials, as well as the Canadian media outlets. <laughs> Second, the vast majority of Chinese Canadian media and the social media are uh, controlled by the CCP to replicate anti Falun Gong articles and the information in Canada, including uh, the local community papers across Canada and also internet, uh, international major daily newspapers like uh, Xingdao and the Mingbao. The court documents revealed that a Montreal-based Chinese newspaper was founded by the 16th office in China to produce anti-Falun Gong leaflets for distribution across Canada. The 16th, 16th office is the extrajudicial body that is responsible for the persecution of Falun Gong and other dissidents groups in China. Number four, CCP controlled WeChat like we see, and the local Chinese social media platform tightly monitor chats and delete any posting, po any positive postings related to Falun Gong while allow anti-Falun Gong posts to stay. The, I, I my personal experience that because like uh, if I post anything, that not only the post will be deleted, my account would be also uh, be uh, removed and my IP be blocked for many years and uh, like uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very severe I, also in all, all across Canada, the Chinese platform. The CCP, display, uh, the CCP deploys internet police or 50 cents party, those paid uh, commentators to reproduce anti-Falun Gong views. 
and, uh, and uh, post the CCP's narratives consistently and widely and in uh, every internet, 24 hours, seven days per week. Some pro-CCP Chinese leaders, reporters, and the publishers were invited to attend briefing meetings at the Chinese embassy and the consulate, and also in mainland China. It was reported by the National Post that the Chinese ambassador visited their office to distribute anti falun Gong materials, and uh, they and also, they, uh, they also pressured the CBC in order to air a documentary on the topics of the persecution of Falun Gong and the forced organ harvesting. Many of the, probably no, ex no exception, that the Western media here in Canada reports often quoted the CCP's slanderous word, cult, in their reports related to Falun Gong, which lent a uh, hand to the CCP in its defamation campaign. So after we uh, we, we uh, protest and uh, clarify these issues to the media, and it's getting better, but uh, at the beginning, like they all quoted that uh, slanderous words, and that's also uh, I think uh, helping to spread the hate. So next, it's about uh, physical and uh, uh, verbal assault. Instances of uh, rampant harassment and assault have been persistent in different cities over the years, including a uh, practitioner held at the gunpoint during a protest at the Chinese consulate in Vancouver. Another example is a, a Toronto practitioner who was uh, outspoken because uh, her brother-in-law was tortured to death in China and her sister disappeared for many years. And she was threatened by a stranger who knocked at their home door and threatened to take their kids away. On another occasion, her car window was smashed and uh, her balcony was spread by human is creations all over, all over the balcony. And there's many um, instances of uh, practitioner got assaulted while they are on the public place at the Toronto City Hall and uh, at the, the provincial uh, Queen's Park and all like uh, the CN Tower because that's the place that usually um, we raise awareness, like uh, collect signatures, tell people what's going on in China, the persecution, and to tell the Chinese people don't believe uh, believe the lies. But uh, like this activist has been monitored, uh, and there's monitoring surveillance and the intimidation has been also going on. Practitioners raising awareness in public places are subjected to constant monitoring through being for, for, for photographed, videotaped, and receiving intimidation phone calls, Interf interference with the family members in mainland China persists. For example, a man followed a female practitioner to her home and stopped her to tell her that uh, he knew her name and her father's name and home address in China and demanded her stop from going to the Chinese consulate to protest. Many practitioners have experienced a similar threat. Basically, all the practitioners who uh, join these uh, public uh, activities, they are uh, blacklisted. And so, sub like uh, subsequently, they denied passport, denied visa, or like even they, they visit their families, they got uh, arrested at the border. So, like uh, at, the, at the, the beginning years of the persecution, so now we, we stopped going to China. So, like uh, over 20 some years, Many of our uh, community members have never seen their families <clears throat> be able to visit China. And also the digital and the cyber attacks. Falun Gong practitioner, practitioners not only being compromised of their online uh, presence, they also face the cyber threats directly from China, including attacks on Falun Gong websites, email viruses spread all over the place, and uh, hacking over the 24 years. So. That's uh, uh, the consequence, like we lost the uh, data, important files, that uh, disrupt our work and advocacy work. 
And also now come to the important uh, uh, aspect of the interference is the political interference. The PRC's efforts to spread the hateful disinformation, disinformation to elected of political representatives include providing such disinformation to politicians in all levels of government, impersonating members of the Chinese community, and sending politician messages that echo or repeat inaccurate and harmful disinformation about Falun Gong, often insulting and threatening and impersonating Falun Gong practitioners and sending messages to politicians designed to make the PRC's disinformation about Falun Gong appear credible. Tracking the IP address of some of those emails showed that they originated in China and is a global phenomenon highlighting the involvement of the communist regime Identical or similar emails have been sent to politicians in various other countries, including the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. The hate campaign have become more active in the past after the election and after politicians send supporting letters to the community. This effort has led certain politicians to refrain from supporting or interacting with the Canadian Falun Gong community without knowing that a hate campaign is behind it to manipulate them. So for example, there's a one, um, there's a, a bogus email by an individual claimed to be a colleague of Miss Grace, <coughs> referring me to an unknown number of elected MPs after 2015 election. And shortly after, I, I ran into this MP in the events, and after an uh, introduction, and the, she, she heard my name, Grace, and Falun Gong, she immediately became uh, upset. And she, because she said she received uh, aggressive and rude emails uh, from uh, Falun Gong and uh, Grace. And after I clarified with her the situation, that is uh, CCP's uh, plot to solve this court. And she understood, and then she sent, she forwarded me the emails that she received from the CCP agent and the email chains, and it was really rude and offensive. And so, like, we have documented many um, such uh, emails in our report. There's, uh, they sent uh, such fake emails to MPs, to the MPPs, to the city councillors, to, um, uh, to also the, the theater managers and the, uh, all levels and uh, uh, round and uh, around. And so we have been trying to clarify this, but uh, it's, we have limited uh, results to be effective. And so this impersonation emails were effective as a method of disinformation. There's uh, another example of the political interference. So our practitioners have been holding um, daily visuals protests in front of Chinese embassies and consulates um, in all like the, the cities, like in Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, and uh, Montreal, like daily since uh, more than 20 years. And the, the Chinese government is really uh, uh, like annoyed, and they try to get rid of us from uh, the practicing side. So they pressured um, the different cities, also uh, cities, to try to remove us. And so there were incidents that happened uh, in cities like uh, Ottawa and uh, Vancouver, attempted to restrict our daily protest set in front uh, in front of the embassy and the consulate. So the, upon the CCP's uh, influence and the demand, the Vancouver mayor in 2011 ordered the removal of Falun Gong 24-hour protest site outside the Chinese consulate in the, in, in the city. The site had been there for a decade by that time. It's sad. I so feel sad to see this. Because similar things happened in Ottawa.
in early 2000. One day I received uh, uh, the permit in front of Chinese embassy. They put the restrictions, like uh, we are not allowed to hold big butlers that is visible from far. We were restricted with a small this, uh, board this size and has to be handheld. Like I was, uh, uh, like I was really uh, puzzled why they put this in. After years of we were in front of Chinese embassy without any incident, without anybody complain. And so like, uh, why they restrict us? I, I talked to the permit of office. They said like, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's not uh, my decision because we received the complaint. I said, if the complaint from Chinese embassy, that should not be valid. That's not a legitimate uh, request or complaint. But if there's any uh, legitimate complaint you should forward to us, we will, we will uh, improve like uh, what the issue is. We can address the issue. And so like uh, he said, uh, like, uh, he, he, he got this uh, from his superior. So I had to talk to the, uh, the city officers and the policemen and all like uh, city, uh, city councillors and many of the people try to ask them to give me explanation. And also eventually I talked to the city lawyer and I said like, why you put this, like they use a bylaw to restrict us. I said, why you have to use a bylaw? You have to go that far to restrict us. You're not using the law in a good face because uh, you are supposed to, the bylaw is supposed to maintain a good order and uh, to for good service of the public. But you are restricting the, the freedom of expression in Canada in assisting of the Chinese Communist Party while we are calling for the end of the killing. And so what you are doing here? So we send an appeal to the city council and the, to the transportation committee. Fortunately, they unanimously passed the motion to remove the restrictions on this. But we did not, we did not have to go through this. We did not have to face this. And that's just an example of the foreign interference of the Chinese uh, government to our uh, local authorities. Sorry, being emotional because we have gone through many of these things that we, we don't have to. Yeah, the same like in Vancouver. They had to bring to the court in order to remove our display board, which is calling for the stop of the killing. You know, this happened after, you know, the free trip to, to, to China, the Vancouver mayor, free trip to China, and was treated like emperor. And he came back and ordered to remove of the board. And there was, this was the campaign by the Chinese consulate that has been documented, reported by the media, and uh, many uh, evidence showed that. This is a corruption of our uh, politicians with, uh, as a consequence of the foreign interference. Okay, so then the next example, there's a uh, RCMP actually one day contacted me after some MPs felt offended and uh, made a complaint about the emails they received. And after I clarified to the RCMP officers, two of them, and they understood uh, what's going on. I said, this is the systematic attack orchestrated by the CCP agents or CCP themselves, you know, try to uh, discredit the Falun Gong practitioners to our politicians. And so when I asked them to help to stop this campaign, an RCMP officer said that they were tasked to protect the parliamentarians and suggest that uh, we took to other routes for help. So actually, I reported to the the police, Ottawa police, RCMP, CISIS, and the Ministers of uh, Public Affairs, and also talked to our global affairs over the years, with all these issues, but really have no idea what has been uh, what measures actions has been taken. It seems nothing has been done. The PRC's efforts to inter interfere with Canadian politicians also includes threatening or uh, offering them the potential 
the potential loss or gain of trade and business uh, opportunities, as well as the vote from the Chinese uh, community. For example, the the city mayors withdraw the provocation of Falun Dafa Day after trips to, to China. That happens, I, I give examples in Ottawa and the Port Moody. In 2010, May, in May 2010, Ottawa citizens reported that the mayor of Ottawa, upon return from a business trip to China, refused to issue a provocation to recognize Falun Dafa Day as he had done in previous years because he had, he said he had made a commitment. Later, we learned that uh, he made a commitment to the Beijing mayor upon request uh, during the business trip and not the came from the Dafa Day. Fortunately, the Ottawa City Council later bypassed the mayor to issue a provocation of Falun Dafa Day in June 2010. And so, like uh, since then, like uh, the city of Ottawa has issued uh, every year. Another case uh, was reported uh, by Global News that is like stating that seven mayors uh, from the Vancouver area were invited on an all expensive paid all expenses paid trip to Beijing in 2007 by billionaire real estate developer and uh, former People's Liberation Army officer who has official connections to the United Fund Works Department. Following the trip, the then Port Moody mayor, who had proclaimed the Falun Dafa Day from 2002 to 2007, ceased issuing the provocation. According to a profile story in the People's Daily, that businessman came to Canada with the intention of using his real estate business to persuade Canadian politicians to view China more favorably. Another example, Chinese consulate in Toronto threatened the city, the Toronto City Council not to pro proclaim Falun Dafa Day in Toronto by writing to all, all of them and threatened with uh, uh, the business um, ties and the relationships. Ms. Wallensack. I do apologize for the interruption. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. Um, and I, I know that you have covered some of this question already in the information that you've shared so far. Uh, but I wondered if you wanted to uh, briefly address the impact uh, of foreign interference on your communities um, before we turn to our next panelist. Okay. So can I have the, the last piece of uh, the Yes, of course. Please go ahead. I will skip some, but uh, the, the last one is important because uh, just something happened the last weekend. So, like, uh, because the Chinese government also systematically tried to sabotage Shen Yun. Shen Yun is a classical Chinese dance performance company. The, uh, its mission is to restore the lost heritage destroyed by the Communist Party in China. Chinese government are afraid of Shen Yun because that's a challenge to Chinese party's le legitimacy of ruling China. And with uh, because the traditional Chinese culture is in conflict with the communist culture. So they write uh, warning letters to politicians asking them not to attend the performance. They call or email those elected officials who attended the show to pressure them with defamation to Falun Gong and Shen Yun. A city councillor in Ottawa watched the Shen Yun show. Following the show, he, his office started to receive emails nonstop with offensive and rude content claiming to be from Falun Gong practitioners. With the help of technical support at the city hall, the office managed to block the emails only after the Councillor complained to a local practitioner, the practitioner had the chance to explain it. Such uh, in, interpersonal emails uh, pretend to be Falun Gong also sent to a theater manager in Calgary with insulting words and uh, try to attempt to sabotage the relationship with the local presenters. Theater, they also threatened the local business sponsors to withdraw the sponsorship to Shen Yun. They slashed tires of a Shen Yun bus, tour bus in Canada and US uh, happening uh, multiple times. In the just the most recently last weekend, um, on Sunday, a bomb threat email 
was sent to the Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Vancouver while the performance was being shown in the theatre. The same threatening emails were sent to the theaters in the U.S. at the same time, showing it was a uh, deliberate and a vicious attack on Shenyun. Only the, the CCP had such motive and matches with their previous behavior. Okay, yeah. So and I will move to the next, the impact to our community. I mentioned briefly earlier the impact of our community was um, for the, the threatening and the safety and the security of our members here and our family members in China with the visa denial, the passport denial, and arrest upon return to China, and et cetera. And uh, the, the window slash, the tire slash, you know, but that's the personal, um, personal experience. It's... Um, it's on the surface, but uh, the impact is more profound and deeper. So i give a few uh, points here. Falun mm -hmm. Gong practitioners in Canada have sought an end to the persecution and the crimes of humanity that are part of the ongoing er eradication campaign against Falun Gong in China. In response, their efforts, actions, and in fact, their social life have been profoundly dis disrupted and challenged by the foreign interference and the repression carried out by Chinese diplomats and their agents and the proxies in Canadian soil. Not only does the CCP's extension of the persecution of Falun Gong to Canada threaten the, and undermine the safety, security, and the liberty of Falun Gong practitioners seeking, okay, the CCP's interference also adversely impact the Canadian society as a whole creating a climate of in, indifference in the face of the CCP's mass killing and the torture in the PRC, and the breeding intolerance and the discrimination towards the Canadians, in, con in contradiction to well-established Canadian values. You know, the foreign interference and the, and the repression is uh, multifaceted. Falun Gong practitioners face the most brutal suppression by the totalitarian communists in China. The overseas Falun Gong community has been tirelessly working to raise awareness and call for the end to the persecution, which is already self, itself is a challenging task. The difficulties and the challenges they face are compounded by experience of uh, political interference, demonization, spying, bullying, and abuse perpetrated by the CCP in Canada. Support and protection have been lacking and are urgently required from Canadian institutions and the government agencies. There's a limit in what the Canadian Falun Gong community can do. As the Chinese government, they are up against uh, has a near unlimited resource at its disposal. Navigating the legal process is also difficult, costly, and time-consuming, as seen in a tribunal case that lasted for a decade and drained considerable resources and the time. And also, CCP's continuous hate propaganda and the disinformation campaign against Falun Gong has been responsible for creating indifference, apathy, and even marginalization and uh, discrimination towards the Falun Gong community within Canadian society. The CCP's unlawful dissemination of hate speech and the disinformation against Falun Gong in Canada must be addressed. In early years, anti-Falun Gong hate campaigns that the Chinese embassy and the consulate instigated and participated in were direct and visible after the hate incitement the case involving Chinese diplomats were brought and the police investigation and into Canadian courts and uh, tribunals, as well as the public attention. These CCP activities became more subtle and uh, covert, carried out uh, more by hidden agents and uh, proxies, which are no less harm, alarming, damaging, and harmful. 
the network of these powered agents has grown and has become deeply in integrated and embodied, embodied into Canadian society, creating, creating an invisible but a persuasive hand controlling Canadian communities to serve the CCP's interest, eroding Canadian values and sovereignties. Canada must take effective and urgent measures to respond to, their, to this phenomenon before it is too late. Of a particular note is this malicious uh, email campaigns, the impersonating email campaigns. An important aspect of the CCP's interference is the use of enticement, inducement, and the material incentives to influence the behavior of Canadians in key positions or roles in Canadian society to act in the interest of the CCP and to align themselves with the communist regime's agenda. This enticement includes include a free trips to China, lavish hospitality, promising or threatening the business perspectives, as well as the material incentives. You know, the CCP's infiltration into Canada's political system and the institutions is extremely concerning, as it is adversely affecting the proper functioning of the Canadian government and undermines the very ability of the Canadian institutions to address and rectify this issue itself. There is a clear pattern and, uh, and the organizations uh, to the seemingly random and uh, sporadic acts of assault and attacks perpetrated against the Falun Gong community. Canadian law enforcement and the authorities needed to conduct deeper investigations to unravel and address the potential systematic causes of these apparently individual cases, instead of dealing and treating those cases as isolated individual incidents, an approach likely to have limited effect. The CCP has successfully instilled fear in the minds of many, not only within the Chinese community, but also among the non-Chinese populations of the world. Many individuals and organizations fear the CCP and give credence to the CCP's threats, coercion, and retaliation, which the CCP exploits to control them. Chinese nationals fear the possibility of being barred from visiting China or having their families in China implicated if they do not comply with the CCP's demands. Business fear losing business opportunities in China, and the government fear adverse impacts on their relationship with China if they do not follow to the CCP's transgressive demands. Scholars who study China fear research opportunities or denial of visa to China. Some community event organizers fear losing sponsorship by the Chinese embassy or, or consulate. And the politicians fear of losing vote, even that's baseless, like uh, for uh, they, they would lose votes if uh, they, they, they support Falun Gong, but uh, that's the rumors has been spread among the communities uh, to the politicians, and that's the, uh, um, the way to, 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 to control and manipulate our, uh, our politicians. And in a similar vein, although the CCP's interference and the repression targets the Falun Gong community, its measures encompasses effects and involves all sectors and indeed the fabric of Canadian society. The objective is to suppress voices advocating for an end to the human rights abuse in China and uh, conceal the CCP's crimes against humanity committed against the Falun Gong. But at the same time, this uh, coercion and the manipulation campaign also harms the Canadians' interests and erodes Canadian values which endangers uh, this country. As such, the victims of this interference are not just the Falun Gong, but also Canadian society at large. Thank you. We'll turn now to our next pa panelist, uh, Mr. Jasker Sandu. Uh, would you please describe your community or communities? Yeah, look, uh, the Sikh Canadian community acts as almost a beacon on the hill 
for other Sikh diaspora communities around the world. Uh, the community in Canada is about a million strong at this current juncture, and that's uh, that makes it the largest concentration of six outside of Punjab, which is which is considerable when you also consider the fact that uh, six in Canada make up over two percent of Canada's population. And I stress that point because as a proportion, that's greater than the Sikh population in India, which comes just around or shy of 2%. Sikhs are a part of Canada. Uh, this country is theirs. Uh, they have uh, come here in mostly uh, three waves of immigration. The first and foremost uh, happened over 100 years ago as pioneers uh, to this country, mostly through Western Canada. Uh, and you have communities in British Columbia, uh, especially around the Lower Mainlands, but also in the Okanagan, uh, as far up as Williams Lake and beyond, uh, that have been there uh, for many generations. Uh, you also have a, a sizable Sikh community that came during the 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and this is important to remember uh, for the points that we'll be making later, that the 80s and 90s uh, saw Sikhs come here as um, they uh, fled persecution in India. That was the time of the Sikh genocide when India was uh, attacking and killing uh, not only Sikhs, but also their institutions, um, and forms a large uh, part of the Sikh diaspora that uh, you see today. Um, the, the population from the 80s and 90s uh, settled across the country uh, but that is when you started seeing uh, a lot of six uh, settle down in places like the Greater Toronto Area, uh, Brampton, uh, as well as other parts of the country. Uh, the third wave, which we're probably currently going through right now, is uh, a sick population that's coming uh, via things like the point system, uh, international students, uh, which is a, a pretty, pretty large body um, that have added to the tapestry that is the Sikh diaspora. Uh, the, the Sikh community uh, has been uh, incredibly successful. Uh, it has uh, established itself uh, across many different industries, uh, industries that are critical to, uh, to the success of this country. It has um, uh, made significant cultural impact. Uh, you know, just the other day, a Punjabi Sikh artist uh, won a Juno Award. Uh, that, again, is a testament uh, to the impact uh, the community has culturally as a soft power emanating out of Canada. Um, and probably most importantly for the dialogue and the conversation we're having here today, uh, it has immense uh, success in politics. I, I think we can be very frank about that. Uh, we have over uh, a dozen MPs across party lines. Your uh, leader of the uh, the uh, opposition party, uh, the NDP, comes from the Sikh community, is visibly Sikh, uh, practices it as an Amritari Sikh or an initiated Sikh. You have uh, ministers uh, within the uh, Liberal government, at one point, four ministers from the Sikh community. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau at one time famously said, I have more ministers than the Modi government does from the Sikh community. And again, we'll touch on that a little later because uh, that probably caused uh, some of the backlash that we're seeing from India, but it ties into a lot of other things. The, uh, the Sikh community uh, also enjoys senior posts in the Conservative Party. For example, the deputy leader of the Conservative Party at this time is also a visible Sikh. Uh, and that also trickles down to other levels of government. Provincially, you see uh, six succeeding in, in many different, uh, many different uh, provincial parties. You see them succeeding at municipal politics. In fact, the, the mayor of Edmonton and the mayor of Calgary are both six. So uh, the Sikh community has definitely punched above its weight politically. The, the other thing to remember about the community is, just like any other community, and, and I think this will be true of my friends here sitting alongside me, that uh, there's a diversity of thought within the community. You know, uh, the Sikh community, I think, differs from uh, other communities that hail from the Indian subcontinent and in that it is ethnically homogenous. Uh, the community, like myself, is almost entirely Punjabi. Uh, there are obviously other groups, but the, it very much is a, a Punjabi Sikh community here in Canada. Um, 
there is still a diversity in political opinions, on thoughts, on the news of the day, current affairs, history, just like every other community. It does not act like a monolithic uh, on, on every aspect of life, uh, but it is very much united. Uh, it is a community that mobilizes together, that works with one another, uh, and that shares in one another's successes. And I, and I think that's uh, a really bright spot uh, about the community. It's also what scares the Indian government. Uh, it's also what it strikes fear in their hearts, uh, because this is a community uh, that cares very deeply uh, about back home, about Punjab, about uh, India, about South Asia in general. It's it's a community that is tied uh, to Punjab, and it's uh, the fact that it's a lot of them still have ancestral land and holdings in Punjab. A lot of them still have family and friends in Punjab. A lot of them still care about the politics of Punjab and of India. Um, and most importantly for the Sikh community, have deep ties to faith. The, the land of Punjab is the birthplace of the Sikh faith. It is where the fountains of uh, Sikhi that we understand and see today first blossomed. It's where um, Amritsar, our, uh, the, the, the land that is, uh, and watch the uh, Harmandir Sahib, the Dabar Sahib complex, the Golden Temple uh, exists, uh, a site that was invaded and, and almost partially destroyed by the Indian government, again, as part of the 80s and 90s persecution. Uh, it is uh, the land where the Akal Takht stands. The Akal Takht is the temporal seat of authority uh, for the Sikh people. It's, uh, and I hate making this comparison, but it's the closest one I got, and it's the only one that seems that everyone kind of understands. It's the closest we have to, let's say, something like the Vatican uh, or, or, or Mecca for, for the Muslim community. It's the center of our political existence and our spiritual existence. So obviously, Sikh Canadians, uh, people of faith, have a deep connection to what's happening there. Uh, and, and I only mention this again because the diaspora community, uh, the Sikh diaspora community, uh, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it's very much a transnational people, uh, very much that are still connected with their land in Punjab for a lot of different reasons, and most importantly, uh, I would argue, faith. Um, this is, this is something we, we need to keep in mind when we talk about the community. Uh, as, of, as of today, the, uh, the three largest centers of, of the Sikh community here in Canada are, are Brampton, which exists inside uh, the greater Toronto area. Um, there's also large communities in places like Mississauga and elsewhere in the GTA. Uh, there's growing communities, obviously, in Quebec, uh, outside of Montreal. There's growing communities uh, in Windsor and other places like that. Uh, Winnipeg has a growing community. Uh, the second largest community, though, after Brampton is in Surrey, uh, in the lower mainlands, and it adjoined with that, uh, Abbotsford and Delta obviously have very large communities from the Sikh, uh, from the Sikh, uh, Sikh, Sikh people. Uh, and then the third largest uh, hub of, of Sikh population is Calgary, uh, but there's also a sizable population at Edmonton. Uh, so this is a community that is uh, fairly centralized and dense in, in their community pockets. They uh, they enjoy a lot of success in the cities and the places that they've called home, uh, and they, they care deeply about uh, what's happening in Canada, including foreign interference. On that note, would you please describe uh, the forms that foreign interference takes uh, in your community? So the one thing I really want to make clear is I, I appreciate and understand that this inquiry is looking at a, at a snapshot in time. I, I appreciate that. I understand that, that the terms of reference are looking at a, at a specific snapshot in time. But you can't talk about foreign interference and how it has impacted uh, the Sikh community in Canada if you don't go back to the 80s, because that is when it started. Uh, the Sikh community has been uh, facing transnational repression, uh, in clear terms, since the 1980s. And, and you don't have to take my word for it. Raw and IB agents, what are the external and, and internal intelligence agencies of India, have literally written books about this, of how they, in the 1980s and, and onwards, have infiltrated uh, Sikh institutions and bodies, including Gurdwaras, which are places of worship, how they have threatened and coursed uh, actors within our community, including within uh, spaces like ethnic media, uh, how they have worked to not only infiltrate, but destabilize uh, and undermine the ability of the community to mobilize. And part of that 
is uh, a fear of the Sikh community uh, gaining success in the political space, in the political theater, in electoral politics, and the hallways of power. Um, the, the foreign interference story truly, truly starts then. And, and, and it hasn't changed. It has just evolved and has maybe got more sophisticated and advanced since then. But its roots were settled in the 1980s to the point that uh, in and around the mid-80s, and, and Canadian media has reported about this, they reported about all of this, uh, in fact, that at one point, Canada actually expelled members of the Indian consulate engaging in foreign interference in the 80s, uh, which ties into another important point of how the foreign interference happens. Indian consulates act as a hub for espionage and foreign interference and transnational repression targeting the Sikh community. And they'll target anyone who's vocal. That goes for individuals that talk about human rights issues in India. That uh, goes to people talking about uh, historic and existing democratic backsliding in India, one of the fastest autocratizing nations on earth. That goes to people who talk about uh, local issues and political issues in India. And it goes to people who talk about Khalistan or Sikh sovereignty issues. They'll target everyone. And they'll target them uh, for various reasons, again, which we'll, we'll talk about when I think we handle the third question about what the impact is. The point is, though, the consulates are a hub for this activity. And the consulates are made up of, uh, in large part, uh, raw agents and IB agents. Uh, they have stationed in Canada intelligence officers whose sole purpose is to monitor and target the sick community. Uh, and now how they do that and what forms that can take, uh, we saw that in the 80s and we see that continue today, is uh, you know things as simple as visa uh, denials. Um, you know, good luck visiting India. Uh, now, you may ask, well, why does one want to visit India or why would one want to go there? And I go back to my uh, initial answer. Uh, to your question about what the community makeup is. If a sick, and, and I really want people to really understand this of, of how uh, frustrating this is as for someone from the sick community. If a sick speaks about a sick issue that is important to the sick community, that is not controversial within the sick community, which is a conversation that we're allowed to have as a people and the debates we're allowed to have as a people, we risk having our visas denied to visit our religious and ancestral homes in Punjab. What other community would experience that type of heavy-handed transnational repression and foreign interference for merely practicing, and I'm going to stress this point, merely practicing legal, protected, Charter rights and international norms. This is this is this is something as crazy as let's say folks in the Catholic community having debates about issues that are hot topics within the community that don't align with maybe what the Vatican's saying and are now barred from entering Italy or Vatican City. That is literally what is happening to the Sikh community, and it goes on across a whole host of different issues. So that's one way the consulates do it. And that's one reason why they have agents within their consulates. Um, other forms that foreign interference take, and this is a uh, definitely a popular one nowadays uh, with the advent of social media and, and everything else that comes with it, it's probably gonna get scarier with AI, as we're already seeing deep fakes are very easy to do. And there's been advancements in that already in the last week. Disinformation is a critical tool and amplifying and uh, escalating uh, foreign interference against target communities. And this is true for the sick community. It is true for my friends here and the communities that they come from. Uh, we're seeing it uh, only grow more alarming and I fear even scarier with the advent of things like AI. Um, there's a real possibility what I am saying right now, which is being streamed, can be modified literally by tomorrow and saying com something completely else. And what are people supposed to do about that? Now, India is 
seen, and again, this is uh, this is something you don't have to take my word for it. Um, this has been reported by international media from the likes of BBC. It's been documented by major institutions that, uh, that look at these issues, like the EU Disinfo Lab. Um, it has been uh, examined by the Fifth Estate recently. The CBC launched a, um, a documentary that was, in fact, banned in India after it came out. Um, India is a hub for global disinformation. Uh, the ability for India to spread disinfo is second to none. And they will target everyone and anyone that they see as a threat to their interests. And it just happens to be that the Sikh community is at the, at the top or almost at the very top of uh, the communities they target. And what does that disinfo do? That disinformation, in the case of Canada, uh, maligns the Sikh community, undermines the Sikh community. And again, when I say Sikh community, I'm talking about the Sikh Canadian community. I'm born and raised in this country. I'm born and raised in the city of Brampton, spent my whole life there. Um, we're Canadian, right? I grew up playing street hockey on my court, shouting car every time something drove by, and then we get right back to it. We grew up on pads, uh, wearing uh, goaltending pads. Patrick Raw was one of my favorites, him and uh, Felix Bachman. We, were, we used to play with pads one size too small. My knees are a mess, they still are. Um, we, we are Canadian. We're Canadian as maple syrup. We just have, we are sick though as well. That faith is very important and integral to my identity. We're also Punjabis, that history, my ancestors who fought day and night and martyred uh, and, and achieved martyrdom at various points of, of our history so that I can sit here and speak to you as a sick is very important to me. But what's happening is we're getting targeted by disinfo. Um, we're getting maligned. We are uh, victims of um, lies. Uh, we are uh, the victims of an attempt to foster uh, discord in our communities, uh, to polarize our communities. And I'm talking about multiple diaspora communities that come out of the subcontinent. Um, in a way of building this, a term that's often used in, in the Indian context of communal tensions, right? This. Uh, tensions between different communities, whether it be the Sikh community, the Muslim community, the Hindu community, what have you. Um, these are, this is discord and, and tensions that are being exported out of India and undermining our communities and institutions here in Canada. That's incredibly dangerous, especially if you understand what's going on in India. So that disinfo um, happens via social media. Um, uh, and, and your honor was asking about, you know, what type of platforms that happens on. It, in the India's in India's case, um, you know, there's there's two avenues, and that disinfo is is um, spread. Uh, one is uh, WhatsApp, which is more internal community facing. Uh, ethnic media. Uh, there are some ethnic media uh, outlets that are known uh, to be very close to India and in the consulate, and and have uh, different reasons why they might uh, comply with. Uh, demands from Indian government or Indian government officials. Um, that happens um, in Indian national media. Indian national media will spread disinformation. Like it is known, it has been covered, it has been reported. It's a reason why India currently on Reporter Without Borders Index on Press Freedom ranks 161 out of 180 countries. Now, human nature being what it is, those numbers don't mean much unless you anchor with something. India ranks below Afghanistan. India ranks below, I'm pretty sure it wasn't the previous iteration, I don't know about currently, but I think it actually ranks below Russia. India, though, unlike those other countries, likes to tell people that it's a pluralistic, democratic nation that shares values with the likes of Canada and the United States and the UK and et cetera, et cetera. So this is how disinfo is being disseminated. On social media, um, aside from WhatsApp, uh, the, the platform of choice uh, for Indian disinfo is Twitter. And there's a reason for it. There's a very specific reason for it. India understands that Twitter is where um, your politicians are, are sitting, your decision makers are sitting. India understands that journalists sit on Twitter. India understands that think tanks and institutions and NGOs uh, all operate on Twitter. Their goal is not just to directly malign sick actors or sick activists or the sick community, their goal is also to influence Western actors 
to silence Sikh activism in the diaspora. So the role of this info is to uh, is to make it so that decision makers think twice before listening to, quite frankly, their own constituents because of noise coming out of India that they can't find the signal through. Um, the, the, the examples are, are, are multiple. You know, look at, look at uh, the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Uh, look at uh, liberal ministers. Uh, look at members of the Conservative Party uh, at senior ranks within the party. Look at any time they ever tweet anything or say anything or do anything. You will see underneath accusations of them being terrorist sympathizers, extremists, uh, you name it. Just absolutely bonker accusations. If you go read uh, Indian media, I'll give you an example from the 2008 trip to India uh, that Prime Minister Trudeau and, and his entire team went on. The Minister of Defense at that time Harjit Singh Sajjan, was accused of being a terrorist and an extremist. Think about that for a second. That makes absolutely no sense. We know that's ridiculous. The uh, leader of the NDP party at that time was also accused of, of such things. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was accused of being in bed with uh, terrorists in Canada. Again, none of these things are ever proven, and they're not going to be proven because they're false. Uh, but the point is, to attack and undermine and cast a cloud of suspicion on the Sikh community. And in February, uh, I think it was February 2018 at the time, it worked. India was able to achieve their goal. There were, at one point in February, 150 negative articles. I'm not talking about news reports, radio, whatever. 150 mainstream articles that were negative and parroted, unverified, quite frankly, false accusations about the Sikh community, its political aspirations, and its members of parliaments. That's one snapshot in time. That's been happening since the 80s. Um, so that disinfo is also meant to shape uh, the manner in which Canadian media reports on our community. Uh, now, back then, there was huge failings and in, in over a lot of advocacy from the Sikh community, uh, including a, a World Sikh Organization campaign called Ask Canadian Sikhs, including the efforts of a good lot of associations like the OGC and BCGC, uh, as well as just grassroots uh, organizing, uh, attempts to talk to journalists and media to educate them on what's actually going on. And, and Canadian media actually has grown leaps and bounds since then uh, and, and hasn't necessarily fallen victim to these disinformation networks like they did back in 2018. But that doesn't mean it's not happening still. And there are other people platforming this disinformation who I can only term, on, unfortunately, and don't mind my language, useful idiots uh, from the far right, uh, especially on platforms like Twitter, that are more than happy to parrot and push uh, nonsensical, outlandish disinfo from India. Um, another form that uh, disinformation, uh, sorry, uh, foreign interference happens is through proxies. Uh, and we've, we've heard that used, that term used here quite a few times. Uh, there are organizations and groups that are close to uh, either the government of India, that are either close to political parties in India, primarily at this time, just because they've been in power for a while, the BJP, um, or uh, are close to the consulates that are used uh, for various tools of foreign interference, or very methods of, of tools of, of uh, foreign interference, sorry. They're used to lobby uh, government of India interests. They are used to um, uh, support and fundraise political parties. Uh, they are used, and, and I'll, get the, I'll get to this as well, uh, they're used to gatekeep the community from decision makers and politicians. And, quite frankly, they're used in nominations and leadership races to funnel membership and cash to candidates of their choice that will propagate and uphold, in this case, government of India interests. Um, watch typically is targeted towards a Sikh community that has a history of raising grievances with the Indian state, uh, whether it's because of the Sikh genocide, whether it's their, their rights to self-determination, uh, or whether it's uh, to various human rights or other causes, um, including, and we'll get to this uh, when we talk about impact, uh, extrajudicial actions by the Indian government. 
So uh, the proxies are important, the disinformation is important, the media, how it works is important because it gets to, uh, again, uh, probably more relevant to the conversation we're having here, uh, the other form of foreign interference, which is interfering in the electoral process. The, the theater in which foreign interference happens on the electoral process is actually, quite frankly, not necessarily general elections, which I know is, is kind of the scope of, of what we're discussing here, in the first phase, at least. Um, where foreign interference really happens um, at a much more successful uh, and consistent manner is nominations and leadership races. vote in that process. So, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a member of a, uh, you know, the, the Brampton riding. And uh, I can't vote for my candidate of choice unless I first purchase a membership by a certain deadline and then go vote on a nomination date. And at the result, one of the many candidates that stood for the race will get a ticket to run. That's very easy to manipulate. Right? It's very easy to mobilize. It's very easy to give cash to candidates. There's very little oversight on how nominations are done in this country. Uh, political parties are essentially clubs, and they can, for a lack of uh, better terms, are going into details and do whatever they want. Uh, and so it's it's easy to insert yourself into those processes, especially if you're a powerful government uh, that everyone wants to get cozy with because of trade deals. Uh, so you you have an easy time of getting into the process at the nomination and leadership race because of that. Now, there's been some reporting recently uh, that one federal party, uh, and again, the, these folks may not even know that it's happening, uh, have been a victim of foreign interference uh, by proxies uh, and the Indian government in their leadership race. And it was done by withholding and gatekeeping community events, right? So events put on and um, attended by Canadians, membership sales, and general fundraising to undermine or stop a candidate they didn't like because they had raised issues that were important to the Sikh community community that the government of India didn't want being discussed. That's happening everywhere. Right? That happens at the provincial level. It happens across party lines. This is not necessarily an issue specific to one party. I want to make that very clear. Uh, the nominations work the same way. So this is this is something that we, we need to really keep in mind when we talk about foreign interference in elections, because a lot of it actually happens before the generals. It's harder to interfere at a general election because you know, people are voting because of the wave. They're voting for multiple different reasons. There's a lot of different external and internal factors at play. That's not the case with nominations and leadership, where you can control a lot of the levers. Um, interference also happens in things like candidate selection. You know, so every party, before they uh, allow someone to run in a nomination, will go through a process where either they're red lit or they're green lit. If you're someone who has actively spoken about sick issues and sick causes and sick concerns, I guarantee you. The Indian government is telling those parties to red light them. Those conversations are happening. Those correspondences are, are, are happening with one another. And it's done through consulates and high commissions. That is a very real form of foreign interference that is happening, again, across party lines, across every level of government. Again, because it's easy. Uh, every political party is going to one way or another say they want to have close ties with India, again, for trade, and they're willing to, quite frankly, um, look the other way on human rights violations and transnational repression against their own citizens to pursue those trade deals, um, minus one uh, one exception, which we'll get to. And I uh, feel, sorry to, to interrupt, but I am mindful of time because we do have one more panelist. Um, you've mentioned several times that you will talk to us more about some of the things you've mentioned when you discuss the impact. So I wonder if um, you can turn your mind to, to moving on to the impact uh, once you finish. Yeah, look, uh, impact, they literally kill the guy. 
right? They killed Hardeep Singh Nijat, a president of a major Gurdwara in Surrey, in the parking lot of said Gurdwara in broad daylight. A leader of the Sikh community slumped over his steering wheel, bleeding out, because he was shot multiple times, as part of a transnational repression assassination program. And the scary part was, he was only one of many people on that list as per the U.S. indictment on Nikhil Gupta, but should really shed more light on this. And I look forward to the day that the RCMP lays charges and arrests the people that were involved in the Canadian example. Like, how is that for impact? That's the cost of foreign interference in this country and not taking it seriously. What... What surprised us about Prime Minister Trudeau's message in Parliament back in, um, what was that, six months ago, seven months ago now at this point, what, what surprised us as a community was not the fact that India would go to the lengths of assassinating someone in Canada, a Canadian citizen, mind you. What surprised us was that Prime Minister Trudeau would stand up in Parliament and confront it head, head on. And that, at least that day in Parliament, would be echoed by all major opposition parties from the NDP to the Conservatives, the Bloc Quebecois. And that surprised us as a community because the impact of foreign interference on the Sikh Canadian community has been largely ignored over the last 30, 40 years. The community has felt that it's been up to us to defend ourselves. It's that there is um, essentially nothing the government will do to uh, protect six out of fear of uh, embarrassing India a country that likes to advertise itself as the world's largest democracy, but quite frankly isn't, and the trade deals that it comes with. The, the reality is the impact of foreign interference has had a major chilling effect over the last 30, 40 years, and sick Canadians enjoying charter-protected rights and the full, full glow of liberty and freedom that this country is supposed to stand for. We have allowed the Indian government to dictate the terms of how fellow Canadians look at us as sick Canadians. The impact has been we have largely allowed India to describe us and describe us practicing our charter rights as extremists or terrorists. In fact, me speaking here right now, under Indian definitions, would be considered an act of terror and extremism because I'm just telling you the truth of what happens to our community. That's how freely they, wrote, they throw that word around. Uh, and the and the impact of that is a not just a chilling effect within the community, but casting a cloud on the manner in which government, government officials, party members, MPs, uh, agencies talk to us and deal with us. Because they don't want to be caught up in the whole disinfo networks. They don't want to get the gatekeeping from proxies of the consulate. They don't want the angry phone calls and meetings that the consul will ask for because, again, the reputation on the Hill is India is a very insecure country and throws a storm about everything. The, the reality is, is that that is what the impact is. Um, aside from the community and the chilling effect it has on us, it has also led the government to make some really profoundly problematic decisions. Because of the disinfo that was being leveled against its MPs and the community back in the 2018 trip that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau took, Canada at the end of it 
signed a document which was hailed as a major policy victory for India. They signed what was which was a uh, security sharing framework with with India. And I'll tell you right now, the only community that the India cares about is the Sikh community. So essentially, as far as the Indians are concerned, they are working with Canada to spy on us, conduct espionage, uh, but to use and fish for information so that they can harass and bother uh, not just activists that may be operating out of Canada, but their families and loved ones back home. Now, a security sharing framework of this type did exist at one point, but Canada pulled it decades ago because they realized that India was using information, even just basic information that doesn't actually amount to any kind of guilt or anything of that sorts, to engage in extrajudicial murder, torture, uh, seizure of properties, et cetera, et cetera. And Canada, to its credit, has over the years not fallen under the pressure to bring that type of framework back until foreign interference worked like a charm for India and they were able to get it done. Um, it has dictated the type of people that run uh, for uh, positions of like MP or MPP or whatever, or MLA uh, in this country. It has stopped certain folks from engaging or speaking freely about issues because of the fears of the retribution. Um, India has effectively exported autocratic, despotic, extrajudicial measures that are normal in India to Canada. That is what we have allowed. Um, and the murder of uh, Bayu Hardeep Singh Nijar is just one really drastic example of that. Um, may not be the last one. Now, aside from the community, it's it, the impact is that it undermines the ability of our community, uh, of Can Canadians, to uh, make free decisions, decisions that are um, not tainted by foreign interference. Uh, it stops Canadians from engaging with their democratic institutions uh, without the, uh, uh, the the stain of disinformation and misrepresentation uh, casted from India. Uh, it robs Canadians of making really informed decisions because of the type of uh, attacks that are being leveled against the Sikh community. Uh, and you know, it, it formats it formats discord and polarization within our community as well, uh, who are happy uh, in some segments of the community happy to jump and bandwagon on disinformation from India if it means that they can attack certain political parties and certain certain politicians they don't like for other reasons or, or whatever it may be. Uh, the, the the impact you know I'll, I'll give you another stark example. You know back in 2010, um, Canadian visa officials. Uh, re rejected visas to uh, former and current Indian paramilitary, military, and police officers from visiting to Canada because they had been implicated in extrajudicial murder and torture, um, particularly against the Sikh community uh, in India. The, the Indian government, uh, after an outcry and pressure and complaining about it, um, the Canadian government reversed their decision and allowed those actors who had a history of conducting torture and extrajudicial murder against our people into the country. That has continued to happen to this day. Uh, and those people, quite frankly, live amongst us. That is something we're allowing because of foreign interference. Um, and that is something that uh, is going to increasingly happen if we don't wake up. Uh, and if we believe that, well, India is, a, again, a pluralistic liberal democracy, just like Canada and the U.S., so therefore we can in interact with them just like we do with, you know, allies like the U.S. and the U.K., we're in for a really rude awakening. Uh, India is a hostile state. Uh, India is, an, uh, uh, well, depending on what ranking you look at, if you look at the VDEM Institute or the Freedom House, it is uh, the fastest autocratizing country on earth. Uh, it is now a what is referred to as an electoral autocracy. Uh, it is what is referred to as a partly free country. I already referenced the rankings of press freedom there. Institutions like the judiciary is falling apart. They have literally uh, just arrested one of the major opposition leaders in the, right before the election, and they pulled the funding of uh, another major opposition. Uh, and again, in a lead up to an election, this is the state of India. It's been like this for a very long time, and it's the Sikh community that's facing the brunt of this hostility. Thank you very much. 
we have one final panelist who is joining us remotely. Uh, so I'm just going to wait until uh, she appears on our screen. Ms. Winnie Ng, thank you for joining us today. Would you please describe your community or communities? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitations. Uh, my name is Wen Yang. I'm the co-chair of Toronto Association for Democracy in China. And I just want to start off by sending regrets on behalf of our other co-chair, co Chuck Guan, who has taken ill and lost his voice. So I'm here to speak on behalf of our group. Um, I would start off by talk, saying a bit more about TADC and then go into the broader Chinese-Canadian community. Um, TADC was founded on the eve of 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. It has been a human rights organization for the past 34 years, organizing an annual June 4 candlelight vigil to commemorate the victims of, massacre, of the massacre. It's, in a sense, it's, it's our way to preserve the truth of what has taken place and to stop any rewriting and erasing of this chapter of the atrocity. Right now, there is a disinformation campaign, a counter narrative that's going on that June 4th never massacre never took place. And that's why we continue to organize and make sure that the truth will never be forgotten in addition to the annual events, we also have played an active role in advocating and lobbying efforts in Canada and abroad, including this before appearing before the Canadian Parliamentary Standing Committees and the U.S. Congressional hearings. Uh, TADC is also a founding member of the Amnesty-led Canadian Coalitions for Human Rights in China. During the, uh, the after the, the June 4th Tiananmen massacre, a TADC along with Chinese Canadian National Council, the umbrella organizations uh, representing activists across the, can, the country, we actually lobby and got amnesty, then the federal government and got amnesty for 5,000 Chinese scholars and students who then was stranded in Canada. And then, as you all know, the 2019 anti-extradition bill protest movement took place in Hong Kong. And as a result, with the political crackdown and the passing of the national security law in Hong Kong by Beijing on June 30th, 2020, it has a devastating sweeping impact on the rights and freedoms of Hong Kongers. So TADC has initiated a project um, since 2020 in assisting some of the former pro protesters and pro-democracy activists in resettling in Ontario. That's so the gist of our work. Um, and I just want to also want to echo some of this, what the previous speakers have said, and I want to introduce myself on a personal level. I, came, I was born and raised in Hong Kong and came to Canada in 1968 as an international student. Uh, went to Montreal and then moved down to Toronto in 1975 and worked as a community organizer right in the heart of Chinatown. So I've been involved in the community for over 45 years. And I think just like the, the Punjabi community, it's, it's the Chinese Canadians community, it's diverse, it's complicated, and it's non-homogenics. We had different waves that have come in and bringing in new diversity, new ideas, as well as new challenges. I would say, you know, in the, after the, uh, in the 70s, we 
We worked on the Southeast Asian Boat People's Movement. In 1975, there was the campus giveaway, the W5 movement, and that sparked the whole anti-racism movement within the Chinese Canadian community. Um, and to me, I think what we have been saying is then um, in 1989, with the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre, this is where the turning point is that we can, you know, uh, I'm hoping the commission would look beyond the elections of 2019 and 2021 and take a broader and long range view, looking back and the insidious way the Chinese uh, PRC has been influencing and interfering with not just the elections, but in terms of controlling our media, in terms of um, usurping our organizations. And these are all part of the pieces that has shaped to bring it to this point. I, in that sense, it's also, I mean, in the past it has been, the United Front's work has been more quiet, more under the current, more hidden. Now it's a whole lot more emboldened and they have taken a free range in doing a lot of the intimidations and, and interference into our own Canadian politics. So this is where I'm coming from, from in briefly describing what TADC is, as well as the broader Chinese Canadian community. It's, it's diverse, it's complicated. And, you know, with the influx of different waves of newcomers, and particularly with the last four years, uh, through the grace of the Hong Kong federal government's Hong Kong Pathway Program, we now have a new generations of younger Hong Kongers that are coming in. And it's it's also creating more dialogue and more providing us with more evidence on the whole scheme of the influences and interventions of the People's Republic of China. When you talk about um, the People's Republic of China becoming more emboldened, you talk about influences and interventions. Can you give us some examples of what that looks like? Uh, what kind of forms does foreign interference take in your community? Yes, and and just to reinforce some of this, the points that uh, Mehmet and Grace have made, these, the pattern is quite similar to all the other groups as well. And I think I just want to start off by saying, you know, the, a lot of these actions and you know as campaigns and schemes are orchestrated by none other than the United Front Work Department, the UFW, which is headed by the chief of the secretariat of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee. And part of that whole, I think, you know, what the whole intent through the P, you know, through the PLCs and its proxies, it's to create and cultivate an atmosphere of fear that would stop and dissuade Chinese Canadians from speaking out against the PLC. These means include by one by usurping legitimate Chinese Canadian organizations, you know, by co-opting by repurposing, and I'll go into a bit more detail. Two is by influencing people in power directly or indirectly. Three is by criminalizing certain acts extraterritorially. Four, it's through Chinese language media and social media. And then last but not the least, by threatening individuals directly or indirectly who speak up against the PRC. And part of this, these means are made more complicated and more difficult to counter because PRC does not abide with the regular, the ordinary rules of engagement, right? The overarching purposes of PRC's foreign interference strategy is to silence the critic, 
to suppress any dissent and foster loyalty among people of Chinese descent or the heritage of PLC. And so in that sense, nationalism, patriotism trumps over human rights, democracy, and freedom. So I will go into a bit more detail and then give some examples. It's one on usurping, co-opting legitimate organizations. This is a very common political tactics that strategies that's used by the United Front. Uh, the, you know, it's, in a way it's called entryism. It's using, you know, the PRC encourages members, its members or supporters to join an organization locally. It could be a community service agencies, um, a tongs associations, whatever means possible to permeate and perpetuate these organizations in an attempt to expand influence and expand their ideas and programs. So they might not be, you know, it, come, it appears to be so innocuous, but the hidden agenda is it's trying to persuade these organizations to remain quote unquote neutral and not to be quote unquote political. Right? Over time, these infiltrations, these influences, the United Front has become a complex network of organizations that would engage in various activity for CCP, for Chinese Communist Party at a whim and at a beck and call. So, um, and so these are, that's one of the pieces and we have seen, um, you know, one of the first fight it's used during the, you know, as the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre, China, uh, CCP has also recognized they need to, they need to reckon, they need to counter the, our, our narrative, they need to counter our community-based organizations such as the Chinese Canadian National Com Council that came about from a whole anti-W5 movement in pushing for equality and access to positions and outcomes. What they have done is using their power brokers to create a counter national umbrella organizations that would espouse the ideas and act as the mouthpiece of CCP. So this umbrella organizations was formed in 1992. And while it professed to be a community national organizations, it actually carry out the, the work to counter criticisms in Canada by other local organizations. And one example to cite is the whole head tax redress campaign, which we took on uh, as community activists. I remember I was signing, interviewing head tax payers in 1984. And CCNC took up the fight and we got an apology in 2006. But the, the path to that apology was fraught with challenges and counter diversions and confusions that was instill, instigated by these counter umbrella organizations. And, you know, and they took different stands to the point that, that it, it divided the community efforts and we end up not having the strongest solidarity in pushing for more in, more changes in within the government. At the end, the head tax redress campaign, we got the apology and we got compensations for the head tax payers or their you know descend uh, the uh, their spouses. But uh, when the other counter organizations was pushing for just apology and no compensations, it. To, it these are, we fall and pray into the divide and rule context and uh, divide and rule tactics. And this is just one clear example. The other, it's um, influencing, the other strategy is the influencing people in power. 
you know, uh, the community leaders, elected or non-elected, as long as they have high profile, they're deemed as the opinion leaders, PRC through the United Front would try to approach them, try to, and you know, get them to go travel to, to China. The wine and dine politicians at all level was rampant over the last 20 years, um, you know, with the aim to, for them to achieve, a, you know, to shape and influence the opinions of these elected politicians that they would take a pro PRC policy position, including fund by fu including funding trips to China, and I mean it's to me I think this is really quite uh, a counterintuitive. Intuitive. It's when we have parliamentarians who embark on exchange programs with the. China, with PLC's National People's Congress. What kind of, to me, I think it's, what kind of exchange program would that be coming from an autocracy system, coming from a system where their National People's Congress only, may, only meets 10 days a year and they have never voted anything down? Uh, I believe these are charades, these are inferences at the very top level of our uh, Canadian democratic institutions. Um, so, and then the, the, in terms of the inferences of people in power, it include, you know, the Confucius Institute in the presence of Confucius Institutes in our public school board system, to the public in, uh, post-secondary institutions. These uh, inferences had repercussions. These are soft ways of entries, but it carry on have severe and long-term impact on our intelligence, on our uh, informations, as well as the shaping the public opinions about PLC. The other piece is on the third is on the threat of accessing and weaponizing personal data, right? The PLC collect data as all the previous speaker has talked about, you know, to collect data and the information that, that they can use as part of their intimidation and interference strategies and efforts, right? It includes social media, and you know, a technology that have us using information and data. Uh, it put, it's and it's especially through banking institutions with connections with PLC. And to me, I think this is where uh, Mamet had talked about it too. The presence of six police stations, Chinese police stations in Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto are no coincidence. These are you know, much as they have been shut down, we we will never know whether it's operating in another form, at a, on the underground basis, or through other social media and through internet. So these are, to, to me, I think um, we cannot afford to be relaxed. We cannot. We need to be stepping up our vigilance as well as stepping out our. our measures in protecting our Canadian democratic system. Um, the other piece, I think the fourth, which is what's happening, taking place, the real example is what's taking place in Hong Kong right now, is the Criminalizing Act within Canada. All right, uh, the Beijing controlled Hong Kong government introduced various legislations, such as in 2020, the national security law, and then Last Saturday, the Article 23 legislations took if has just taken effect in Hong Kong, and this these legislations prohibit activities by anyone, whether they are uh, Chinese or Hong Kong nationals or not, in in speaking out, in criticizing, in engaging in activities that steam as 
you know, colluding with foreign inter uh, foreign agents, seditions, and subversions. And you know, regardless, and you know, under this new law, Article Twenty Three. Activities like what we have been doing, such as lobbying, which is normal a normal part of life of Canada's democratic system, may be found to have breached PRC's or Hong Kong's law. And both these type of these the national security law and Article 23, I think one of the damaging part is also they are retroactive. And that an in, in individual or group can be criminalized for activities that took place even before Article 23 has taken place. And to me, this is all part of the continuations to silence dissent, to get people to start self-censoring themselves, and to give up um, speaking out or showing up in any of our activities outside Canada outside Canada. And to me, this is the last nail in the coffin in dismantling and straddling the highly built civil society of Hong Kong into strands. Um, then the fifth one is the, the Chinese language media and social uh, language media and social media, which others have also talked about. I'll just raise an example that, you know, um, over our 34 years of organizing the candlelight vigil, June 4th candlelight vigils. Prior to eight years ago, we have always been able to get the cooperations of the, the Chinese print dailies to give us a community rate, to put our ads in the newspapers as a way of promoting the event. But from eight years, last eight years, that offer has been declined. We do not, you know, at this point, we cannot. And and the newspapers have refused to put our ads in the paper. And I think the, these are some of the, the pieces that has dramatically shaped and polarized our communities as well. I think this is where, um, you know, um, the influences have you know, it's it's beyond just the 2019 and 2021 election. It's these accumulate. You know, the influences that took shape and started back in the late in the early 80s have now taken shape and taken a stronghold within our Canadian democratic system. You mentioned uh, goals of silencing dissent. You've talked about trying to. Um impose self-censorship. Uh, you talked about an impact of polarization within your community. What else would you like to tell uh, the commissioner and the members of the public about the impacts of foreign interference on your community? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going to elaborate about the impact with an, a few concrete examples, right? Uh, last Saturday, March 23rd, the day when the Article 23 legislation took effect in Hong Kong. We organized, we were part, Toronto was part of the Global Day of Action against uh, Article 23. We were one of the uh, 23 cities across the globe that did the protests. And in the protests, we immediately saw a number, an increasing number of of demonstrators or activists who came out to the rally, they end up concealing themselves by wearing heavy duty headgear. And that wasn't the case previous demonstrations. And to me, I think this is this is part of that self protections that they have to do. Um, after the 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 rally on Saturday, on Monday, as organizers of this year, the 35th anniversary of the June 4th candlelight vigil, we have, you know, we have booked Mel Lastman Square for our event. We have uh, commissioned, we have contracted 
an AV technician technician commit commit company to set up our stage. Now on Monday, we just heard from that AV company that they are withdrawing their commitment, they're withdrawing their contract because our organization is deemed as quote unquote political. These are real, and you know, I mean, we're not gonna be, you know, <laughs> deterred and we're gonna forge ahead. But these are concrete examples how, how insidious and how that element of fear sometimes have overtaken our conscience, our commitment for freedom and democracy. The other piece, and I think this, these are some of the key pieces. The other is, you know, uh, TADC has launched a campaign along with other groups in pushing for foreign agent registry. And for that, we, we were accused of being traitors. We were accused of being racist. And, and these, I mean, for me, this is, you know, as someone who has been involved in anti-Asian racism in human rights, in, Asia, uh, in human rights courses in Canada for the last 45 years, I find this offensive that Be pro-Beijing politicians and community people, activists would brand this initiative as a racist, as reminding of the Anti-Chinese Exclusion Act. To me, I think this is farthest from the truth. What they have done, it's using false equivalents, conflating anti-racism, anti-Asian racism, and our our desire to safeguard the China, uh, the our Canadian transparency and accountability within our polit political system. What's wrong with us standing up as Canadians and saying that? We need a foreign regist agent registry to hold our government, to hold our elected politicians accountable. And this, and in particular, this foreign registry, agent registry, is not just singling out ch uh, Chinese agents, quote unquote. So I, I, I find these to be part of that, that divisive, divisiveness that is taking place, trying to create a po further polarizations between different groups within our own community. Um, and so I, I guess my, my sense is, you know, it's the commissions as you in the in later on in a, you're gonna be releasing your in, initial report. I believe, you know, that would be one of the, one of the counter narrative that pro Beijing people in pro Beijing Canada people in Canada is going to characterize using anti Asian racism and nationalism and patriotism as a way to counter and diffuse the recommendations of the commission. So it's just a, a word of forewarning that that should be that that the commissions need to stand firm on this. And last but not, I mean. Uh, you know, the previous speakers have talked about what has, what has, you know, just the, some of the personal impact and harassment and very painful uh, stories and narratives. I want to add on, you know, through the last, uh, you know, one add on a positive impact is through the last 34 years of working on these issues, starting and then in particular through the China coalitions as Amnesty International's Let's China Coalitions. It's one positive outcome that came out from our organizing is getting to know more about the Tibetan struggle, more about the Uyghur struggles, more about the Taiwanese struggle, and what we are doing, it's the more China PLC is creating this divide and rule through their united front, the more we are standing in solidarity and, and being united 
for our own, for our common goal to make ensure that democracy, freedom, dignity, and human rights would appear in, not just in China, in Hong Kong, but in Canada and in China's at one point. I think my final message would be the only way we can overcome fear, and some, sometimes these fears are legitimate, particularly for those who still have relatives and family in, in Hong Kong and China. The only way we can overcome such fear is by putting out, by showing up, standing up, by giving that sense of hope. Hope will overcome fear. Hope and solidarity and strength in numbers would overcome fear. And to me, I think this is where, you know, we would continue and I appreciate the commission's work. And I'm hoping that you would take also our advice into account and say I, that look beyond the last two elections and look at the long arm of China, at PRC's influence in, Hong, in, in Canada over the past few decades. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wonder uh, if we might take a brief break. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll suspend for about 10 minutes just to review the questions that uh, may have been sent by the participants. Uh, and uh, we'll come back. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît, this hearing is now uh, in recess until 5 o'clock. Cette séance est en pause jusqu'à 5 heures. And others can have a uh, quick or refresh. So we'll spend for four minutes. We'll have to hear the premiers before the uh, before the. Uh, Mr. Chair, there, uh, in in finance committee, we have a rule where you the analyst to the clerk and uh, to the the team here, uh, and uh, to the analysts there. We uh, we appreciate your, your work there. Uh, in in finance committee, we have a rule where you the analysts actually have to put their name tags out there, um, and because uh, so, I don't believe you. Uh, in this case, gentlemen, but ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, get the uh, get the recognition you deserve there. So, um, but uh, I, I was just talking about the uh, fiscal and, and economic net impact uh, to Canadians in 2030 and 2031, um, and just um, uh, at the risk of being. Um, Point of order again, and just because we did take a suspension, um, I, I would like to just briefly reiterate, reiterate why we think it's important that we have this, uh, um, why we have this hearing uh, tomorrow, uh, and the urgency. The carbon tax is set to go uh, up on April first, uh, and uh, of course we've got uh, the Easter break uh, coming into place uh, shortly. Um, we're coming up on Easter weekend, and uh, and to all. Uh, to all my Christian friends out there, uh, happy Easter. Um, the uh, this is really the last opportunity we'll have to hear the premiers before the uh, before the um, increase on April first uh, uh, of twenty three percent in the carbon tax. So um, it's it's really it's really now or never to hear from the premiers, and uh, if if they are willing to take time out of their extremely busy schedules, I, I believe that. Um, we should be able to organize a committee uh, to uh, to hear them, and uh, I believe that the notice of motion or notice of meeting has already gone out. Um, I'm I'm quite sure that out of the uh, uh, 160 on liberals we have in the house, um, that they could uh, arrange uh, four or five to uh, to appear uh, tomorrow um, to hear this very important testimony. And what. I think sometimes get lost because when we're in these rooms, we only see um, our, uh, we see the parliamentarians, of course, our great analysts, our interpreters, and uh, clerk, uh, and our chair, and maybe a few folks uh, from the media. Uh, but we're all here to represent uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of Canadians, uh, and uh, I think. 
uh, more than uh, more than uh, the questioning of any particular right of privilege of, of an MP to ask various individual questions. I think it's clear that Canadians, this is a subject that Canadians want to talk about. Uh, we have over 70 percent of Canadians who are against the carbon tax. Uh, and if we've got uh, if we've got multiple premiers lined up who want to listen to us, uh, I, I think we can certainly um, we can organize uh, the uh, just to have one meeting to uh, to listen to them and get um, uh, uh, get uh, ten or so uh, members of parliament to uh, to listen to them and so um, it, when uh, because of the the potential impact of the carbon tax and so let me just uh, put some context actually with respect to why this is in so important is that. The, the carbon tax is many ways a, a, a tipping point I, I see for the Canadian economy because we're, if, if every if all other uh, if all other um, lights were go for the economy it might be a different matter uh, but we have warnings from across the political spectrum from economists of all stripes um, telling us that this economy is in severe severe uh, peril um, whether it be the lack of uh, lack of capital investment uh, the OECD predicts it will be near the last uh, near the bottom I think at the very bottom actually over the next 40 years with with respect to capital investment um, and capital investment uh, along with innovation uh, and uh, and our workers underpin the foundation of productivity productivity is of course measured at a GD as GDP per hour um, Canada has been uh, a laggard uh, in this uh, in this category um, and uh, it has really sort of uh, drifted downwards in the last uh, last 10 years and in order to increase GDP per capita um, I heard actually a, an economist uh, on, uh, on one of the political shows yesterday saying he, uh, citing two things we need to get done to inc include and increase that productivity. One is we need a reduction in taxation. That's squarely on the uh, on the on the carbon tax. And the second thing is we need to attract foreign investment uh, by making it easier uh, for uh, for our projects to happen. To make it uh, the ease of business. Uh, for both big and, and small business uh, to uh, perform their uh, their wonderful uh, their wonderful work, and so uh, the carbon tax hits both of these things because the carbon tax creates additional costs and uncertainty into the Canadian economy, while at the same time it's an additional level of taxation. The reality is is that the the driver of any uh, any nation's economy, any any capitalist country, um, is the private sector, and it's uh, and as as uh, as a uh, as a great Brian Mulroney showed. Uh, when you uh, when you uh, when you privatize um, 22 um, 22 separate institutions, it's a great driver of economic growth going forward. And so, what this government has done is it's, it's increasingly taken the oxygen out of out of the room uh, for the private sector. And as you divert more. Assets and uh, spending is way up uh, since actually pre-pandemic. Uh, well over 20% more we're spending as a government. What that means is that there are resources being diverted from the private sector, the sector that's really responsible for moving our economy forward, and the engine that drives our economy. Uh, you're, you begin to suffocate it, and, and you've seen that impact uh, with respect to our, our productivity numbers. They haven't increased, uh, once again, since 2014. And I really see the carbon tax as 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 the as sand in the gears of the Canadian economy. It just it's slowing everything down, and the and and then uh, folks will talk about well we need the carbon tax to reduce emissions and that that just ain't so um, as I would say because uh, currently we're near the bottom uh, I think we're 62 out of 67 with respect to emissions reductions uh, we're not on track to meet any of our emissions targets we've blown by uh, targets the only time we were uh, quote unquote on track was uh, when our economy was shut down during the pandemic uh, of course the Minister of Environment will cite that without any context but um, um, and besides that, we've never we've never uh, been uh, uh, been on uh, uh, on track to hit those hit those targets. So we're we're 62 out of 67. And sort of the bigger story of why that why that happens is actually so the goal should not be to uh, just reduce Canadian emissions. It should be to reduce global emissions because car uh, CO2 or carbon dioxide, other greenhouse gases, really they don't they don't know any borders. They don't know any boundaries. Uh, and so if uh, if uh, if Beijing pumps out uh, an additional amount of carbon 
um, it's not like it just stays uh, uh, over the PRC. Um, and so the reality of it is, is so what we're doing uh, when we impose uh, the, the carbon tax is we're pushing Canadian industry out of Canada. Uh, so clean, sustainable Canadian energy uh, in my in my great province of Ontario, that means a lot of nuclear uh, and hydro and, and carbon free power. And we're pushing that uh, that industry out of this uh, relatively, in fact, clean uh, Canadian energy. And we are pushing it towards other uh, jurisdictions that have uh, that don't have carbon pricing, but have far less clean uh, uh, energy uh, sources. And so, the um, the the reality is is that by putting these punitive costs on on our Canadian farmers, on our the Canadian foreign, business the owners, uh, we are we're, we're, what we're doing is we're funding other authoritarian regimes around the world, while at the same time costing ourselves. And actually, it it and in many cases has a net negative impact, not just to the Canadian consumer, but also to admission, emissions going on. Because you can just picture it. If, if you are a factory operating uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Northumberland, Peterborough South, uh, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of power, a lot of your power created by Darlington, uh, a, great nuclear, a great nuclear facility. Um, and uh, if, in fact, you can't make it there and you say, well, it's less expensive to go to uh, West Virginia or Guam Don province or, or uh, some place where there is not a carbon tax or even Mexico. Mexico is a very small carbon tax, but very, very small. Uh, what happens is now you are, instead of having nuclear energy power this manufacturing, powering the economy, what... Uh, water. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Atwin. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm really trying to give my colleague the latitude that he seeks in, in this moment, but I... I'm hearing the same tables being being shared. I'm, I'm hearing the same sentences being shared. Now we're talking about other nations. This is not relevant at all. Uh, thank you, Ms. Atwin. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, uh, we always allow uh, wide latitude um, if we could... Uh... Yeah, the, 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 the challenge with that is in, in, the, in the same point of order, I heard the fact that I was repetitious and I was also adding too much new material. Um, and so the, the, the reality is that the, uh, the, the Prime Minister continues to lie about the, about the effectiveness and about the treatment of the carbon tax, right? So Point of order. I, um, yes, Mr. McKenna. Once again, the member is, has accused the Prime Minister of lying. That is completely unparliamentary, and I would ask him to apologize. <laughs> I have another uh, another uh, unsolicited point of order asked for a resignation as well. But, Mr. Lawrence? I, I, I mean, the truth is the truth. Uh, and uh, it, the, the reality is the Prime Minister is lying. Um, point what, of order? That is completely unparliamentary. On that point it of is, order? It is totally yeah. against the rules. What is we have another point of order, Mr. McKenna? Committee. Sorry, we have another point of order? The point of order is he's, he's suggesting that it's non-parliamentary, but with all due respect, the Prime Minister is continuing to say that Canadians are better off because of the carbon tax. It's an outright lie, period. Yeah. Thank you. I think we were at uh, Mr. McKenna. Once again, I believe that's a violation of... Uh, of the standing orders and uh, and the general practice of the house uh, to uh, accuse a member of lying and uh, i would ask both members now to apologize i would cite the following letter as evidence of a lie um and uh, so point of order mr chair i just point of uh, order on, on parliamentary, uh, uh, sorry on hold on sorry mr duan what's before I go back to you, was that Mr. Duan or Mr. Kasimir Chuck? Uh, um, Chair, you can't point of order a point of order. Okay, Mr. Duan, go ahead. Just point uh, of order. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I've just cautioned Mr. members Duan, go ahead. Uh, in terms of using language. Uh, I could say Pierre Polyev is a liar because he's misquoting the Bank of Canada. The carbon pricing represents one twentieth uh, of the impact on inflation. So that's for the record. The Bank of Canada has stated that clearly. But I just I wouldn't say that, and I will retract my comments Point because of order. I'm an honourable member. Or Ms. Goodridge. 
I, uh, thank you. I, I'm just I, I very new tuning in. However, I've been listening from my my apartment uh, here for a while. Actually, my office. And this is this is absolutely crazy, and we are fighting over something that the parliamentary budget officer has been very clear. Canadians are worse off because of the carbon tax. There has been absolute point of uh, order. disingenuous point of order. It's not information point of order. coming from the Liberals Colleagues, throughout of, this entire. I'm meeting. sorry, I'm interrupting. Oh, I, I'm, because of all this is this is ridiculous. This is disorder. I am adjourning. And, uh, as we go forward and grow the economy. And it was the alternative. It, it exempted Ontario from going through a federal bar, a carbon pricing system because we already had initiated one. And it wasn't until the Conservative government that came in afterwards that dismantled that very initiative. And brought... Mr. Duan, go ahead. Just uh, of order. <laughs> the Bank of Canada. And I will read. Sorry. It, this is point of this order. is disorder. I am adjourning. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is back in session. That séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère a repris. Okay. We have very little time left, uh, and so here is how I propose we use it. Uh, we're going to give each of you two minutes uh, to uh, uh, either answer one uh one of the insightful questions that was suggested to us, uh, which is to share uh, what, in your view, is the most effective uh, protection against foreign interference, or to share a final thought that you would like to leave with the Commission and the members of the public. And we will proceed starting with Mr. Santu moving through to the left, and we will finish uh, with Ms. Ng on Zoom. So beginning with you, Mr. Santu, please go ahead. Look, I, I, my hope is that we walk away from today um, with an understanding of how foreign interference is not something that's experienced by, you know, random, small communities off in the corner of Canada. Uh, one thing that stood out to me uh, from all my friends up here on the panel is that how much of our experience with foreign interference was shared. Uh, the manners in which the consulate operates, the manner in which disinformation operates, the manner in which uh, the, the chilling effect it has on communities to participate themselves, and uh, the manner in which it uh, we get misrepresented uh, to uh, others outside of our community. And that's, that's a testament to how hostile states uh, act similar to one another. Um, and in our instance of the Sikh community, uh, India is a hostile state. Uh, they're not a uh, friend that shares um, the values that we hold as Canadians. Uh, in fact, they're stripping away any semblance of those as we speak. Uh, foreign interference also impacts uh, folks that we would be surprised uh, by. You know, MPs, members of parliament, have had their visas revoked to go to India because of things they have called out uh, such as human rights violations impacting Sikhs and, and other minorities. Um, 
it's it's pretty uh, it's it's a pretty damning indictment of how far uh, states like India would go. And if they're doing that with MPs, what are they doing with folks within communities that are unseen and, and unknown uh, to the general public? Uh, so my hope here uh, today is that. Uh, that what we stated here is not just important uh, for the second phase, but uh, it should really shape the way we understand and think about the evidence that uh, this inquiry is going to be hearing moving forward, and that the media and those in attendance uh, thinking about this and talking about it and reporting on it uh, do the justice that it's that it deserves, uh, and that meaningful efforts are made to continue dialogue with community well after this inquiry wraps up, because uh, this problem is not going to go away. It's just going to evolve and shape itself into something more nefarious. Thank you very much, Mr. Novodborsky. I want to take a moment to just thank the commission again for giving us an opportunity to appear here, and uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Uh, with Mr. Sandhu that. Uh, it was very helpful to hear how different forms of foreign interference affect all of our diasporas, but it definitely seems like there is substantial overlap. And uh, one item uh, that caught my attention is that it seems that for all of us, the consulates and the embassies seem to be a core source of foreign interference. Uh, so we urge the Commission to uh, handle this matter with the seriousness it deserves as it affects not just our diasporas, but the wider uh, Canadian community, especially when it comes to uh, disinformation, hacking, and other forms of interference. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wallenzak. Hello. Yeah, I'd like to this, take this opportunity to thank you from the Commission and everybody working hard on this and to give us the opportunity to uh, give a picture of uh, how this foreign interference impact of uh, diaspora uh, communities. Actually, uh, like um, as we have uh, talked about today, we give the uh, the patterns of CCP's infiltration and interference in Canada through our first-hand experience. We may not have direct uh, information on the two stated elections, but I believe that uh, we have, through what we have witnessed over the 25 years in Canada that can provide a picture of the scope and the depth of foreign interference by the PRC through the tactics of mobilizing the Chinese Canadian groups and organizations to surprise Falun Gong. It helps the PRC build infra infrastructure and the mechanism and the form a broad base to support the PRC's infiltration and the interference in the political structures of Canada, including elections. Such infrastructure and the mechanism become most mature and available discernibly for the wider Canadian public of its influence and in the recent uh, two elections. So I, I echo with other people mentioned, we need to look beyond and broader to see uh, what the, the foreign factors are capable and able to do in influence the Canadian societies. And that's directly related to the election, what they, they are able to do. And uh, so um, for like in our report, we have 11 recommendations to counter uh, combat that uh, interference. But I'd like to especially mention about in act the foreign agent registration registry legislation, not for punishing those uh, uh, single out those uh, players, but uh, to function as a uh, shield to protect the community members uh, from being coerced into. Um, uh, to uh, playing for the Chinese embassy or consulate or foreign factors. Because a lot of time, lots of pe many people, they not willing to do it, but out of fear or other leverage or fear of punishment or whatever reasons, they were forced to do the job that they were not able, they are not willing to. And this, this legislation will help them to be able to say no to the foreign factors. So that's uh, one thing I want to say. And the last, last sentence is um, that we really urge our Canadian government and its agencies to be committed to take effective measures and actions in responding to the CCP's invasive and aggressive infiltration into Canadian communities, institutions, political system, and beyond 
It is essential for Canada to safeguard its values, democracy, sovereignty, and the rights and the freedoms of its people against the foreign interference and the repression. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Smelian. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you again uh, for inviting me. And uh, uh, the last thing I want to say, you ask uh, my friends here about the level of support we got from different organizations here. So we work and cooperate with the government for taking uh, uh, the case of flight PS75 to, to International Court of Justice. It was submitted last year. This year, they submitted another case in International Civil Aviation Organization. Our request for supporting our case in International Criminal Court is still pending. Our request to put IRGC in the list of terrorist organizations is still pending. It's very important for a community to see the entirety of the, this organization to be listed as a terrorist organization. I go to RCMP from what I heard from my friends here and from our experiences. Uh, okay, uh, RCMP didn't open a criminal case for PS75 to let alone uh, protecting the activists or Iranian Canadian activists. That's why I, I hear from friends that they have turned their houses to fortresses with cameras and uh, and uh, uh, like security tricks because you're uh, you're on your own and there's no protection. And the last thing uh, is about IRCC. Uh, I, I mentioned a banker, a chief of police, a minister, a current speaker of the house of the Islamic regime. They have they are already here or they have been here or they're planning to come here. That's why we have deep concerns that we don't have any political relationship. These two countries, they don't have open embassies. But why we see the flow of the Islamic regime officials in this country, and this is the reason that the community getting not getting involved in, in lots of activities. I urge the commission again that uh, to add Islamic regime of Iran to those rogue states that are, are in the term of reference here. Thank you. Thank you. And turning to Zoom, Ms. Zing. And it may be that she is not uh, with us. Uh, and by that, I mean she's no longer in Just Zoom. Want to make sure that it's not a technical issue? Yep. Uh, it seems that uh, she's no longer on the Zoom uh, platform. Okay. So uh, we are at the end of our day. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, uh, deeply, uh, having accepted to uh, to come forward and, and share your views as well as your community's views and experience in my mind is very, very important for the commission. And honestly, I think um, it took some courage and I'm very grateful that you, you have accepted to do that and your contribution will uh, for sure inform the work of the commission uh, going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Order please, alors s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission has adjourned until tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Cette séance de la commission That's that. Okay. We have day one wrapped up. That was definitely uh, some hectic committee goings on. Pretty interesting day. Tomorrow. Stay tuned. It's going to get way more involved into it. it's not diaspora group tomorrow a whole whack more of uh of other people um and we're gonna hear a lot of other stuff so hey like subscribe have a good evening